Distinguished Madame Anna Robin Brett, Secretary of Ancestral. Distinguished Mr. Lu Pengqi, Vice Chairman of CCPIT. Excellency Mr. Palita Kohona, Sri Lankan Ambassador to China. Distinguished Madame Li Yongjie, Director General of MOFCOM's Treat Department of Treaty and Law. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. I'm Wang Chengjie from CTAC. I feel honored to moderate the opening ceremony of this conference. Welcome to CISG at 40 Celebration Conference, co-hosted by the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, Ministry of Commerce of the People's Republic of China, China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, and the China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission. With the multilateral trading system and the process of economic globalization, international trade has achieved leapfrog development and become a pillar of the global economy. The Convention has always been regarded as one of the cores of international trade law because of the cornerstone position of sales contracts in international trade. Since its adoption in 1980, 94 countries have ratified and joined CSG, which has further expanded its application and played an important role in establishing global economic and trade rules, promoting the legal reform of state parties and advancing economic globalization. Today, guests and friends gather here online and offline, review the achievements of CSG over the past 40 years summarize experiences and challenges regarding its application in China, explore its greater role in the era of digital economy, and discuss the latest development trends of dispute resolution in goods trade. Please first allow me to introduce our distinguished guests. Mr. Lu Pengqi, Vice Chairman of China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, Ms. Madame Li Yongjie, Director General of the Department of Treaty and Law, Ministry of Commerce. Madame Anna Jobin Brett, Secretary of Ancestral, who joins us online. Let's extend a warm welcome to all the leaders and guests with our applause. Next, let's welcome Mr. Lu Pengqi, Vice Chairman of CCPIT. Distinguished Madame Anna Jobin Brett, Secretary of Ancestral, Excellency Mr. Palita Kohona, Sri Lankan Ambassador to China, Excellency. Madame Li Yongjie, Director General of the Department of Treaty and Law of the Ministry of Commerce, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today we gather here with friends from all sectors of the world, online and offline, to commemorate, commemorate together the 40th anniversary of the adoption of the CSG. On behalf of China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, or CCPIT, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all the guests present at the conference and express my heartfelt thanks and sincere greetings to all the friends, old and new. CISG was developed under the auspice by Ancestral. In 1980, it was adopted at a diplomatic conference in Vienna. Year 2020 marks the 40th anniversary of its adoption. CRSG has gone through an extraordinary journey in the past 40 years. The past 40 years witnessed the rapid development of human society through profound and extensive technological revolution and industrial transformation. The world's productivity has been greatly liberated and developed, and international trade has become much more active and closer than ever before. The past 40 years featured rapid development of multilateralism. As global challenges continue to rise, it has become a broad consensus of the international community to work together in times of difficulty. It is also a common wish of most countries to establish unified economic and trade laws and rules. The past 40 years saw an important role played by the CSG. 
which established a modern and a fair contract system for international trade of goods, provide an important basis for enhancing legal certainty of international trade and reducing its transaction cost. On the occasions of the 40th anniversary of CSG, and CITRO, MOFCOM, CCPIT, and CTAC co-host this conference. Today, 150 legal experts and business leaders gather in Beijing, together with new and old friends worldwide via online streaming. Review the key roles and the far-reaching impact of CSG to reduce the legal barriers and promote the development of international trade and far-reaching influence. Discuss the experience and the challenges relating to CRSG's application in China, especially China's arbitration. Explore the trends of the development of CSG under the current dynamic world situation with the establishment of a new international economic order as its original goal, and look forward to the future development of CSG in light of the new situation. With such high-minded starting point, it is believed that this conference will become the focus of the international legal and arbitration communities. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, at present, COVID-19 pandemic is still raging around the world, with once-in-a-century changes and a pandemic intermingled. The world has entered a period of turbulence and a transformation. There are more elements of uncertainty and instability. Economic globalization is regressing. World economic pattern is reshaping. Global challenges call for global governance. Facing new challenges, countries need to go beyond traditional mindset Follow the trend of the times, strengthen exchanges and cooperation, and coordinate closely with each other. We should actively promote multipolar world and democracy in international relations, establish a new international economic order that meets the new level and the requirements of development, further improve the international trading system, and safeguard the equal rights to development of all countries, especially the developing ones. Thanks to its unremitting efforts, China has become the world's second largest economy and embarked on a development path suitable to its own conditions. While pursuing its own development, China pursues common development through opening up, vigorously build a fair, reasonable, and transparent international rule of law and economic and trade rules and order, and work to work with other countries and peoples to co-create a better future for mankind. China is a founding member of CSG and is an important participant. Over the past 40 years, China has made unremitting efforts to promote the application of CSG at the legislative and the judicial levels. CCPIT is China's largest trade and investment promotion agency in the Chamber of Commerce. It promotes trade and investment, provides the high quality of commercial legal services, and modernizes the management system and ability. Following those core missions, it pushes forward investment and trade liberalization and facilitation and develop ADR mechanisms at a high level and develop rule-based business environment. As the oldest and the most representative international arbitration institution in China, CTEC, has, over the past 65 years since its founding, committed itself to promoting the development of international trade through international arbitration, mediation, and other modern, efficient, and convenient means of dispute resolution, and independently and impartially heard more than or nearly 50,000 arbitration cases at home and abroad with the parties from more than 100 countries and regions. CTAC has provided high quality, efficient arbitration services and won wider claims. CTAC participates in important work of ancestral international arbitration and mediation, actively participates in international arbitration exchanges. It has also accumulated rich experiences in handling cases relating to CSG and played an important role in reporting its cases to the collection of a case law. And thus, it has played its role in promoting CSG's improvement and a wide application. In the future, Chinese arbitration will work 
closely together with Ancestral and colleagues in other countries, leverage the promotion application research about CSG, meet the needs of economic globalization and BRI, take opportunities, seek development, address challenges, and make transformations so as to assume its historic mission to safeguard the world economy. To this end, I would like to propose a few thoughts. First, let's uphold and strengthen international cooperation in an all-round way and establish a stable order for international economic development. In the dynamic world, CSG is not only a substantive law, but also the crystallization of a global desire for cooperation. CSG should play a greater role in resolving international trade disputes. The international arbitration community should unite around CRSG, join hands with a vision and responsibility, and contribute to the promotion, application, study, and improvement of CISG, as well as further progress of the international dispute resolution mechanism. Second, let's accelerate the assessment of new legal issues and enhance the new impetus for the development of international trade and dispute resolution rules. At present, with a surge of digital economy and technology, new problems arise under the new development situation. Legal issues such as force majeure caused by the pandemic, as well as new types of issues such as the international procurement of vaccines, should be studied in greater depth to form a unified legal understanding and application. Meanwhile, it is helpful to foresee legal issues arising from the new digital economy and the green development of international trade, focus on internet dispute resolution, conduct a theoretical, institutional, and a security research, balancing substantive and procedural law, promote efficient, low-cost, and convenient dispute resolution. Third, let's broaden the application of CSG and expand the space for dispute resolution. By the end of 2020, 94 members have joined the CSG, and more and more countries have recognized CSG, showing its unique charm and broad prospects. We should stay committed to the joint consultation, joint development, and the shared benefits as the philosophy for international governance roll out the concept of win-win cooperation and a move for greater membership of CSG, that's the wisdom of CSG will benefit more countries and global economic development. Dear friends and colleagues, CSG embodies the spirit of the UN Charter and crystallizes the collective wisdom and common practice of all countries. Standing at a new and higher starting point in history, let's work hand in hand to make new strides and the progress for CSG firmly uphold international system with the United Nations at its core, accelerate the building of a more stable and win-win international economic and trade order and governance system, and jointly shoulder responsibilities of our times and promote global development. In conclusion, I wish this conference fruitful outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman Liu, for your excellent speech. China is opening up itself to the outside world at a higher level. It is particularly important to establish fair and equitable international trade system and new order. In the interpretation and application of CISG, the arbitration community in China should take actions and contribute its part to international dispute resolution. Recommendations made by Vice Chairman Lu Pengqi for broader application of CSG, joint development of Belt and Road, and high quality development of international trade are deeply and dearly appreciated. Now let's put our hands together and welcome Madame Li Yongjie, Director General of MOFCOM's Department of Treaty and Law. Your Excellency, Ancestral Secretary, your Excellency Sri Lankan Ambassador to China, Your Excellency Vice Chairman Lu Pengqi, distinguished guests, good morning. Please allow me to speak on behalf of the Ministry of Commerce and congratulate CSG on its 40th anniversary. 
and welcome all the guests to this conference. Moreover, I would like to thank the hosts and Sichuan, CCPIT, and CTAC for their close collaboration. CSG, as formulated by Ancichuan, was adopted in 1980 and came into force on January the 1st, 1988. It's the main international convention regulating the contractual relationship of international sales for goods. And one of the important achievements made by Ancichuan in unifying international law on trade the convention covers the conclusion of contracts for international sale of goods and the rights and obligations of both parties, and established a modern and uniform rule system for international sale of goods. It has become one of the core treaties on international trade law since 20th century. The convention balances the interests of buyers and sellers and considers and balances different legal systems and different interests. Over the past 40 years, the number of state parties to the convention has increased. From the original 11 founding state parties to today's 94 state parties, which has reflected the vitality of CSG, the convention has enhanced the certainty and the predictability of contract performance, reduced the transaction costs, and reduced the legal barriers to international trade. It has promoted the development of global international trade. Over the past 40 years, the convention has been widely used in international trade practices and provided useful guidance for the legislative and judicial practices of various countries. China formally submitted the instrument of ratification on December the 11th, 1986, becoming one of the 11 founding state parties to the convention. The convention is one of the first unified. Substantive law conventions that China joined since its reform and opening up, acceding to the Chen Convention at the early stage of reform opening up, demonstrated China's desire to open up to the outside world, promoted internationalization process of China's rule of law, and a pr profound impact on China's subsequent legislation and judicial practice. From the firm-related economic contract law of 1985 through the PRC contract law of 1999 and the Civil Code, effective as of January the 1st, 2021, China's legislation on the contract law has always been drawing lessons from the basic principles and the content of the convention, which is also a popular popular choice for Chinese companies engaging in import and export business. It is one of the important legal bases for international、uh, cases. Handled by Chinese courts and arbitration institutions, and the case law database published by Ancichuan, there are more than 970 cases under the convention, more than 100 of which are related to China. The convention has played an active role in promoting the development of China's foreign trade. Ladies and gentlemen, since the Belt and Road Initiative was put forward in 2013, trade between countries along the Belt and Road has become increasingly close. In、unimpeded trade is one of the important part of the BRI development. From 2016 to 2020, the total volume of trade in goods between China and other BRI countries exceeded six trillion U.S. dollars. Last year, the trade volume of trade in goods between China and other BRI countries exceeded 1.3 trillion U.S. dollars. With a growing trade, there is an urgent need for harmonized and modern international commercial trade. Uh, commercial contract rules. The wider promotion and application of CSG will help the importers and exporters along the Belt and Road further cut contract risk, reduce contract disputes, and facilitate the settlement of contract disputes. It will help the BRI countries improve business environment and grow trade. Taking the opportunity of commemorating the 40th anniversary of CSG, and in the context of the BRI development. This conference will discuss the application and development of the convention, which will further expand the influence and of the convention and support the sustainable and healthy development of international trade. As President Xi Jinping noted, China will not close its door to the outside world; it will only open even wider. China will continue to deepen 
cooperation with ANCITRO and other international organizations in an open and a positive manner and make new contribution to the formulation and improvement of international economic and trade rules and to the development of economic globalization in a more open, inclusive, and mutually beneficial direction. In conclusion, I wish this conference a complete success. Thank you, DJ Li Yongjie, for your wonderful speech. Last year, China became the world's only growing major economy in trade in goods and further consolidated its position as the largest country in trade in goods. These achievements cannot be achieved without the unremitting efforts and active exploration made by MOFCOM in promoting China's accession to the Convention and withdrawing its reservations on written form. Next, let me invite Madame Anna Jobinbrad, Secretary of ANCITRO, to deliver the keynote speech. Mr. Wang Shenjie, Vice Chairman and Secretary General of CTAC. Mr. Lu Pengji, Vice Chairman of CCPIT. Madame Li Yongjie, Director General of the Department of Treaty and Law of MOFCOM. Dear speakers and moderators, Dear colleagues and most of all, dear friends, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here with you, albeit only virtually, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, also known as the CISG. When trade takes place across borders, legal, certain, legal uncertainty due to the diversity of domestic laws, makes the outcome of commercial disputes highly unpredictable and increases transaction costs. One manner of increasing legal predictability is the promotion of the unification and harmonization of international trade law through its codification. And this is precisely the task that the United Nations General Assembly has assigned to the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, also known as ANCITRA. Sale of goods is universally recognized as the backbone of international trade. According to the World Trade Organization, the value of trade in merchandise in the year 2019 was about 18.9 trillion US dollars. It is therefore not surprising that the CIS, the CISG is the most successful substantive uniform law instrument. 13 out of the top 15 global exporters and 12 out of the 15 global importers are CISG contracting states. And the CISG applies to well over 80% of the global trade in goods, unless the parties to the contract have agreed otherwise, obviously. The CISG's main goal are predictability and flexibility. On the one hand, the comprehensive set of rules contained in the Convention offer detailed guidance as default regime. On the other hand, the principle of party autonomy under which contractual parties may exclude the application of this Convention or derogate, or derogate from or vary the effect of any of its provisions allows tailoring those default rules to the needs of the specific transaction. Moreover, CISG fundamental notion, notions, although well-defined in their elements, may be adapted to the varying circumstances of international trade. Thus, the CISG may adapt to new business needs and evolving commercial practices. The CISG is widely recognized as a success for its quality, the number of its state parties, uh, and its continued relevance for business. It has been adopted by almost 100 states. More than 5,000 decisions applying uh, the CISG have been reported and compiled. Countless books, studies, and articles discuss its provisions in a broad range of languages. This wealth of information 
will now include the special report on the application of the CISG in cases administered by CTAC, whose launch will take place immediately after this my intervention and for which I would like to congratulate you warmly. Compiling information on how the CISG is interpreted and applied is of great importance for the CISG community, in particular in countries where access to legal information is not easy. Moreover, arbitral awards are a treasure trove of precedents due to the highly specialized setting where they take place, but their content may not always be easily available due to confidentiality and other reasons. Hence, CTAC's initiative is particularly useful and we encourage other arbitral institutions to consider doing the same. With respect to recent publications, please allow me to refer to the Legal Guide to Uniform Instruments in the area of international commercial contracts with a focus on sales, which has been jointly prepared by the Hague Conference on Private International Law, Ancitral, and Unidroit, the so-called three sister organizations of private international law. This guide focuses on sales transactions with an overview of the main uniform commercial contract law instruments and explains in particular how they interact among each other. It is already available in the English language and its translation in other official languages of the United Nations is underway. The comprehensive, modern and balanced restatement of sales law contained in the CISG is compatible with all economic and legal systems. It is therefore used as a model for regional and domestic law, as well as a source of inspiration for other uniform law texts, such as the Unidroit Principles of International Commercial Contracts. In an increasing number of cases, adoption of CISG represents an important step towards contract law modernization to which the domestic enactment of provisions inspired by the CISG follows. China has been at the forefront of this trend, and not only as an early state party to the CISG, but also by incorporating the provisions of the CISG and other uniform law texts into domestic contract law, a choice that has been recently confirmed in the enactment of the Chinese Civil Code. From an economic perspective, the main benefits of adopting and using the CISG are a reduction of transaction costs that may be reflected in lower prices for final users and consumers. From a legal perspective, adopting the CISG provides several benefits. First, early, easier contract management. The main purpose of the contract is to lay down the rights and obligations of the parties. When the parties are aware of their rights and obligations, they can better comply with the contract and may find it easier to reach a settlement in the event of a dispute. If a foreign national law is chosen as the applicable law, the party may not be aware of its content and may incur significant costs in ascertaining its legal position. This makes contract management more difficult and litigation more likely. The adoption of the CISG can avoid such challenges. The text of the CISG is easily accessible in all six languages of the United Nations and several other languages. Moreover, as already mentioned, a vast amount of case law, books, articles and other supporting materials offer guidance often at no cost, on the Convention's application and interpretation. When dealing with a business partner in a foreign jurisdiction, knowing that the CISG is applicable gives comfort and increases trust in the performance of the other party. Second, it provides a neutral legal regime. It is a good practice for a contract for the international sale of goods to include a clause on the law applicable to the contract. Often, the preference of the party with more bargaining power will prevail. 
This preference may result in the sale being governed by a national law with which the weaker party is not familiar. Similarly, the parties may agree on the application of the law of a third state with which both parties are unfamiliar. CISG is therefore a uniform text that has resulted from international negotiations and as such is neutral to all national laws. Parties are more likely to accept the CISG as than a national law of the other party, especially when their places of business are in state parties to the convention. Small and medium enterprises may have limited access to legal advice when negotiating a contract. They are likely to be the weaker party. Therefore, the main, the, they may benefit especially from the application of the CISG. Third, the CISG simplifies the inquiries about applicable law. Despite good practice, many contracts do not contain a choice of law clause. In the event of a dispute, the court or the arbitrators will need to apply choice of law rules to identify the law applicable to the contract. This inquiry is often complex and time consuming and can lead to the application of different laws depending on the state in which the dispute is brought, thereby reducing legal predictability in international trade. By default, the CISG applies to contracts concluded between parties whose places of business are in different state parties, thereby obviating the need for an inquiry into the applicable law. The CISG thus eliminates procedural hurdles and promotes legal predictability. Consequently, disputes can be resolved more efficiently and judicial resources can be spared. Fourth, the CISG is an indispensable tool for international business transaction specialists. It's not only one of the most modern and complete restatements of sales law, but also the only legislative text specifically drafted for long-arm transactions and international trade. While CISG does not aim to be the law of choice for all transactions, it is often the law that best accommodates the interests of the parties. International business lawyers, judges, arbitrators may therefore nor, not ignore its existence. The forthcoming panel on the CISG and dispute resolution may further illustrate this point. These arguments apply to all business transactions and are therefore relevant also for the discussion on the use of the CISG in Belt and Road trade disputes and more generally in Belt and Road supply chain management that we will hear about shortly. This discussion is particularly interesting as several countries involved in the Belt and Road Initiative are not yet a party to the CISG. We very much hope that this event today will increase in awareness of the benefits arising from the use of the CISG and that it will therefore support its broader adoption, use and application. Last but not least, AMCITRAL has also prepared legislative texts enabling the use of electronic means in commerce and in other transactions. These texts aim at removing legal obstacles to the use of electronic means without amending contract law, but rather adapting it to the extent needed. Among those texts, the United Nations Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in International Contracts specifically complements the, the CISG with both general principles of electronic transaction law and specific provisions on electronic contracting. The Electronic Communications Convention is attracting new parties at a steady pace. Some countries participating in the Belt and Road Initiative including China itself, have already signed the Electronic Communications Convention, but not yet ratified it. Their ratification would send a strong signal to other participating countries on the usefulness of relying on electronic communications and on the Electronic Communications Convention to enable data flows alongside trade of goods. In that regard, the fact that the Electronic Communications Convention, together with the ANSIFRAL Model Law on Electronic Commerce, 
is referenced in Article 12.10.1 of the RCEP Regional Comprehensive Electronic Partnership gives evidence of the relevance of these texts and of the value that states attach to them. Finally, looking at possible future work of Ancitral, the, CC, the CISG also provides many important inputs in the discussions we are currently uh, facilitating on the legal aspects of the digital economy, namely matters such as smart contracts, artificial intelligence, the use of blockchain technology, trading platforms, and trading data. We are very pleased to have this event as one of the highlights of the series of activities that the Ancitral Secretariat is organizing around the world or partnering with around the world to celebrate the Convention's success but also to promote broader state participation in the effective use and uniform interpretation of the CISG, collectively referred to as the CISG at 40 initiative. The dedication of the organizers, the expertise and level of the speakers, and the engagement of the public make it possible that this conference is a success which will remain a remarkable contribution to the advancement of the CISG and of universal, univer, uniform commercial law. I thank you very much and wish you a very fruitful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Anna Jobin Brad, for your speech. The Convention, with its modernity, uniformity and flexibility, improves the certainty and predictability of international sales contracts, reduces transaction costs in international trade, and is widely applied in the world. China is a staunch supporter of CSG. It has reflected the CSG extensively in its contract law and the civil code. China has also fully applied the CSG in the adjudication in courts and the arbitration commissions. We firmly believe that with the support of China and the other members, the convention will continue to achieve success. Now let me thank all the leaders and guests again for the wonderful speeches with a warm applause and now declare the conclusion of, conclusion of the opening ceremony. Next, please allow me to make a special report on the application of CSG in Chinese arbitration. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. It is my great honor to gather in Beijing with experts and colleagues from all walks of life and meet friends from all over the world through the Internet to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the adoption of the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all of you on behalf of CTAC. As pointed out by Anna and uh, Vice Chairman Lu Pengqi in their speeches, CSG, formulated by uh, Ancitral, has aimed to build a modern, unified, and a fair system for international sale of goods contracts ever since its adoption in order to improve the legal certainty and reduce the transaction cost. After 40 years of development, CSG has become one of the core conventions of international commercial law and has achieved great success worldwide. It in 1986, China submitted its ratification for the official accession to a CSG to Secretary General of the United Nations, which entered into effect in China since 1988. On the one hand, the CTAC has become a legal basis that can be directly applied by Chinese courts and arbitration institutions over the past 30 years. China has changed from a major trading country to a trading power. A large number of disputes related to international trade has benefited from CSG and been fairly and reasonably resolved. On the other hand, the CSG has had a far-reaching impact on the development of China's market economy and the contract law. At the same time, China's extensive application and research of the CSG has also accumulated rich experience for the further development of CSG as one of the first group of contracting states where CSG entered into force. China's interpretation and application of CSG has attracted much attention in the world. As an important part of the dispute resolution mechanism, 
Commercial arbitration takes contractuality at its core and has a high degree of professionalism and flexibility. This has a natural, harmonious connection with the CSG, which also takes the party autonomy at its cornerstone and is characterized by neutrality and balance. While the Ansichuel is committed to promoting the uniform law on international sale of goods dominated by CSG, it has always attached a great importance to promoting international commercial arbitration as an important way to resolve international commercial disputes. The CSG is frequently applied in international commercial arbitration. There's a close relationship between the development of the arbitration and the application of a CSG. Commercial arbitration in China started in 1956 when CTAC was established after 65 years of development. Commercial arbitration in China is showing a trend of growing scale and accelerating pace of internationalization. Nowadays, number of cases using arbitration to resolve civil and commercial disputes in China has been among the highest in the world. In 2020 alone, China's 259 arbitration institutions handled about 400,000 cases with a total disputed amount of approximately 720 billion RMB. In 2020. 20 CTEC accepted 3,615 cases with a disputed amount reaching 112.1 billion RMB. 508 of them were sale of、uh, goods disputes, accounting for 14 percent. As the most long-standing permanent international arbitration institution in China, CTEC has unique advantages and rich experiences in the field of foreign-related arbitration. The internationalism, professionalism, and independence of Arbitrators and awards are widely recognized at home and abroad. CTAC is not only a witness to the global development of CTAC, of CSG, but also a practitioner to promote the application of CSG in China. Most arbitration cases in China to which CSG is applied are managed by CTAC. As early as 1988, the first year of entry into force of CSG in China, CTAC began to. Here, CSG-related cases. Since 1988, CTEC has concluded hundreds of cases concerning the application of CSG because of its valuable practices and strong representativeness for the study of the application of CSG. CTEC has been actively reporting the case law to the ANSICHUO for a long time, and is the only Chinese arbitration institution that provides cases to the CSG database of the Pace University. According to CSG database, from 1988 to 2001, 224 cases concerning the CSG concluded by CTAC were included. From 2002 to 2020, there were 553 awards relating to CSG in the database of CTAC. Over the past 30 years, CTAC has accumulated significant practical experience in the application and interpretation of CSG, which also contributed to the development of CSG. From our long-term experience in case management, we have noticed that CS. CTAC arbitral tribunals encounter the following key issues in hearing the cases involving the CSG. I hereby report to you for further discussion. The first issue is the application of CSG. First of all, the principle of automatic application of CSG has been upheld and implemented in CTAC awards. According to incomplete statistics, more than 90% of cases involving the application of CSG automatically apply to CSG in accordance with the place of business criteria provided in Article 1.1.A of CSG. Secondly, when the parties agree to apply the Chinese law, the vast majority of the arbitral tribunals also give priority to the application of CSG in accordance. With Article 142 of the General Principles of Civil Law, reflecting China's respect for the legislative and judicial spirit of international treaties, achieving a wider application of CSG in practice. Thirdly, when the CSG is not the applicable law of a dispute, the CTEC arbitral tribunals may also make reference to the provisions of CSG according to the specific circumstances of the case. Article 49. Of CTAC arbitration rules 2015 clearly provides a basis for this practice. Well, the which stipulates that arbitral tribunals shall independently and impartially render a fair and reasonable arbitral award based on the facts and of the case and the terms of the contract in accordance with the law and 
reference to international practices. Finally, CTAX practice also reflects the respect for party autonomy. The agreement of the parties on the application exclusion and partial exclusion of the application of CSG is well and properly reflected in the award. This coincides with Secretary Anna's summary of the spirit of CSG in her speech. The second issue is the validity of the contract. As an internationally unified contract law, the CSG does not clearly stipulate on the validity of a contract. CTAC arbitral tribunals usually determine the applicable law based on the principle of closest connection in private international law and combined with the true intention of both parties, the process of the conclusion of the contract and whether it violates the mandatory law and other elements to determine and explain the validity of the contract. This practice better embodies the spirit of contract, adapts to China's judicial review, and improves the enforceability of the awards. The third issue is the performance of the contract. Whether there is a fundamental breach of contract in the performance is a common issue in cases under the CSG. From the fundamental point of view, CTAC arbitral tribunals have accurate understanding and grasping of the concept of fundamental breach of contract and have well addressed the issues caused by the termination of the contract and its consequences. At the same time, through the general principles of the damages established in Article 74 of CSG, the calculation of losses are based on the price difference of alternative transaction and the market price provided by Article 75 and 76, respectively, and the derogation obligation stipulated in Article 77, the issue of damages caused by improper performance of a contract was dealt with by CTAC tribunals fairly and properly. The elaboration of the compensation system of CSG by CTAC's arbitral tribunal is basically consistent with the 2016 Ancestral Digest of case law on CSG. The fourth issue relating to the CSG is about electronic data. CSG is very open as to the form of contract. In the arbitration practice of CTAC, the arbitral tribunals note the parties' extensive use of electronic data exchange methods such as email, online chat records, mobile phone text messages, which had electronic signatures, domain names, and so on. In general respect, commercial practice of negotiating contracts and preserving evidence in the above-mentioned manner. Uh, as for the authenticity of electronic evidence, the arbitral tribunals usually consider factors such as identity of the sender, the reliability of the source, and integrity of the electronic data to decide whether to accept it or not after considering the facts of the case and other related evidence. When it comes to this issue, the Secretary, as Secretary Anna mentioned, the vigorous development of the digital economy is bound to bring great changes uh, to a series of issues, such as the form and the type of electronic transactions, the conclusion and performance of contracts, the determination of evidence, the way of hearing, and so on. We need to carefully consider how to use the CSG to better resolve these new problems. Of course, in our next meeting, we will dedicate a session to discuss this issue. I look forward to the experts' wonderful speeches. Dear friends and colleagues, there is a saying of Confucius in China, 40 without perplexity. The general understanding is that at the age of 40, people have a more accurate grasp of the appearance and development of themselves and the life, and gain a more comprehensive understanding of the laws of nature and society. In my opinion, this sentence also expresses the desire and the spirit of exploring and learning, and this is also the spirit that CISG has been carrying on its way to establish a better international economic and trade order. In the same spirit, in 2013, CTAC commissioned the Law School of Tsinghua University to conduct a study on the application of CSG in China's international commercial arbitration. On the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the adoption of CSG, we have once again set up a research group with the Law School of University of International Business and Economics to conduct a comprehensive study on the application of the CSG in China. The book, The Application of a CSG in 
Chinese arbitrator has been formulated with a length of 500,000 Chinese characters. In the future, CTAC will continue to uphold and carry forward the international spirit of promoting international integration and unification and extensive cooperation exchanges and carry out the relevant work related to the CSG in the following areas. The first is to further improve the level of applying the CSG on one hand with respect to the common issues in hearing of the cases involving CSG, we will strengthen the training of arbitrators so as to deepen their understanding of the CSG. On the other hand, we will pay attention to the legal issues related to import and export of related products caused by COVID-19, pay more attention to the new situation and the development of industrial changes brought about by the digital economy and raise awareness of the frontier issues and the green economy such as carbon neutrality so as to properly respond to the relevant application of CSG in advance and maintain healthy and steady development of the international economic order. And the second is to further explore the transparency and the sharing of relevant jurisprudence of the CSG and the present study of relevant precedents and awards. It's not only an effective way to promote CSG, but also a strong call of international development of arbitration. CTEC will launch a useful exploration trying to explore typical cases and the main points of our awards by means of a digital library. While adhering to the confidentiality of arbitration, we would also like to contribute to the transparency of arbitration and the consistency of awards at the same time. The third is to further promote the wide application of CSG. As Secretary Anna said, in the construction of Belt and Road Initiative, the development to further expand numbers of CSG is obvious. CTAC has always been actively involved in the construction of the Belt and Road Initiative. In 2019, CTAC launched an initiative to and reached the Beijing Joint Declaration of Belt and Road Arbitration Institution. With more than 40 domestic and foreign arbitration institutions. In the future, CTEC will also take advantage of this platform to cooperate and promote the further dialogue, development and application of CSG in countries and regions along the Belt and Road. Dear friends and colleagues, over the 40 years, CSG has existed beyond a substantive law. It represents the hope that mankind will be closely connected and face tomorrow hand in hand. CTEC is willing to jointly work with the people from all walks of life in the world, forge ahead, jointly promote the improvement of CSG and the progress of international arbitration, break down the remaining barriers of international economic and trade system, and make joint efforts to realize the stability, prosperity, and development of mankind. Thank you. Next, I would like to now uh, launch the new book the application of CSG in Chinese arbitration. In order to commemorate the 40th anniversary of CSG, CTAC commissioned the publication of the Chinese and English edition of the book, which will help you ac accurately understand and apply CSG. Hereby, I would like to thank Associate Professor Liu Tong and the Associate Professor Chen Jianlin of UIBE Law School for their important contribution to this book. I would like to also thank again Professor Han Shiyuan of Tsinghua University Law School for his contribution in advance. I believe that it will help to play a bigger role thanks to your greater contribution. Next, let's start the first topic, experience and challenges of application of CSG in China. Let me invite Professor Lu Song to moderate online. Leaders, friends, good morning. It is my privilege to join you at the CSG at 40 conference and moderate session one. The topic of this session is experiences and challenges of application of CSG in China. For this topic, we have invited five speakers. CISG was adopted in 1980 and applied in the same year. I just logged on the ancestral website as I checked, there were 94 members. That means CISG has been widely accepted and applied worldwide. I teach at China Foreign Affairs University as a professor and has long been a practitioner in 
arbitration since 1989. In my work, especially in disputes relating to international sale of goods, I often apply CISG. Each of the five speakers will be introduced one by one before they take four. The first one is Mr. Wang Haifeng, a judge from the Supreme People's Court of China, or SPC. He graduated from Renmin University of China in 2004 with an LLM degree. He joined SPC in the same year. He has a lot of experiences, mostly in terms of international and foreign-related commercial maritime adjudication and the judicial review of arbitration. Apart from the number four tribunal on civil adjudication, he also worked on the number five circuit court of SP. See, he would like to discuss the application of CISG in China's judicial practice. Now, the floor is yours. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good, good morning. It is my delight and privilege to attend this international conference. In international sale of goods, CISG is the most influential international convention, joined by 94 members so far. It went into effect for China in 1988. Chinese courts have followed and applied CISG. To the maximum extent, Chinese courts respect the text of CISG. Next, I want to factor in the application of the CISG in judicial practice and make my presentation accordingly. Let's first look at the statistics. Since 2010, the number of cases where CISG is applied. From China Judicial Decision website, I found 312 cases. From this chart, you can see that from 2010 to 2020, the number of CSG-related cases was generally on the rise, especially after 2012. There was a hike. The number surged. After the 18th Central Congress of the Communist Party of China, a call was made to roll out rule of law and open China wider to the outside world, and the surging number is attributable to that. In 2015, there was a decline. In that year, as we know, China's foreign trade took a dip. That was related to the international situation. In 2015, China got a st stock meltdown because of the price erosion of commodities in the international market, world economy and international trade contracted. The number of disputes also shrank as the, those trade trends reflected on judicial practice. Then, the number rebounded and skyrocketed in the following year. But in total analysis, the number of CISG applied cases was kept at a high level 
in 2019 and 2020, due to the impact of the pandemic, or despite those impact, the number did not fall dramatically. Next chart shows you the geographic distribution of CSG applied cases across the provincial courts. If a province is absent here, that means over the past decade, between 2010 and 2020, CSG was not applied to any case in that province. On this chart, you can tell that the cases concentrate on the developed cities along the coast. What is surprising to me is that Zhejiang province ranked the first across the country. In terms of volume of foreign trade, Guangdong province is the largest. But in that province, foreign trade is more mature and there's less dispute. But a possible reason, alternatively, is the highly developed arbitration in that province. Many disputes were handled through legislation rather than litigation. It may also tell us that the foreign trade situation in Zhejiang province and the judicial environment are both very sound. On the third chart, you can find the distribution of the cases across different levels of the court system. The intermediate court level got the largest share because they hear both first and the second instances. The caseload at SPC level is very small. I only found seven of them over the past decade. On the fourth chart, you will find the procedures involved. The number of first instance cases stood at 160. At the second instance, there were 117. By comparing the data, we can be reminded. Actually, just to attend this conference, I did this analysis pur purposefully. I was alerted because the rate of appeal is quite high. So we can tell that from this chart, many cases were appealed. It is worthwhile to reflect on this and remind ourselves of this. Luckily, the retrial rate is very low. The message from this is the following. Although many cases were appealed, the appellate court is quite powerful in correcting mistakes. After the second instance, disputes were basically resolved reasonably. So it was much rarer for the parties to seek retrial. Only seven went to the SPC. Most of them were SPC. Uh, retrial cases, and only 10 cases were retried at the level of provincial high courts. From 2010 to 2020, only about 10 cases proceeded to retrial. That means in the application of CRSG, after the first and the second instances, disputes over international sale of goods were properly and satisfactorily resolved. 
There's a special procedure listed on the right. The rightmost column reverse, refers mostly to the judicial review on arbitration. So CSG was applied in arbitration, and those cases were brought to the court for cancellation or non-enforcement of the arbitral awards. This number is very low. Mr. Wang just told us arbitration institutions handled many CISG applied cases. Very few of them were brought to the court for cancellation or non enforcement. The low proportion tells us that arbitration has played a very positive role in applying. CISG. Next, I would like to move on to discuss the application of CSG in Chinese courts. What are the circumstances? Article 1 of CSG provides that Chinese courts may apply CSG in the following circumstances, subject to the reservation. First, it is based on the place of business. So the parties are in different states and fail to agree on the governing law. So courts can directly apply CISG. And try this case. There are numerous cases of this kind. Second, the places of business for both parties are members, and the governing law was chosen, but CSG was not excluded. And in such circumstance, the court will also apply the CSG directly. A famous case is Chem China International versus. Gruber. That is one of the guiding cases published by the court. The parties agreed to apply the New York law. However, they did not explicitly exclude application of CISG. Therefore, in this case, the court applied CISG. It was published by SPC as a guiding case. Guiding cases are not judicial interpretations. However, courts at different levels shall refer to the guiding cases. The third circumstance is the following. Both parties agree to apply or prefer CSG, whether or not they are located in contracting parties. If CSG is agreed to be applied, then we do not need to review whether the parties are located in contracting parties. And this circumstance does not have the same legal basis as the two previous ones. So the pre two previous ones are mandatory for application, and this one falls into a part of the contract. If you choose to apply CSG, of course, we will comply with you. And that is what the contract says. And contract is the law between the parties, unless the contractual provision violates the mandatory provision of the law or public interest. Otherwise, contract will bind the two parties. So in China, the court will directly apply CSG in three circumstances. First, the place of businesses are in different part countries. If the parties are in the same country, then the international convention will not be applied. Second, the two parties are both located in contracting parties. 
Third, the two parties did not exclude CISG. If they agree to exclude it, the court will follow the governing law chosen by the parties or the rules of international private law. Next, I would like to discuss the difficulties of the application. In the modern difficulties, there are the frequent, frequently encountered issues. First, does CSG Article 6 allow parties to implicitly exclude the application of CSG? In our guiding case number 107, we have a set of rule or principle. Absent exclusive, explicit exclusion, what is there implicit exclusion in our trial? We need to ask the parties. If the parties did not explicitly exclude the CISG, we would not find explicit, implicit exclusion. And this rule has two sides. First, we defer to the will of the parties, let them choose. Second, we have also established a duty of interpretation for the court. In this situation, the court shall proactively explain to the parties. Second issue is whether CSG is applicable to the sales contracts among parties in the four territories within China. The courts generally holds that the four territories within China are not different countries. Therefore, the disputes on sales contracts among the parties within the four territories shall not apply the CSG. Third, when CSG needs to be interpreted, we make a distinction of two situations. First, can the selected CSG jurisprudence be the basis for Chinese courts to make decisions? In the guiding case number 107, it was held that the CSG jurisprudence digest is not a part of the convention and cannot be a basis of decision making, but it may be a reference or a part of the reasoning of the judicial decision. Fourth, how to deal with the matters not covered by CSG? First, if the disputed matter is outside the scope of CSG, then it is necessary to resolve the dispute through the application through the applicable law of contract. Second, the disputed matter is within the scope of CSG, but the CSG is silent or vague about it. Then, Article 7 of the CSG shall be invoked to do the interpretation, textual or you know, contextual. Fourth, I would like to offer my personal reflections on the application of CISG. First, shall China make reservation, um, reserve, uh, cancel or withdraw its reservation for Article 1.1.B? The academia is highly interested in this matter. Later, Professor Han will address it. It is my personal view that, so far, in judicial reality, withdrawal, withdrawal of such reservation is not timely and compatible with the current reality. The first issue is the finding of foreign law. If we follow international private law and apply the law of a contracting party, and that party may or may not make a reservation on the CSG, we need to find that. 
But the rules to find foreign laws and the platforms to make such finding are not well established. We are now actively advancing such efforts. Second is the criteria of the application. If the reservation is withdrawn, it is possible that, as a result, the various courts will have even more inconsistent criteria of application, and the bar will be more fragmented and less uniform. So now it is better to not to withdraw such reservation. Second is about the universal application of CSG across China. As we can tell, CSG is increasingly applied in China. However, there are still some people who believe that the Chinese courts, especially Chinese judges, are reluctant to apply CSG. Is it true? There may be a small number of such situations in practice, but that is not the common practice. With the change in the mindset, this situation has been very much improved. Particularly in recent years, a host of measures were published uh, to advance Belt and Road, expand Open Up, establish free trade areas and ports with judicial safeguards and judicial, judicial services. These measures would all mention that China needs to abide by its international treaty obligations, respect and accurately apply international rules and practices. And such mindset has been increasingly entrenched in the heart and the mind of the judges at the various levels. So CSG will be increasingly applied in China. All the points that I offered are my personal views. It is my wish that the experts and scholars, colleagues here, will comment on them to inspire me. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Wang Haifeng, for your excellent speech. Your speech reminds me of one issue, namely the relations between international treaties and domestic law. Secretary General Wang mentioned the China's general principles of civil law and the original civil procedural law, both clearly stipulate that in case of conflict between international treaties and domestic law, the international treaties that China joined shall prevail, except when China makes a reservation. But that provision failed to be included in the recently promulgated a civil code. I'm not quite aware of why that is the case. International conventions or treaties fall into two types. One is those that can be directly applied. The other is those who cannot. In terms of the CISG, SPC holds an open attitude and agreed to be directly published, uh, applied. So I would like to thank Judge Wang again for the speech. The next speaker is Professor Han Shiyuan, law professor at Tsinghua University. He's now a SJD supervisor in Tsinghua. He has many titles. One of them is special, namely the member of the CISG Advisory Council. This council comprises 
very famous CSG experts from various countries, the top-notch ones. They gather to discuss how to interpret the CISG provisions. So this is a position of special sense of honor. Professor Han is going to discuss the following topic, namely CISG in China, personal experience and new challenges. Now the floor is yours, Professor Han. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for your kind introduction. I feel greatly honored to have this opportunity to share with you my personal experience and discuss future challenges with some personal observations. The topic of this session is about experience and the challenges. Just now, I heard Secretary Wang Chengjie's presentation sharing with us the application in arbitration. And Judge Wang also shared information on the application of CISG to judicial activities. I feel greatly inspired by both of them. My position has determined that my sharing will be based on the teaching, research, and participation in legislation in China. So I would like to share with you what I have felt and learned. I personally believe that in narrow sense, of course, CISG's application is about its application to adjudication. However, if we broaden its connotation, we would find that the CSG is not only for adjudication. Moreover, it has also provided a model for the modernization of many domestic legislations. Indeed, in China, this is a wonderful model. Secretary General Wang just now mentioned it. In 1980s, in the early years of reform and opening up, China actively participated in ancestral activities, sent delegation to Vienna to attend the diplomatic conference, and voiced China's opinions on the relevant issues, representing an attitude and a stance of China to the world namely China's commitment to reform, opening up, and alignment with international rules and standards. Over the past 40 years, indeed, economic reform has enabled China to transit from the plant economy to the socialist market economy gradually. In this process, contract legislation in China has indeed learned a lot from CISG. The Foreign Related Economic Contract Law of 1985 is one of them. What is more impressive to me is the drafting of the Unified Contract Law. We learned a lot from CISG in terms of experiences and rules. You may know for the Unified Contract Law, the conclusion of contract as a chapter was initially entrusted to the team of UIB led by Professor Feng Datong. For the sales contract chapter, it was drafted by the team of China Academy of Social Sciences led by Professor Yang Huixing. For the tort uh, for the uh, damages for breach of contract, it was drafted by the team of 
Hebei University of China, led by Professor Wang Liping, has said this in order to let you be aware for conclusion, offer acceptance, and other detailed rules. Details were produced through the legislation of contract law for buy and sell. The risk allocation rules have been extensively aligned with the CISG rules. For liabilities, especially damages, and for seeability rule, also came from the impact of CISG. For the termination of contract, fundamental breach as a concept introduced from CSG, also derived from Article 25 of CSG. So in China, contract legislation has benefited a lot from CISG provisions. The reference. In legislation, also requires us to conduct academic research and teaching on contract law, which inevitably pay attention to CISG. In my own experience, such attention has helped me with my own growth and generated major impact. As a simple example. After termination of a contract, what are the legal consequences? That is a very controversial issue. Most of you, my colleagues, may have a similar situation with mine. When we were in law school, as we understood, for the termination of a contract, contract ceased to exist, and the status quo will be returned to the status. Prior to the conclusion of a contract, this was an entrenched idea. After 1999, or in 2000, when I was a visiting scholar in Japan, I had opportunity to see the joint work of one university professor from Tokyo University and one professor from Hokkaido University. They translated. The Professor Peter Schlesheim of Germany, an expert on CISG. I read the Japanese version of this book. I didn't access the English or German version of this book. In the Japanese edition, I saw a very shocking, yet concise statement. After a contract is terminated. Uh, damages can still be applied after the rights and obligations are terminated, and it is a, a term for settlement of the liabilities. That brought my attention to the international contract trends. Represented by CSG, so CSG points us to a new direction of the development of a contract law. When I returned to China and taught and did research on contract law, and wrote papers and books on contract law, I tried to side with CSG and dropped the idea I held since I was in high school. I used the settlement doctrine instead of the previous one. So that is my benefit from CSG in my teaching and research, and the research carried on. On the 35th anniversary of CISG. Entrusted by CTAC, I did a research on the CISG-based decisions. I was given awards for four years, close to 100 cases 
a total length neared one million characters. After reading them, at that time I learned tremendously. For those topics, I also did some analysis and generated a preliminary report in Chinese and English. The English edition of the report was was presented in Basel University on the 31st anniversary of CSG and was later published. Just now, Professor Lu Song mentioned one special position of mine. Namely, a member of the CISG Advisory Council in 2013, in Tsinghua University, I organized one academic meeting on CISG. So the published CISG Advisory Council opinions were translated into Chinese as part of the documentation for the meeting. Later I will come back to this. My latest work is the translation of the books of Japanese colleagues, the Vice President of uh, Kyoto University, and his team from the Tokyo and Kyoto. So these CSG scholars published a book. Recently, the People's Court Press published it. For us, it is an excellent and concise interpretation of CISG. So this is my latest work. So I will skip the papers that I published. Next, I'd like to discuss my understanding generated from academic research and teaching. Facing the future, we may need to pay attention to certain issues. First, CISG is so far the most successful outcome of unified international private law movement. With 94 members, it has become a lingua franca of international sales, and the ultimate goal is not simply the unification of the text of the law, Rather, it should be the unification of the law in the course of operation. So now there's an emphasis on the unified interpretation and application of CISG worldwide. That requires the adjudicators to try to their best to drop their existing bias or the colored lenses are based on their national context. In many places, the phrasing and the statement of the CISG were designed to be appropriately distanced from domestic laws so that CISG will appear to be an independent yet consistent set of rules. When we interpret and apply CISG, we need to try our best to grasp such a feature of CISG. Of course, in a certain jurisdiction, so a Supreme Court may be the most authoritative interpreter of the national law. However, there's no, that is not the case for CISG. So the only possibility is to 
gradually achieve consensus on the interpretation in a global legal community? How can we develop such consistent interpretation? Of course, we need to pay attention to the decisions made in various countries and important institutions. While we pay attention to the jurisprudence, we may also consider the opinions of the advisory council. It is consistently and persistently producing opinions. So far, opinion number 22 is in progress. It aims to discuss the IP related goods, the obligation of the sellers to warrant the absence of IP defects, and the rapporteur is a German expert, and discussion is ongoing. A few days ago, an online meeting was held. For the published opinions, the international community has attached great importance. One was a visiting scholar in Harvard University in the law school library. These opinions were compiled and are placed in a prominent position in the library. The interpretations that I translated from the Japanese uh, books also regarded the council opinions as important points of reference and written in the uh, first few chapters of the book. And the opinions are designed to function like the SBC judicial interpretations. However, the council is not an official body. It is an organization of experts with influence. Of course, I don't consider mine to be consider myself to be one of them. I was just lucky enough to be invited to attend. But the other members are very famous scholars in various countries. When they opine, of course, they deserve attention. For example, in the German Federal Supreme Court, in a decision in 2014, opinion number 13 was quoted. So did the appellate court of Hague, Netherlands. It is my hope that the Chinese translations of those opinions can be published as early as possible so more people can read such opinions in Chinese. Apart from black letter rules, there are also commentaries. All opinions are informative academic papers, so the translation would indeed consume a lot of time and efforts. For the second challenge, I would like to discuss the applicability of CISG. As mentioned by previous speakers, I would like to emphasize that the CRSG shall be applied in accordance with Article 1.1.A, so the direct and automatic application shall be made without reference to the rules of international private law. But this position is controversial in China, Europe, Japan, and other major jurisdictions. So this is very controversial a topic. At least, given the unusual jurisprudence digest, we can see the basic stance, which is to promote the automatic application of the CISG. Second, for the non-automatic application, namely parties opt in. When I perused the CTAG jurisprudence, I found that in quite a number of cases, the parties 
opted in. Third, whether China should withdraw its reservation under Article 1.1.B. China has already withdrawn its reservation on the written form of contracts. Why was that reservation made back then? We have only limited literature to deduce the reason. As shown by such literature, in the Socialist Pact, like Representative Czechoslovakia, it was mentioned that in that country there were specialized laws on foreign related contracts and same point was made about representative of the Democratic Republic of Germany. I think what they referred to was sort of like the foreign related contract law of 1985 enacted in China. If that was indeed the reason, the three contract laws have been unified into the same one contract law of 1999 and further integrated into the civil code. So the contact has been totally different. If China considers withdrawal, what will be the consequence? Possibly, the application of CISG will be more likely because of that. So it is advisory, but it, it is possible to consider such withdrawal. The next one is the implication of Hong Kong, Macau, and uh, the Taiwan region. It is not because of the relations between PRC and those jurisdictions. A Hong Kong company and a US company may have a contract of sales. Shall CSG be automatically applied for adjudication? How about Macau or Taiwan? In practice, such cases may be encountered, at least in the awards by CTAC. The standard is not entirely consistent. In my report, I quoted the awards that confirmed the applicability to Hong Kong and Macau. So I think that is a point we need to pay attention to. For future challenges, we can also discuss the possibility to seek further progress of CISG adjudication. Well, legal provisions are quoted and the laws quoted, referred to by the court. We can compare them and make points. Sometimes arbitral awards are not as developed as judicial decisions. So the court judges tend to reason uh, in detail and specify the laws referred to. Although the laws may be quoted specifically in reasoning part, but the holding part is rather general. Shall we consider gradually improve on this? That is a challenge. A third one is the possible projects of the Supreme People's Court. Can we use judicial interpretations to open up the application by reference to the sales contracts involving Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan? And the second one is to open up international horizon with guiding cases. CISG is a unified international law, and it is also a part of the Chinese legal system. So it is both Chinese law, American law, Korean law, Japanese law. It is a common law of all of us. So 
Guiding cases may not be limited to the decisions made by Chinese courts, like Tison Kruber, a very classic case. However, if on the same topic, other countries have made very meaningful or even crucial decisions, and such precedents deserve attention and reference from us. Globally, referring to the decisions made in other countries is an emerging trend. So there is space to be opened up by using foreign cases. And fourth, the adjudicators shall be on guard against the political interpretation of CISG. Political interpretation is a term used by a German point of authority, Ma Professor Mark Nuss. He raised this concept, meaning that intentionally or not, adjudicators would make a decision on international uh, cases in a way that is favorable to the uh, domestic parties. So we need to guard against this. Sometimes it may be in an implicit way. For example, some concepts, especially interpretation of uncertainty or discretion, in CSG may allow a different decisions so that adjudicators may decide a case in a way favorable to his own country. And he offered a standard. In absence of such an issue, domestic and foreign parties may have an odd of one to one in terms of the likelihood of success. When I studied the CTAC, Awards. I found that the ratio is not one to one, one to two, but one to one point eight something. Does that mean that problem is serious in China? I don't think that is the case. Within what I read, there are multiple factors. In China, in the CSG applied awards, most of the Chinese parties were sellers, and the disputes tend to focus on the failure to recover the payment, and that is quite a straightforward fact pattern, and handling those disputes is relatively simple. And sometimes the parties simply did not attend. So some awards were made in absentia. And in some other cases, the foreign parties attend the arbitration but may not have found, find competent Chinese attorneys. For example, uh, Indian lawyer is hired to represent a party in China, and that may affect the final result. So we can conclude that CTAC awards have been fairly impartial and fair. Coming back to the applicability, as mentioned by reporters, in most of the cases, the application of CSG has been well done, except a few cases where improvement can be made. In conclusion, this is what I wrote at the end of the book. When COVID-19 pandemic is turning many countries towards isolation, they guard themselves against others. 
then globalization would face new challenges. That gives us an opportunity to reflect on globalization. Globalization has its pros and, of course, also cons. A different people may have different opinions. If you are in Paris, New York, Berlin, you see high-rise buildings, shopping malls, or similar products on sale. So that is a resu result of globalization. But the overall trend is still the increasing role, growingly important role, to be played by CISG. So Chinese uh, lawyers need to treat it seriously. We need to pay more attention to CISG's internal legal rationale. It is not the case that after you understand the Chinese contract law, you will automatically understand the CISG. So we need to make joint efforts to create a better tomorrow. Thank you, Professor Han, for your excellent presentation. Your topic reminds me of the interpretation of international treaties. The most official way to interpret an international treaty is for the contracting parties uh, to uh, make a unified interpretation uh, pursuant to Article 31 of the Vienna Convention. And they may also turn to International Court of Justice for advisory opinions. It is a rare, if not impossible, way. And the New York Convention of 1958 adopted ICA compilation of the national case law decided in national courts. That has been an approach used for decades. For CSG, an advisory council comprising a small number of but high-caliber top-notch experts from various countries produce opinions for people's reference. And this is a good and innovative approach. The third speaker is Madame Huang Rui. Madame Huang Rui used to work in centrally administered state-owned enterprise with 21 years as in-house counsel. She was former general counsel of China General Consulting and Investment Co. Limited. She's also a senior arbitrator with many years of experience. Madame Huang is going to discuss the application of CSG to product contracts of Chinese companies, observations and reflections. Now let's welcome Madame Huang. Distinguished guests, on site and online. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I would like to thank Professor Lu for the kind introduction and the organizers for the invitation which gives me this opportunity to share with you my observations and reflections coming from the transaction lawyering and uh, arbitration so that we can discuss together the application of a CISG to product contracts of Chinese companies. Due to the time limit, I would like to limit uh, my sharing to three aspects. First, China keeps expanding its reform and opening up and integrating itself to global economic system. The number of projects of Chinese companies skyrocketed and CSG is applied and the two reinforce each other and form a sound symbiotic relationship. Year 1988, is the start of the second decade of China's reform and opening up. Obviously, when Chinese companies deal with the counterparties from the contracting parties of different jurisdictions, cultural background, will have a stable basis of the foreseeable governing law. And when they conduct 
international trade and negotiate contracts, it will be uh, more efficient uh, for contracts to be signed and performed on the part of Chinese companies. On the other hand, the Chinese economy keeps surging for 40 some years, and that has resulted in a huge number of projects conducted by Chinese companies. The application of a CISG to contracts and dispute resolution will generate immense vitality. And this is my observation and thinking. If we take a closer look, we will uh, find that through three dimensions, we can find the following features in review. In terms of the categories of projects, over the past 20 some years of my practice, I found that the Chinese companies do projects in a, a broad and universal way, covering all kinds of infrastructure projects like highways, high speed rail, metro, ports, airports, power, and all kinds of urban services uh, like water treatment, purification, solid waste treatment, and also heavy and light industries from all kinds of industries. The CISG is applied to various kinds of contracts by geography. Chinese companies also cover contracts in all over the world, uh, covering major developed and developing, developing economies. The Chinese uh, companies import a lot of high-value electromechanical equipment, including complete set of equipment, production lines, and a complex single machines. They tend to be from Europe, US, Japan, and other developed economies. On the other hand, China also imports a lot of raw materials and the primary products from both developed and developing economies worldwide. It is also important to note that so since 1980s and 90s, Chinese companies have been expanding globally with the Belt and Road Initiative proposed in recent years. The Chinese companies have been able to assume a larger and a larger share in terms of international contracting and export by selling products, doing EPC, subcontracting, consortium, and other ways. Chinese companies export to local purchasers and also join supplies of third countries uh, to do cross-border procurement. And such activities concern both raw materials and equipments. All these have a good chance to expand the application of CSG to not only China, but also other countries in the course of uh, contract management. In terms of the contractual terms, the application falls into three categories. The first, the Chinese law is explicitly chosen as the applicable law, and therefore CSG is applicable. In my 20-some years of experience in domestic projects, we almost always choose to apply the Chinese law as the governing law. In international contracting, Chinese EPCs also procure a lot of materials and electromechanical equipments in the host country, the neighboring countries, and from China. A Chinese law will be chosen as the governing law. That is my personal observation. So this is the majority of the cases for CISG to be applied to the EPC contracts. When I handle arbitration cases, I've also found cases where the contract is silent about the governing law, and CSG is the only one chosen, and or the contract is silent on 
any governing law, and Article 1.1 of CSG is applied. For example, uh, both parties are in contracting parties, or in 1990s, I handled a CTAC case where a Chinese firm and a U.S. firm had a dispute over a production line, and both parties directly applied a CSG terms. So when they apply for uh, the arbitration and made their case, they use the CSG. In these three kinds of situations, a CSG is not excluded, and then CSG will be directly applicable. In my own observation, in most of the CSG applied cases, the Chinese law is chosen as the governing law. If there is no provision in the contract and the CSG is directly applied, in those projects, uh, Chinese companies tend to be manufacturers or private companies. Just now, Judge Wang gave us statistics of judicial cases and showed us a concentration of cases in Zhejiang province. So my finding is consistent with his. This is my first observation. It is my personal feeling that China is a contracting party to CSG, and that position is helpful to the efficient negotiation, conclusion, performance, and enforcement of product contracts particularly for super-large projects uh, with a group of contracts, the negotiation will be much more efficient because of the application of CSG. In my own experience, the high-speed rail equipment modernization and uh, railway line constructions uh, dedicated to passenger transport since uh, 2004 involved the procurement of the uh, EMUs and the construction of the various high-speed rails. And at the early stage of those contracts, numerous equipments and parts needed to be procured from Germany, France, Italy, Japan, US, and many other countries. And the vendors are in number of dozens. When I negotiated those contracts as a leader of the negotiation team, we could smoothly and efficiently achieve agreement on governing law and dispute resolution, and that is attributable to China's position as a CSG contracting party and is consistent practice over time. In such super-large project contracts, we have successfully agreed to apply Chinese law and handle disputes in CTAC. By proportion, for such large project group of pro contracts, in the course of performance, many disputes, claims, or even disputes arise. Since the governing law was clearly chosen, a lot of the claims and disputes were efficiently and success successfully resolved through negotiation. And that is a better way to protect all the parties. That is my first observation. Secondly, as I have found, Chinese companies are happy to comprehensively accept CSG without proactively excluding it, excluding it. When Chinese companies and the contract parties agreed to apply the Chinese law or directly apply CSG uh, in the rare cases, or governing law is not chosen in the contract. In my dozens of years of experience, Chinese companies never proactively exclude the CSG by Article 6. 
in our negotiation, when we deal with the negotiators from common law jurisdictions, when CSG is requested to be excluded, the Chinese team would be surprised, and they would try their best to prevent such exclusion. What are the reasons? By my analysis, for legal technicality, usually we would believe that explicit provision shall be set forth for the exclusion. Not excluding CISGs, therefore, technically guaranteed for this obvious reason. And behind that, there is also a cultural reason for contracts. As a feature, Chinese companies have a historical tradition to respect international treaties, including CISG, of which China is a member. So Chinese companies usually would not factor in their individual interests to exclude a treaty that China as a country has joined. So that is a hallmark of the contractual culture of Chinese companies. Second, Chinese companies have a, a custom of concluding concise contracts in keeping with the tradition of civil laws system. Contracts are more keen to strike a deal and duly performing, perform the deal. So Chinese company would pay less attention to how the disputes or risks will be handled and therefore exclude the application of the CSG for the handling of such frequent or rare disputes. Thirdly, Chinese companies are so far less sophisticated in terms of uh, contract legal risk management, and they also invest less to such management. China has been reform, reforming op and opening up for decades. There's also amazing explosive growth for contracts, but generally, contract legal risk management is not catching up with the economic growth and legal investment is inadequate. So it is rare uh, for a Chinese company uh, to customize the application of CSG per its individual uh, needs and interests through systematic evaluation. Uh, so they won't uh, do such assessment and uh, calculate the pros and cons of the convention versus its own interest and then decide to exclude it. I haven't found such cases. I have also heard that some American companies have internal negotiation policies to avoid the application of CISG pursuant to Article 6. So explicit exclusion will be made in the contracts. So there is nothing to criticize it. So parties uh, choose their governing law for their own interest. But that can tell that the contract legal risk management and investment are different between Chinese and foreign companies. Thirdly, what are the recommendations on the uh, challenges and improvement of the unified application of CISG? So far, there are 94 contracting parties, and they have covered most of the major traders and economies worldwide. So that has laid a solid foundation for the unified universal application. The fundamentals are ready, but are there any challenges? Of course, obviously there are. I found two of them. First, 
But different from 40 or 50 years ago when the CSG was negotiated and adopted, e-commerce and IT have been widely deployed in more and more countries. The underlying transactions have been fundamentally and broadly changed. So that is a challenge for broader application of CSG. There is also a new demand for the application. And the exclusion of the application of the CSG by parties from contracting um, parties is also a challenge. As shown by ancestral statistics, by absolute amount, quite a number of contracts have explicitly excluded the application of CISG. When contracting parties negotiation, negotiate their contracts, how can we reduce and avoid their exclusion? So that will be a way to broaden the application of CSG. I would like to proceed to offer three recommendations on the extended application. First, and Citral and the various parties uh, can pay more attention to Chinese companies, authorities, trade associations, and arbitration institutions for their questions, needs, and improvement recommendations on the application of CSG. Second, I would like to see the content of the convention improved so as to accommodate a different legal culture and jurisdictions, including China's. And there can be also translation for different languages, you know, Article 72 and other provisions mentioned the fundamental uh, breach, and the other uh, party may declare the contract avoided. So the Chinese translation is So you are experts versed in the Chinese law, and such a term has a meaning in contract law and the civil code, which is quite different from the CSG's connotation. And the CSG term is actually closer to the termination of the contract than the uh, void, voidable contracts within the Chinese law. Thirdly, as a realistic consideration, it has been mentioned many times, yet it is still the most useful way to promote the application. So we need to uh, better train the litigation and uh, transaction lawyers, in-house and external counsels from different jurisdictions, so that CSG can be promoted and better understood and increasingly applied. At least, exclusion can, caused by misunderstanding can be avoided. When we negotiated with a Canadian company, and the counterparty uh, wanted to exclude the CSG. And when asked about the reasons, the counterparty said, we didn't know the reason, and we just generally know it is better to apply English or American law. Even if the governing law cannot be agreed upon, at least we want to exclude the CSG. We believe that as long as Exclusion is not proactive, and on an informed basis, we need to avoid the exclusion caused by misunderstanding through better training and promotion. That is the end of my speech. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Huang Rui, for your speech. Let me invite the next speaker, Mr. Dong Xiao, a partner of Anjie Law Firm, a JSD, with 25 years of practical experience. His topic is experience in handling disputes involving CISG and suggestions for Chinese users. Now the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Lu, for the introduction. Leaders, guests, and colleagues on the of line, greetings to you all. In my own speech, I would like to share with you my own practical experience and reflections on the handling of CISG cases, and I would like to also make some suggestions to Chinese users. So my speech will be more practical uh, in terms of the level. So you know, CSG is an important development of the international rule of law. I would like to give you a case summary to share with you my experience. In 1997, I represented a CSG-involved case in CTAC. So this is a very typical disputes over international sale of goods. A Chinese company was a seller and the German company was a buyer, and they have an international contract of sales. LC was refused, and then the seller urged performance and gave reasonable period of time for performance, and then it was defaulted, and the seller announced the cancellation of the contract, commenced the CTAC arbitration and achieved a favorable award. And it was not brought to German court for enforcement because it was automatically observed by the German company. My memory is very clear because this is the first CSG case that I handled. I got the book on the interpretation of CSG. I just checked article by article uh, when the performance shall be urged and uh, when can contract be avoided. So actually, I quoted CSG term by term, article by article in my documentation. I still remember many of the points made. Some of the problems are no longer problems because they have been resolved by the experts. I would like to still share with some with you some of the questions at, that I pondered for your reference. So first, uh, in fundamental breach, so the contract avoidance shall be announced. So and that is called avoidance uh, of the contract in Chinese law. But my client was very puzzled. If a contract is voided, how can I make a claim based on it? Refer to foreign related economic law, which was still effective back then. So the client challenged me, and we checked the English version of the lawyer's letter. So uh, I checked that against the convention and confirmed with the client that uh, my phrasing was consistent with the CSG, and then persuaded the client. Uh, second, about the damages for breach as Article 74 of CSG, the damages included the profit that could be obtained uh, from the co contract. It was uh, not available in the contract law, but only available under the foreign related contract law. So we did calculation with the clients. The non-breaching party resold the products uh, to a domestic company. There was a resale price. We calculated the loss, CRF minus the resale price. Is it enough? No, that was not the case. The profit wasn't included. So the attainable uh, profit was added back. So uh, we minus the I and the F. Shall we uh, plus the profit? We did the calculation back and forth. So the uh, resale price minus the avoided expenses. So we then did the calculation back and forth, and it was finally awarded by CTAC. And the third is for the items, you know, not prescribed under 
contract or CSG. So CSG was applicable, of course, but how can we determine the validity of a contract and enforceability of it? So it was also a question we confronted there. Then Article 7 of CSG was applied. So if the matters were not set forth, then by general principle, interpretation shall be made. Absent that, the international private law uh, will be used, like the closest uh, connections, exporting a place of export, and then all these auctions were operated to choose China or the Chinese law as the governing law. So these considerations may still be of referential value, even today, as counsel and arbitrators are handled more and more CTAC cases, of uh, 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 CSG cases concerning the US, Mexico, Canada, Japan, Korea, Singapore, France, Germany, Italy, in Europe. So these countries claim more uh, cases. I don't have the exact number. In the subsequent uh, disputes, I would like to focus on two categories because they involve Chinese parties more. In one category, has the contract been validity, uh, validly formed? So that is a typical dispute. When price fluctuates, the mindset of businessmen will also change. They make offer and counter offer, so terms are pretty vague, not accurate. Once the price fluctuates, Dramatically, one party may resell the products for a better price. Was a contract, a binding one, formed? So that is a typical dispute. How can we determine the offer and acceptance, as well as the formation of the binding contract? That is our question. Second, you know, Chinese companies tend to be the sellers. So one common dispute is that over quality of delivery, mostly con con concentrating on Article 38 and uh, 39 of CSG. The buyer may challenge the uh, quality and exercise is right. First is about inspection and the timing of the inspection particularly. Was the inspection conducted at a reasonable time? So the inspection shall be made and notice be sent to the seller. And second one is about the location of the inspection. So the delivery shall be made uh, for the destination port. Only in intermodal transport will the delivery be made to the final destination. So inspection typically would not happen until the delivery reached the factory of the uh, buyer. However, the contract says the destination of transport is the port. So is the claim valid despite such distance? The third is the form of claim. The inspection port may not describe how the packaging was made or loading was made into the containers. So was it my cargo? And the inspectors may not be duly qualified and the inspection may be conducted by the employees of the buyers. So are they valid inspections? So these are the typical disputes experienced by Chinese parties. I would like to skip more details, and I would like to make some recommendations to Chinese users. So the users may include enterprises and the lawyers helping the clients with contract drafting. There are five of them. First, for international contract of sales, we need to pay attention to the choice of CSG. We need to choose it. So that is one way for CSG to be expanded. And with the broadening application of CSG, we deserve to pay more attention to it. And I also stay tuned to the book by Professor Zhang Yuqing. So in 1980s, uh, uh, 10 countries tendered their instrument of ratification. So in 1988, the CSG uh, started applying to those countries. Then in the second edition, the number jumped to uh, 51. 
1997, then in 2009 the number shot up to 73, and now it is 94. So all the more than two thirds of the uh, leading traders are already contracting parties. ICC also published some model contracts for sales and distribution. So CSG has been chosen as a default governing law, and they also have their Chinese versions available in China. So we need to pay more attention to choose, apply, and interpret CSG. Second, we need to pay attention to the completeness of the contractual terms. CSG doesn't cover everything in international sales goods. Some items are not covered there under, so we still need to cover them by contracts. So let's write the Chinese law into the contract to fill the gap between CSG and the reality. And the third is to pay more attention to trade practice with a CSG. That is also why CSG has been applauded. In Article 9, so the party's agreement on trade practice is respected and held above CSG. Later, eco terms will be discussed. So CSG may not cover it. If eco terms is chosen, the transfer of risk will be specified not beyond the CSG. For transport insurance and payment, there are a host of international practices. We need to pay more attention to them and their relations with CSG. We also need to pay attention to PICC. In our cases, sometimes, though PICC is not a law, it is deemed to be international trade practice and included into contracts to fill the gap of CSG. And fourth, let's pay attention to the relations between domestic laws and the CISG. Judge Wang and other speakers already mentioned it, so I will not repeat. Fifth, let's pay attention to case studies. So I've uh, included here uh, the opinions of CISG Advisory Council. Some Anglo-American lawyers are reluctant to apply CSG because in Anglo-American law, every term of the law is supported by numerous cases, so the text of CSG is more difficult to understand. Therefore, ANCITRO has been collecting and compiling CSG-involved cases from the various countries. Cloud was mentioned as a database, and Unilex has also a case and database for PICC and CISG. Uh, I've also included here the opinions of CSG Advisory Council. Professor Hans Council also opined on hardship, and that is very helpful to the application of CSG in the context of the pandemic. Practical guidance is offered therein. So I would like to just uh, offer such recommendations in the light of my work experience for your reference. I hope that in your application of such a unified international law and the grow international trade, my points can be somewhat helpful. Thank you. That is the end of my speech. Thank you. Esquire Dong Xiao, for your speech. The last but not least the speaker is Professor Gao Xiang from China University of Political Science and Law and uh, SJD supervisor. And he is also, very importantly, executive chairman of ICC China Commercial Law and Practice Commission. He is going to uh, discuss the relations be between CISG and the INCO terms. Now, please, Professor Gao Xiang. Thank you, Professor Lu. I would like to thank CTAC for inviting me to attend this conference. It is my privilege. Distinguished guests, let me start. I'm assigned to discuss INCO terms. On this occasion, I would like to 
you know, combine these two, Incoterms and the CISG. I would like to focus on three things. First, what is Incoterms? You may know it well, I still want to offer some information. Second, Incoterms was recently amended, so I would like to walk you through the highlights of the amendments. Third, the application of Incoterms in the context of CISG. This is the Incoterms 2020. This is a quite a technical slide. By the form, as you know very well, trade terms consist of three letters. A is a seller's obligations, B, buyer's obligations. What are the legal meaning of this? It covers different things uh, from uh, CSG. Its scope is very narrow. CSG covers every aspect of a contract. Inco terms only cover international sales of goods without covering IP, and Inco terms focus only on delivery. So it is like the boilerplate terms for delivery. When Inco terms are referred, the basic rights and obligations of the parties are described and the risks and the costs are allocated. So this is what INCO terms is about. It is much narrower than CSG, but it contains more details. I'm still dwelling on what INCO terms is. So you have seen here INCO terms 2020, issued by International Chamber of Commerce. Then look down there, ICC rules for the use of domestic and the international trade terms. Those sitting with us here and online would know that a Chinese language to call it the general principles of the interpretation of international trade terms. But if you read the ICC title, you will see both domestic and international trade terms, although the Chinese version only contains international without domestic. I'm the first round reviewer of this, and it has puzzled me for a long time. I even authored a paper after more than one year of research. I think it's a vital question. If it is also trade terms for domestic trade, then it will be very helpful to the standardization of domestic contracts. Let's first look at the context for INCO terms to be drafted, you know, in CIF and FOB. And they were abstract initially. FOB was the first to be created. If I'm the buyer, I just sell a little boat to your doorstep to get the cargo. You move it onto my, load it onto my boat, and that is FOB. And the price you pay is FOB. So you leave all the other things to me. So in 1812, the first precedent was decided, and trade terms were used in all countries. But when ICC was founded, there were two problems. Unlike today, there is internet. It was difficult to find the INCO terms. If I'm new to the industry, I will not know the trade terms. So you have to teach me. Even if the terms are found, different countries or even different companies may interpret the trade terms in different ways. The ICC is tasked to promote the development of international trade. The first and foremost 
mission is to do something about it. So, as you know, in 1919 it was founded. Then in 1920, at its conference, it decided to do something about trade terms. Then the first edition of 1923 was published. It defined the trade terms by this book, namely trade terms definitions. Then in 1929, the second edition was published also to interpret trade terms. So that could only resolve the first problem about the meaning of trade terms. And such efforts could not unify the interpretation. You know, there were some other interpretations, like American foreign trade definitions was provided. And you know, in other countries, there were other explanations. So that result in inconsistent interpretation. So this is the 20, 1923 version. So it is literally called definitions. This is the 1929 edition with a six plus something. Then in 1936, the first edition of Inco Terms was published. It was called Inco Terms. And then you can look at the subtitle. International Rules for the Interpretation of Trade Terms. So it is not called an interpretation of international trade terms. So it is an inter international rule for the interpretation of a trade terms. So that aims to produce unified interpretation. The main title and subtitle are simply just uh, the same thing. The main title is the abbreviation of the subtitle. Since you all know Inco terms, then later in several times, in, uh, including in 1990 and 2000, it was uh, updated. In terms of the uh, 20, Inco terms 2010, it was uh, called the ICC rules for the use of domestic and international in trade terms. So title has changed several times. And this, for this title, there were two reasons. With free trade developing, for example, in Europe, there's little difference between international and uh, domestic trade because of the absence of custom duties. In ICC Article 2, so it, Inco terms of the world and the U.S. need to be differentiated. In UCC, after 1990, amendments have been made to the various articles, including Article 2. It has not been officially revised, but there's a recommendation to stop using the trade terms under the UCC, and then the INCO terms will be applied. Then the ICC rules uh, were in revised to be in rules for the use of domestic and international trade terms by history. Actually, it is about international interpretation of trade terms. When voting was made in 1936, Britain voted against it because it should not be interpreted to interpret both domestic and international trade. So UK was against it, but in 1953, the UK accepted such phrasing. So the correct translation is the rules on international interpretation of trade terms, or international rules on the interpretation of trade terms. So this is an international set of rules. So that is the right way to translate the Chinese title. So I have uh, tracked the various additions, and I don't think the problems have been resolved. I can offer explanation, but I still haven't done my job uh, successfully, so I've been puzzling. So I hope that Professor Han can bring this question with him next time he attend the council meeting. 
So in code terms, I shall be in uh, international plus trade terms plus general rules on interpretation rather than the current wor wording. International trade terms plus rules for interpretation, and this is a brochure to be officially published. And then by reading it, you can understand the complete trajectory of history. Let me now move on to the amendment. From 1930s until now, there have been many additions. Every time it is updated, there's a reason. So in my book, the reasons are described. Amendment is not significant for this addition. One ad amendment is about the overall structure. The other is about the form and content. So I will walk you through this quickly. By the form, FOB is widely used in China, although FCA is not applied when it needs to be. So interpretation is offered for the overall structure and the term by term. There have been uh, two formats, so A and B separate. Now, for A for 11 terms have been bundled together. So you, as a user, will be able to differentiate the various terms contain, containing A that have a better understanding about how the expense is allocated and the ordering uh, wasn't very logical. Now, uh, by a general uh, principle, uh, obligations and the risk assignment, transport, insurance, so the order is now more coherent. So I can't cover all the details of this book. You are welcome to read it. But I would like to highlight one thing, because that is you know, crucial to arbitrators. In my research, I believe that the 2020 amendment may have some problem. Actually, trade terms are mainly the seller's obligations. There are not many buyer's obligations under INCO terms. In that of 1936 and 1953, you know, a principle was laid down, namely the minimalization, min minimization of a buyer's obligation. So apart from express agreement, even loading is not obligated in CIP because of market demand. If there is no separate agreement, the default is an A term. C is actually the minimum. Because of this, the, the basic uh, principle of the trade terms is uh, deviated. So I would like to move on to my final sentence. Inco terms and CSG have been widely applied. Inco terms may be even more applied than CSG. So when they converge, there's no problem. When they are different, we need to think about what to do. CSG is usually optional, and if there is uh, exceptional agreement, and that agreement shall prevail. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gao Xiang, for your speech. We have exhausted the five speakers for this session. They have done their job marvelously. So CSG is an incomplete law on international of course. So you may think of the 1893 British law on the same topic. And you may also ref 
or to UNIDRA, the, the International uh, General uh, Rules on Commercial Contracts. On behalf of the audience on site and online, I would like to thank sincerely all the five speakers. So the next topic is CISG resolution for Belt and Road trade disputes. Madam Zhou Xiaoyan will moderate this session. Over to you, Madam Zhou. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very honored and grateful to the organizers for inviting me to moderate the second part of the conference. In this part, we will have five panelists to discuss how CSG as the uniform law for international sale of goods can provide ways and solutions for commercial entities along the Belt and Road to resolve trade disputes. Experts of this panel are well-known legal experts, so I will introduce each of them before they take the floor. As we know, in 2013, President Xi Jinping of China put forward the Belt and Road Initiative, which has been well received and supported around the globe. So far, more than 100 countries and international organizations have signed Belt and Road cooperation documents with China, covering trade, investment, finance, infrastructure, science, technology, and culture. At present, more and more countries and regions are benefiting from the Belt and Road cooperation. Earlier this morning, DG Li Yongjie of MOFCOM mentioned that from 2016 to 2020, trade volume between China and other BRI countries exceeded 6 trillion US dollars. I would say that the implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, as well as economic cooperation and trade, require a sound legal environment. BRI is based on laws and rules and respects existing international laws, rules, and practices, as well as the domestic laws of the relevant countries. BRI countries have different legal systems and legal traditions, including common law, civil law, and Islamic law systems. Therefore, it is necessary to explore cooperation in the rule of law that reflects the spirit of openness, inclusiveness, and mutual learning. As a unified substantive law for international sale of goods, CISG reflects the integration and balance among different legal systems and accommodates the interests and requirements of countries at the different levels of development. It is inclusive, neutral, and modern. In particular, 94 countries have joined CISG, which makes it widely applicable. It can provide a model law for contract legislation in different BRI countries, for example, the contract law of China, which draws lessons from the basic principles and the specific rules of CSG, can also provide unified rules for the commercial entities of these countries to resolve trade disputes, such as fair dealing, good faith, compliance with the customs, and equal protection. In many cases, parties from different BRI countries choose to apply CSG to their contract of sales goods. In a CTAC case, for example, the contracting parties were from China and the UAE. Although UAE is not a member of CSG, the parties accepted CISG as applicable law. CSG is optional, not mandatory. Parties may choose to apply it or a member's national law instead of CSG. Yet another CTAC case Countries from, uh, com companies from Singapore and uh, China were involved, both being CR CSG members and uh, BRI countries. They agreed to apply Chinese law in their contract. As mentioned by other experts, besides the CSG, other international commercial rules, such as the principles of international commercial contracts of 2016, made by Unijoint and adopted by UN General Assembly can also be the applicable law under which parties from different BRI countries resolve their dispute over commercial contracts. 
On the other hand, BRI economic cooperation and trade can also provide a great platform for the application and improvement of international treaties and rules. For example, to resolve trade disputes, CISG and other international commercial conventions and arbitration and mediation rules can be used, such as the New York Convention, the ancestral arbitration rules, the ancestral mediation rules, and the Singapore Convention, which came into force in September 2020. From Secretary General Wang Chengjie's speech and other experts' remarks on the same first topic this morning, we have learned that Chinese courts and arbitration institutions actively apply CSG in trial and arbitration practices to resolve the disputes over international sale of goods and have gained a lot of experience as a trade and a research results. I hope they can offer reference to the future development and improvement of CSG. Under topic two, we will hear perspectives and practices different from Chinese ones. So let me invite the first panelist, Mr. Christian Alberti, Chief of ADR and the General Counsel of the Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration. SCCA. Christine Albert is the chief of IDR and the center council, and the general counsel of the Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration, SCCA. Prior to joining the SCCA in 2019, he was the assistant vice president of the International Center for Dispute Resolution the International Division of the American Arbitration Association, AAA, in New York. He also taught as an adjunct professor at New York University School of Law on international arbitration, international sales law between 2017 and 2019. Now, please, Mr. Albert. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Ms. Zhu. Uh, allow me uh, to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak at this uh, high caliber event. I'm very honored to be with you today, even though only remotely, to celebrate 40 years of CSG, a non citral text that is very dear to my heart and had the pleasure to teach. Now, going first to today on today's panel, I will spend some time on why the CSG can be the so-called lingua franca and perhaps is the right solution for belt and roads trade disputes with all its benefits in using it in cross-border transactions involving the sale of goods. Let me start with the good news. Since the CSG has been signed and ratified by now 94 states, it has become national law in markets that represent two thirds of the global economy and many are on the Silk Road, such as the People's Republic of China. So at first glance, the answer to the question posed to our panel today appears to be, yes, it is the right solution for BNR trade disputes, with China being the driving force behind it. You already have heard today much about the benefits or the main benefits of the CSG, such as harmonization by way of a uniform legal regime that is neutral, fair, transparent, and obviously apt for cross-border transactions that deal with the sale of goods. And remember, it automatically applies inter alia when contracting stay at parties are from signatory states. So why is the inquiry not stopping here? What is the bad news? For one, not all states on the Silk Road are yet signatories to the CISG, despite UNCITRAL doing an amazing job in trying to change that. But the bigger issue, issue I have at least experienced time and time again is that parties by reflex, reckless behavior, or simply due to ignorance, routinely exclude the CSG when adding choice of law clauses into, for example, uh, international supply contracts. Though I do acknowledge that uh, there are instances where opting out can make sense. And we're very privileged uh, that our esteemed co-panelist, Professor Wolf, will address this in more detail shortly. Now, coming to my main presentation, uh, that allows me to spend uh, my time on setting the stage for this panel for covering six of the benefits I see in using the CSG for BNR trade disputes. The first one is certainty. You may feel safe with your choice of law, but if you are, for example, an exporter, who guarantees you that your choice of law clause is enforceable abroad where the dispute may take you? Let us not forget that judges assess your choice of law clause in accordance with their domestic rules, and they may deem it ineffective. 
However, if the other party's state is also signatory to the CISG, then you have the benefit, benefit of the CSG applying along with autonomous interpretation. That is an approach as globally uniform as one can make it. And the judges, so arbitrators, should do so by resisting any homeward or outward trend. This is all the more relevant as the CSG is an international treaty that prevails over domestic law, which becomes particularly useful when that law changes. And certainly, certainty of the law is key for businesses in the long-term planning for economic dealings, as those uncertainties almost always lead to delay and costs. My second point is about transparency. Think, for example, of uh, general terms and conditions that often surprise parties with at times sophisticated and hard to read fine print. Companies at times may address very important items in there, such as choice of law or choice of forum. Under the CSG and on a case by case basis, it is generally not sufficient to simply make a small reference to the general terms and conditions in an email or worse, simply uh, refer you to a website expecting you to find the other party's general terms and conditions online. Now, it is true that the CSG may introduce stricter criteria in this regard than some national laws, but it is also true that parties do not have to worry about what the standard of inclusion of general terms and conditions in the next country they do business may be. There's, of course, also a flip side to this coin. If a party fails to provide the general terms and conditions to the other party before the contract is concluded, then they do not become part of the contract. Consequently, any choice of law clause excluding the CSG falls flat too, so that the CSG applies after all. My third point is about predictability. As for compensable damages, including lost profit, the CSG does not presuppose any fault by the breaching party. In fact, it is irrelevant whether that party breached the contract intentionally or by mere negligence. Article 74 CSG says what matters for being compensated is that the loss is suffered as a consequence of the breach and that the breaching party, I quote, foresaw or ought to have foreseen at the time of the conclusion of the contract in the light of the facts and matters of which he knew, then knew, or ought to have known as a possible consequence of the breach of contract, end of quote. And given that the assessment of foreseeability largely overlaps with the determination of causality, I would argue that it is less urgent to adopt a strict notion of causation. Now, this concept of foreseeability of damages is alien to many domestic jurisdictions that uh, look at the intention of the party in breach. So to summarize, when the CSG applies, the damages obtainable by the aggrieved party are limited to those that are foreseeable to the breaching party at the time of contract conclusion and irrespective of any intention or negligence that is often very hard to prove. This was also confirmed among other, many other decisions dealing with the CSG by the Shanghai High People's Court in 2011. Now, coming to my fourth point, stability. In contrast to many jurisdictions, jurisdictions, domestic jurisdictions, the CSG protects the contract insofar as not every breach allows the grief party to walk away from the contract. We heard about this before. Under Article 49, Subsection 1A, to avoid a contract, the breach must be fundamental. Article 24 clarifies that this is the case when the detriment to the aggrieved party substantially deprives him or her of what he or she is entitled to expect under the contract. However, there is also an exception built in for those scenarios where the breaching party, and I quote, did not foresee and a reasonable person of the same kind in the same circumstances would not have foreseen such a result, end of quote. So essentially, the threshold to declare the contract avoided under the CSG is a much higher than what you may find in many domestic jurisdictions. Indeed, contract avoidance is treated as a last resort under the CSG, trying to hold on to the contractual relationship as long as feasible. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it, particularly when complex cross-border transactions are at stake on the Silk Road. Coming to my fifth point, accessibility. Not only is it more cost-effective to engage legal counsel who are familiar with the CSG rather than having to identify lawyers familiar with the applicable foreign law, it also alleviates the need to learn and navigate through the rules and customs of a different legal system. The CSG also found a significant traction in the international arbitration community, which translates straight into easy access to expert arbitrators being familiar with the concept of autonomous interpretation of the text. 
You could even argue, uh, or even call it a perfect marriage between substantive and procedural regimes, which has manifested itself in the success story of the Willem Sievers International Commercial Arbitration Route. Now to my sixth and final point, consistency. Not only accessibility, but also consistency has been promoted by an impressive body of scholarly work and extensive sets of case law that are accessible online, free of charge, and in English. One example is Uncitral's case law on Uncitral texts in short cloud, which aims to promote international awareness of its texts and to facilitate uniform interpretation and application of those texts. There's also the Albert Kritzer CSG database of Pace University's Institute of International Commercial Law. It is perhaps worth noting that the late Professor Kritzer had made it one of his personal projects to collect as many Chinese awards and judgments dealing with the CSG he could put his hands on. Today, the CSG database has hundreds of them, along with a comprehensive global collection of legal materials in the CISG. Last but not least, there's also the UNCITRAL digest of case law on the CSG and of course the CSG Advisory Council, a private initiative that aims at promoting a uniform interpretation and application of the CSG by way of issuing opinions upon request or in some initiative. All this has propelled consistency and for that matter also predictability. Now coming to my final remarks of today, this, these are some of the many benefits that come with the use of the CSG. So where does it uh, all lead us? Reality is that the Silk Road has expanded tremendously in size, which further complicates harmonization and unification projects. And as long as transnational laws are not ratified at country level or fully embraced by the business community, it would be a very long road to eventuate a truly seamless trade system. Now, the silver lining is however, that more than 60 of the now 140 BRI states are signatories to the CISG and enjoy time-tested neutral contract law systems to resolve the dispute. And the so-called external gaps in the CSG can be addressed with care. By way of example, uh, to reduce, if not even eliminate national law at the, at, as the fallback position, Unidra's uh, model clause promulgates the CSG as the governing law of the contract to be interpreted and supplemented by the Unidra principles of international commercial contracts. Now, that all said, we cannot ignore that to some extent the CSG's application is also a matter of bargaining power. Even more parties come to sign from to signatory states. And despite the, I believe, compelling reason I've given you today, parties sometimes get sidetracked by the frequently asked question of whether the CSG serves you better as the buyer or the seller. I would argue that the question itself is already misguided. Yes, the CSG has many default rules, some of which I've mentioned today, but if that truly were the concern, then parties are largely at liberty to contractually rearrange what is not wanted and is dispositive in nature. For example, the parties can easily opt out of Article 43's notice regime if they regard it as too risky. So in essence, to blindly pass on the opportunities to the CSG has to offer to BRI disputes and not to buy into what I would call the lingua franca is unwise as if applied properly, it can lead to excellent results. And with that, I give back to our moderator, Mju, and thank you very much for your attention. The second speaker is Professor Louis Christian Wolf, Dean of the Faculty of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Mr. Louis Christian Wolf is Weyland Professor of Law and the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Professor Wolf specializes in Chinese and international business law, private international law, and comparative law. He has published many papers on international trade law, international commercial law, international arbitration. Now we'd like to ask Mr. Wolf to give his speech. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my slides first, please. There we go. Uh, thank you again, Madame Jo, for the kind introduction. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me to speak at this very important conference. My topic, as Ms. Alberti has already indicated, is the opt-out option of the CISG, reasons, risks for BI. I trade disputes and countermeasures. 
let's first look at Article 6, which is the important um, article of the CISG. Um, if the CISG applies, uh, the parties may exclude the application of this convention or subject to Article 12, derogate or vary uh, the effect of any of its provisions. This is a very important provision of the CISG because it guarantees absolute party autonomy, and I will get back to that point in a minute. Opting out of the CISG according to Article 6, therefore provides or allows for two different mechanisms. First, the parties can completely exclude the CISG application if it otherwise applies, or second mechanism, they are able to derogate from or vary the effect of specific CISG provisions. There's no form requirement and um, the, CI, the um, exclusion of the CISG can be done expressly or impliedly. Of course, from a practical point of view, from the legal certainty point of view that Mr. Alberti has just mentioned, which is so important, um, expressly opting out of the CISG is the must, much better, the much preferable option. But um, the CSG can also um, avoid it. The application of the CSG can also be avoided implicitly. This leads, as we know, to many, has led to many court cases when the parties, for example, uh, choose the law of a contracting state, they choose the law of a non-contracting state, they refer to sales or contract law regimes of a particular jurisdiction and so on. And all this, uh, in all these cases, it needs to be decided whether this implies the intention of the parties to opt out to avoid the application of the CISG. So an express opt out is always preferable. Mr. Alberti has already mentioned that uh, the CISG opt out rates are perceived to be rather high. You have some numbers here in the US as high as 71%, Austria 55%, Switzerland 41%. In China, interestingly, the opt-out rate, the perceived opt-out rate is only 37% and therefore relatively uh, low. Um, many have argued that these opt-out rates actually are to be counted against the viability of the CISG, but we need to be careful here because we need to see uh, the CISG opt-out rates in comparison with opt-out rates in relation to otherwise applicable domestic law. I will get to this point now. To the best of my knowledge, the only empirical study that has been conducted in relation uh, to opt-out rates or to opt-out reasons uh, of the CISG, actually it was a study um, about choice of law um, issues, was conducted, this study was conducted by um, Luis Gustavo uh, Moser and his um, arguments, are, um, his findings are published in the Journal of International Dispute Settlement 2017 and also in a subsequent book. He has sent out a survey to 10,000 of uh, lawyers and their clients and one of the questions he asked was, in your experience negotiating of a substantive law to govern an international sales contract, please indicate if you have avoided or opted out of a particular national law or the CISG. And as you can see here, the answer is quite interesting. About 60% have opted out of national law and only 33% have opted out of the CISG. And that's what I was referring to. Um, this is not hard evidence yet, but it shows that opt-out rates, that choice of law, the choice of uh, the applicable law by the parties um, is not just a CISG issue, it's also an issue for otherwise applicable domestic law. Why are parties opting out? You have a list of reasons that were identified uh, by Gustavo Moser here, and there are more here. We can conclude that the reasons for opting out are extremely diverse. And we can also conclude that the advantages and disadvantages of the CISG, which Mr. Alberti has so nicely set out in his presentation, are often not considered when parties decide uh, to opt out not to apply the CISG. In fact, irrational decisions to exclude the applicability of the CISG seem to dominate 
And you have some of the, those irrational reasons listed here. Lawyers normally prefer their own law. They're deeply attached to the law they have been brought up with. They are risk and change averse, and the CSG may uh, be a change for them because normally they apply domestic law. There may be time pressure, which does not allow them to look into the CSG and really calculate and assess the advantages and disadvantages. Sometimes, uh, as mentioned earlier, the opt out, high opt out rates are perceived as common practice, and uh, then lawyers and their clients just follow. And in some cases, there was also one bad experience, which is then generalized. All these reasons are irrational reasons. Again, they do not take in a particular and in a general context, the advantages and disadvantages of the CISG. Let's now turn to the BRI. Uh, the BRI, as we have heard today, and as we know, according to China's official website, has now 144 member states, including uh, countries in South America, Africa, New Zealand is a member, and of course, uh, in Asia, and also in Europe. That means that the CISG is no longer just the Silk Road, um, which uh, it was in the very beginning, in 2013. It's now BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, now stands for China's international um, business activities, outreach activities. And that is important also in the context uh, when it comes to assess uh, opt-out reasons, uh, opt-out options in the Belt and Road context. What we need to ask is if there are special BRI-related reasons for opting out of the CISG, in addition to the reasons that I have just quoted. Um, since the Belt and Road is now such a broad um, system, um, BRI countries are very, very diverse. And uh, due to this kind of diversity, it is hardly possible to identify any common opt-out reasons because the countries are different. But there's one point, and again, Mr. Alberti has kindly uh, paved the way for my presentation here. Um, he has mentioned that it, it, there is an issue of bargaining power when conflicts are being negotiated. Chinese parties, in particular in the Belt, Road, uh, Belt and Road context, are becoming increasingly powerful. The Belt and Road, as it stands at the moment, is to a large extent a one-way direction. Chinese parties are reaching out and these parties are strong. And it could be that parties, um, the other contract parties in other Belt and Road countries, they see this as a threat. And since China is, the BI is a Chinese initiative, China is a CISG contracting state, um, it could be that the other parties, the parties from other countries, they see this um, CISG as something which is imposed on them and therefore they push for um, uh, the opt-out option. Um, as I will explain in a minute, uh, this, is, this would be a misperception um, um, I'll get to that now. If parties opt out of the CISG, what are the risks? Are there any risks? Well, the risks are quite obvious. The risks, if you opt out of the CISG, is that you cannot take advantage of all the advantages uh, that have um, been mentioned at this conference already. All um, the advantages of the CISG. CISG is state of the art. It achieves unification, simplification. It avoids all the choice of law uh, issues that you normally have. And uh, last but not least, um, there is this special advantage, which I've already mentioned. When dealing with a dominant counterpart, the application of the CISG ensures that a neutral and tried and trusted trade law framework is governing. So for other BIA countries that are contracting with Chinese parties, the CISG seems to be the perfect option. And as you may have guessed from my um, uh, enthusiastic uh, points that I've made, um, I'm a great fan of the CISG and I want it uh, to be uh, even applied in an even broader manner. What is the future? Um, I believe that those irrational reasons for opting out of the CISG that I've mentioned earlier um, have, um, will continue for some time. They will prevail for some time, for many years, in the BRA context, simply because uh, there's no reason why that shouldn't 
it should be different than in other countries. The BIA countries uh, will not be different. But lawyers and their clients will learn to benchmark the CISG advantages against other options over time. They will learn to decide expressly whether the CISG is the better option or whether there are other better options, in which case Article 6 allows them to opt out. And that's exactly what Article 6 stands for and why it was included in the CISG. Are there measures that can be taken to reduce the CISG opt-out rates? Yes, of course. Um, promotional educational initiatives are important and will remain important in order to create awareness um, of the uh, uh, advantages um, of the CISG and China as the uh, BRI initiator and uh, a strong supporter of the CISG uh, can play a key role in promoting uh, the CISG as the framework for uh, BRI uh, related trade activities. Having said that, uh, decision making processes are routinely influenced, as I've mentioned, by cognitive biases and errors, um, estimations or odds leading to the irrationalities that Gustavo Moser has identified, um, and parties may simply pass over the better deal, despite um, uh, sometimes even better knowledge. The CISG is something alien, and we need to expect that in the future, um, some of these uh, opt-out uh, decisions will still be based on those reasons. Uh, nevertheless, I'm positive, I'm hopeful, because I believe that in the end, the CISG advantages will be recognized and the CISG will therefore play an even more important role also in the context of BRI. Thank you very much. Next, let's invite the third panelist, a person we are very familiar with, Mr. Philip Yang, a senior full-time arbitrator from Hong Kong. He's a member of the International Commercial Expert Committee of the Supreme People's Court of China. He is now serving as a, a counsel of maritime and commercial as well as trade business in Hong Kong. And he's a full-time arbitrator for such matters. He's also the honorary president of a Hong Kong International Arbitration Center and a member of the International Advisory Board of CTAC and a board member of SCMA. Over the past 30-some years, he served as the arbitrator of more than 1,000 arbitration cases and handled numerous international commercial and maritime cases. Now the floor is yours. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chao. Uh, I uh, I understand the time has been um, a little overrun, and I have to rush, uh, and um, and therefore uh, I I show my PPT uh, because I do not intend to actually cover all of them uh, in order to save time. And uh, uh, I hope all, uh, all of you can read it, uh, can uh, can see the slides uh, faster than. Uh, what I'm going to speak. Now, uh, the first, uh, uh, let, let me go to the first one, uh, uh, which is, uh, I need some help. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I have uh, arbitrated a lot in self goods dispute, international self goods dispute, especially a lot of them are shipment contracts such as CIF, uh, uh, namely the CIF FOB, uh, the, the uh, contracts are uh, co uh, usually commodity where large sums of money were involved. But uh, I must admit, uh, I'm not so appropriate for this particular conference uh, because I have little experience of CISG as the uh, governing law. Uh, uh, I still remember over 15 years ago, it must be over 15 years ago, when I sat uh, with uh, one CISG uh, arbitration uh, with uh, prof the late Professor Jan Rambin, uh, who is the past chairman of CISG Advisory Council. Uh, uh, and we actually come to an award uh, uh, 
uh, uh, concerning CISG, but that was only my uh, that was uh, my only experience uh, uh, that came uh, uh, to an award. Uh, uh, the, the, there were uh, two or three cases uh, in, uh, some years ago uh, with CISG, and uh, uh, because it is uh, uh, it, they were Hong Kong arbitrations. Uh, the, uh, either UK barrister or Hong Kong barrister, uh, they mutually agree uh, to abandon uh, before the hearing. Uh, so, so that's uh, the limitation of my experience of CISG. Now, uh, we have heard a lot of figures uh, 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 and from a lot of uh, previous speakers that it is very difficult to exclude uh, CISG because it is uh, go going to apply mandatory or automatically uh, to the uh, contracting states. And if you look at the contracting states, uh, we heard the number 94 countries. Uh, but if you look at the states, uh, they are all important trading nation, the most important trading nation, starting with China, uh, America, Canada, Mexico, the NAFTA countries, um, uh, uh, and Japan, South Korea, blah, 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 blah Australia, Netherlands. And uh, uh, in fact, England uh, or, or United Kingdom, which is not an important uh, trading country, uh, is actually uh, not a party, a contracting party to the uh, to CISG. So you would have thought with so many important trading countries, uh, which will apply by default uh, the, 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 the adoption or use of CISG then there should be a lot of uh, international disputes uh, which will concern uh, which concern sale of goods uh, uh, will apply CISG. But that's not the case uh, as far as my experience uh, is concerned. Now, uh, you will have thought uh, people will have to con uh, conscientiously exclude CISG uh, uh, and take the extra step uh, and trouble to do that. Uh, that would be very rare. But in fact, in my uh, experience, this is not the case. Now, if you look at the number of cases, uh, this is apparent. Uh, as, uh, uh, if you look at the last paragraph of this slide, uh, over 40 years, past 40 years, uh, from various sources, I've been told that there were only 4,500 uh, related cases. Uh, that number is very small. If you compare to England, for example, London arbitration, I, uh, 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 Hong Kong has similar experience, of course. But, uh, uh, the, uh, but in England, for example, London, uh, we only look at one uh, association, GAFTA, Grain and Feed Trade Association covering only grain and feed trade international sale of goods. Uh, that has an average of 800 cases between the year of 2014 uh, and uh, 2018. Uh, and if you look at LMAA, which has uh, to do with uh, uh, carriage of goods by sea, um, charter party, bills of lading, they've got uh, close to 200. Now, those are cases, uh, are the numbers. Uh, if you look at all the numbers together, you find it uh, much more uh, than 4,000 per annum, per, per year, rather than 40 years. So uh, uh, the, that those are English law uh, cases, uh, which uh, help to build up uh, uh, the jurisprudence of English law self good uh, and related um, contract cases uh, compared to CISG. Now, uh, my belief has to do uh, with uh, a few reasons uh, 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 why English law contracts still govern English sale of goods. Now, firstly, it is the dominance of English law and the practitioner, uh, uh, the, the, uh, or common law, if you want to call it, uh, common law practitioner, lawyers, uh, arbitrators, as, uh, now especially uh, in the uh, uh, international and related activities like self goods and marine time uh, that um, uh, they, they, they are in general by far in general more, more familiar with English law uh, uh, self goods law uh, contract and related uh, like charter party dispute and so forth. Uh, rather the, most of them will have uh, uh, would not know about CISG. Uh, that is the main. Uh, 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 one of the main reasons. 
uh, if you look at any trade, uh, trading company, even in China and so forth, if they have a problem, they call on uh, an English uh, lawyer or a common law background lawyer. Uh, that, uh, and um, uh, when it comes to international dispute, that is almost a standard uh, way of uh, response. Uh, the other reason is the wide use of English standard form, standard form. Uh, that, uh, uh, which expressly apply English law and exclude the operation of CISG. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the GAFTA contract, which we talked about a while earlier, is a typical example. And there are other contracts, uh, all standard yeah, English form standard contracts are like this. Uh, that's why uh, Professor Wolf just mentioned that uh, Chinese uh, parties uh, opting out rate is not that high, only around 37,000. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, the wide use of standard contract has been taken into account. As far as I know, uh, it, is, it is extremely wide use of standard English law standard contracts in China. And of course, the UK is not yet a contracting state to the CISG. Now, now I'm going to talk about tie together with, uh, with uh, One Belt, One Road CISG. Uh, firstly, uh, the Theresa Chen, the, the Hong Kong Secretary of Justice, has mentioned that um, it can actually be tied together, and uh, uh, and I see there are several reasons why it is uh, good to tie them together, uh, namely the CISG as well uh, the, with One Belt One Road. Firstly, uh, China and many countries uh, in uh, One Belt One Road would not be uh, consciously and willingly to apply English law or common law uh, to uh, the BRI related contracts. Now, uh, but of course, it's difficult to insist on their own domestic law, like China cannot insist on Chinese law. Uh, that will be resisted by other partners in uh, one belt, one road. So I thought CISG is a ready-made option to harmonize it, uh, harmonize this area of the law. And there are legal advantages uh, it's a uh, simple and plain language. Uh, uh, it is much more comprehensive uh, than English uh, self could say. Uh, yes, English law is very comprehensive, but many of those issues are, many of the issues are in the case law, uh, uh, which is not in one uh, document. Uh, and their language, uh, uh, no language barrier and so forth, so forth, which I will uh, uh, rush through. Now, uh, I also mentioned other peculiar features uh, in the BRI cells, uh, which would suit uh, CISG. Uh, now, the, 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 uh, the, uh, which I won't read all of them, the, 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 uh, I, I just saw the pinpoint one or two. Uh, a good number of those participant countries are less sophisticated and inexperienced, and, and so they would not know the, uh, uh, the uh, English law in depth. Uh, so, so, they, uh, uh, so the, uh, it is important to help them not to call the subconsciously exclude the use of CISG, and that would uh, perhaps uh, rely a lot on education and so forth uh, 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 by Ancitro and other uh, other interesting parties. Uh, uh, and I also put pinpoint another one. Uh, the the B, uh, one bell, one row uh, trade for transactions uh, are more likely to be uh, machineries, equipments, manufactured goods, and so forth, rather than commodities. And um, there are some saying that English law is more suitable for commodity uh, trading, uh, but uh, CISG is uh, probably a lot more suitable to deal with uh, with um, uh, the, the, the sale of those uh, uh, international sale of those um, uh, machineries, equipments, and so forth. And uh, uh, the, I'll explain a, a little the while as to why, it, uh, but, but I won't. It won't be long. But in essence, it is uh, the extremely pro-contract policy of CISG, which is important. Whereas English law, uh, it uh, turned sale of goods and uh, marine time, uh, carriage of goods, uh, into a very litigious uh, business, into a very litigious business, which is not that suitable for one bell, one row, and the mentality of uh, China, China, for example. Now, uh, I pinpoint some of the uh, 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 prominent features uh, of uh, pro-contract mentality in CISG. Firstly, uh, it allows uh, remedy uh, uh, to any breach of uh, contract 
to, to any breach of non-conforming uh, non -conforming goods, as well as document, non-conforming documents, uh, which uh, the concept is not really readily available under English law. If you see the last paragraph, there is no uh, strict equivalent under English law to compel seller to cure uh, uh, defective goods uh, and suspend performance. Uh, 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 in so doing, uh, you may have to suspend performance. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, there is no concept of uh, fundamental breach, uh, at least no more uh, 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 under English law. Uh, uh, and um, uh, and that uh, uh, no concept of uh, fundamental uh, uh, fundamental breach. And fundamental breach, uh, uh, whereas in CISG uh, is uh, is the basis where you can actually. Uh, Avoid a contract or terminate a contract uh, is uh, is rather strict. Uh, uh, if you look at one of the uh, the, the number five um, opinions, uh, uh, no fundamental breach where the non conformity can be remedied, and most defects can be remedied uh, either by the party without unreasonable inconvenience to the buyer. Uh, or delayed, um, inconsistent with, uh, so forth, so forth. Uh, and it also applied to document and so forth. Now, how this uh, needs a lot of refinement, of course. For example, documentary sell always uh, uh, tie in together with a letter of credit and so forth. So there are a lot of details to work out, but in essence, it's not that easy uh, to uh, terminate a contract or avoid a contract. That's why I mentioned pro contract. Another example is misrepresentation. Under English law, as you know, uh, innocent, negligent, or fraudulent misrepresentation, if it induces, uh, it only need a part of the inducement uh, that lead to a contract, uh, the contract can be avoided, uh, but not so uh, under CISG. Again, it has to be amounting to a fundamental breach. Uh, now, uh, all this, if you tie up, you can see under English law, there are a lot of rejection of goods because there is the statutory uh, implied condition that the good must fit uh, the description. And uh, uh, the slightest depart, at least in the, uh, before the amendment came in, uh, unless it's de minimis, uh, otherwise uh, the slightest departure from the, 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 the description of the goods uh, can, uh, can allow a termination, uh, which means uh, a, a reduction or, or a rejection of the goods at the discharge board. That is extremely wasteful. I have handled quite a number of cases of rejection of goods, and it often lead to disaster, uh, uh, whether it's uh, usually it's on the seller, uh, but it can be on the buyer as well. Uh, the, the goods can be totally lost, uh, for example, it is perishable and so forth, or have to ship elsewhere at a huge cost before it can be disposed. So this is huge economic wastage. And therefore, uh, I thought the CISG pro contract uh, mentality can help to avoid a lot of those things. Uh, and uh, especially one bell, one row, uh, not only it is uh, necessary to avoid those economic wastage, um, it is uh, a good way to ensure contractual bound and also goodwill between the parties. Now, uh, 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 um, uh, now I come to the last part of it, uh, uh, and that is the dispute resolution. The dispute resolution, I say that uh, uh, if you look at the last paragraph, uh, CISG uh, envisage a due regime whereby the domestic law would apply simultaneously with it um, uh, to deal with the residual matter, uh, which is outside the scope of the CISG. Well, of course, uh, you need that uh, in order to fill the gap. And therefore, you still need uh, uh, the, when it comes to dispute resolution, you still need uh, uh, a, a good system of domestic law. Uh, uh, to, uh, and therefore, uh, it goes with uh, a suitable arbitration seat with competent judge, arbitration judges and so forth, and a good domestic law. Uh, to, uh, it's uh, uh, and comprehensive domestic law remains essential. Now, for that reason, uh, uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong SAR, uh, stands for uh, uh, 
uh, special administra administrative region. Uh, both the court and arbitration has been, the, uh, been uh, the Asian center of dispute resolution. Uh, of course, uh, uh, another place in Asia is Singapore. Um, now we handle a lot of international cell or cell related transactions uh, and disputes and so forth. Um, uh, and uh, importantly also, uh, Hong Kong is a common law jurisdiction uh, and common law is still uh, of predominant importance in international trade uh, and, um, and, and shipping. Uh, now the uh, common law, how it can merge with CISG, we already have the benefit of, uh, of, uh, of experience uh, and works, uh, seems to work very well, such as in the US, Australia, Canada, and Singapore. They are all uh, contracting uh, states uh, to CISG. So uh, Hong Kong is not uh, actually uh, adopting something uh, uh, too adventurous. Uh, now, Hong Kong is not yet a party to CISG, but it's now seriously considering so. And there's a consultation paper coming up uh, that, uh, uh, which, uh, which I show you the web, uh, website, uh, the link. Uh, now, the, uh, it is important for Hong Kong uh, to quickly build up the jurisprudence of uh, CISG, uh, possibly relate to BRI, and to train the Hong Kong lawyers who are familiar with common law, but they have to get used to uh, the CIS concept and how it can be merged uh, in order to form a good system to serve uh, 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 BRI as well as international trade. Thank you very much for listening. Next, allow me to invite the fourth speaker, Excellency Palita Kohona, Sri Lankan Ambassador to China. Dr. Palita Kohona, a Sri Lanka diplomat, was the former permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations from 2009 to 2015. Until August 2009, he was the permanent secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sri Lanka and was also the former secretary general of the Secretary for co coordinating the peace process. He was, previously, he was previously the head of the UN treaties section in New York till 2006 the largest arm of UK Office of Legal Affairs. Now, distinguished ambassador, would you please begin your speech? Now. Distinguished panelists, distinguished audience. Well, let me first thank the organizers for inviting me to this event. And I'm very privileged because I had to, this today in particular, I had to be running from one event to another. So as soon as this event is, at least my speech is over, I may be required to go to some other place. There are many things happening in this town at the moment. Uh, this, World trade and cross-border investments growing in leaps and bounds in recent years. And if one were to discount the pandemic and economic and political tensions, it would only be natural that economic and trade links would expand even further. And it is to be expected that disputes of all types would arise. The Belt and Road Initiative, and we have heard much about this already, which would catalyze the expenditure of around four to eight trillion dollars, US dollars, across a wide region, may also contribute significantly to an increase in such disputation in the region that would need to be settled by reference to agreed mechanisms. Some disputes would, of course, have political undertones and may require settlement through diplomatic channels. Other disputes would relate to the terms and conditions of investments, 
state interference with foreign investments, non-compliance with agreed trading rules, payments, repatriation of profits and earnings, performance under trading contracts, labor contracts, etc. Some of these disputes could be among states while others would be among private parties. The disputes among private parties, mainly between corporations and also individuals, trading between themselves in different countries would be managed on the basis of the rules that they agree amongst themselves or globally agreed rules. But there are no such agreements, there would be difficulties which could later involve state and diplomatic interventions. Options for the settlement of disputes could be by resort to judicial tribunals, arbitration, negotiation, consultation, and mediation. A whole profession has blossomed around trade and economic dispute resolution. Occasionally, a dispute resolution mechanism is missing in the agreements or contracts, although rarely these days, and this causes difficulties among for the parties and windfalls for lawyers. Disputes among states may also be resolved on the basis of bilateral agreements or by reference to a commonly agreed mechanism. Disputes between states may be resolved through a previously agreed mechanism such as arbitration. In this short presentation, I will focus on one area which still needs to be developed further on the resolution of trade disputes. While the Convention on the Sale of Goods will come into play, I propose to focus on the World Trade Organization, which was established with the objective of smoothening and facilitating the international trading system and is at the forefront of efforts to ensure the liberalization of global trade and the reduction of trade, trade barriers and would operate on a rule-based multilateral system. Of course, as you would have heard already from the presentations made, there are common problems and similarities between what I'm going to talk about and what the CISG has given rise to. So therefore, I think there are lessons to be learned and also pitfalls to be avoided in both. As to whether the WTO the World Trade Organization has succeeded in realizing these ambitious goals is yet another question. As part of the Bretton Woods system, as originally envisaged, the WTO was also cooperates with other multilateral financial and economic institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. This is to ensure that global economic policies are cohesive, the IMF and the World Bank are dominated by Western developed countries. They are structured to represent essentially their economic and trading interests. And a major concern of the developing world has been whether the global trading system as overseen by the GATT and now by the WTO is fair and cohesive or whether it serves mainly the interests of the rich and powerful. Certainly, it is not always easy for the developing countries to bring their disputes before the WTO due to lack of understanding of its labyrinthine maze of rules and practices, paucity of trade dispute resolution legal skills, inadequacy of financial resources, and eventually inability to adopt any meaningful retaliatory measures. And here you see that some of the points raised by the speak previous speakers are also reflected in this organization. The WTO, which succeeded the GATT following the completion of the Uruguay round of trade negotiations, provides an agreed mechanism for the resolution of intergovernmental trade disputes among its member states. The WTO entered into force on January 1, 1995. The liberalization of world trade, it was expected, would lead to a more prosperous, peaceful, and economically accountable world order. 
Decisions of the WTO are typically taken by consensus among all member states, and they are ratified by the members. Trade frictions are expected to be channeled into the WTO dispute settlement process, where the focus is on interpreting agreements and commitments and ensuring that members trade policies confirm with each other. That way, the risk of disputes spilling over into the political or military uh, or the military con are reduced. In recent years, we have witnessed much disagreements being escalated to unilateral actions, disruptive of the peaceful world order envisaged by the negotiators of the WTO by lowering trade barriers through negotiations among member governments, the WTO system also breaks down other barriers between peoples and trading countries. WTO, as WTO agreements are reached by consensus, every member state has a veto. At the time the GATT was replaced by the WTO in 1995, 125 nations were signatories to the GATT agreements. The general agreement uh, on tariffs and trade was signed in Geneva in October 13, 1947, and continued on a provisional basis until replaced by the WTO in 1995. The dispute settlement mechanism, which was negotiated for many years, and was one of the last items to be settled at the Uruguay round of negotiations, provide, provides a somewhat predictable mechanism for the settlement of international trade disputes. It is, it is a complaint of the developing world that this mechanism essentially reflects the requirements of developed countries. The negotiators sought to establish a clear and transparent mechanism to settle international disputes of the type covered by the GATT agreement. The Americans in particular were very keen on a mechanism that resembled a judicial mechanism of the type which, with which they were familiar. However, the world consists of more than one approach to international dispute resolution. Even some Western countries were not comfortable with such a cut and dry legalistic approach. In the East, where dispute resolution is more a matter for the parties themselves, where reasonable compromises are preferred, the adversarial approach of the US negotiators was discomforting. What resulted in the end of the negotiations was a compromise with, with which not many were totally happy, but all were not totally unhappy either. Any member of the WTO, it has 164 members at present, compared with the 140 plus of the BRI, covering 98% of world trade, can file a complaint with the WTO against another member they believe is in breach of the commitments which are dumping, unfairly subsidizing, or violating any other trade agreement. Should the WTO dispute settlement mechanism decide that the case is valid, the complaining country is provided the authority to impose retaliatory sanctions on the offending country. The operation of the WTO dispute settlement process involves a wide, wide range of actors including panels appointed by the dispute settlement body, the appellate body, the director general and the WTO secretary, secretariat, arbitrators and advisory experts. Once the complaint is initiated, the staff will then investigate to see if a violation of any multilateral agreement has taken place. The WTO staff first try to settle disputes through consultations. Since 1995, members have filed more than 590 disputes. Only about a third needed to be reviewed by a panel before being resolved. Most of them were settled out of court to use 
an expression or are still in the consultation process. As a result, only 350 formal rulings needed to be issued. Some would argue that the confidence in the system is borne out by the number of cases brought to the WTO. More than 500 cases since the WTO was established, compared with the 300 disputes dealt with during the entire life of the GATT. The priority is to settle disputes, preferably through a mutually agreed solution, and provision has been made for the process to be conducted in an efficient, timely manner, so that if a case is adjudicated, it should normally take no more than one year for a, for a panel ruling and no more than 16 months if the case is appealed. If the complainant deems the case urgent, consideration of the case should take even less time. WTO member nations are obliged to accept the process as exclusive and compulsory. This was a major improvement on the GATT where a dispute could be held up for a long time due to the absence of agreement. According to a 2018 study in the Journal of Politics, states are less likely and slower to enforce WTO violations when the violations affect states in a different diffuse manner. The United States of America, a member of the World Trade Organization since January 1, 1995, has been has also a member of the GATT since 1948, having been a key force in the negotiation of the dispute settlement mechanism. And not surprisingly, it has been either a complainant or defendant in about half the WTO cases. The trade dispute resolution lawyers have prospered. As of September 29, 2019, the United States had brought 124 cases against 124 cases against other countries and has had 155 cases brought against it. Since 1995, uh, as I said before, 595 cases have been brought to the WTO and over 350 ruling, rulings have been issued. As for the WTO dispute settlement system, the United States has been a big beneficiary, winning about 90% of the completed cases it has filed and all 20 completed cases brought against China. When other countries bring a complaint against the United States, an adverse ruling will not necessarily require compliance, but the US could decide on how it would comply. However, the US lurched towards unilateralism in 2018. On March 2018, President Trump announced a range of tariffs on steel imports and 10% tariffs on aluminum. What resulted uh, as a consequence was a trade war. And uh, we know that in the modern world, a trade war, war will not benefit anyone in particular. It will only be a hindrance to the growth of trade between countries and the expansion of a liberalized trading system in the world. I, I hope as a person, as an individual, as a diplomat, that how we deal with trade problems is not through unilateral actions, unilateral sanctions, or the unilateral measures, but through consultation and negotiation. And of course, the World Trade Organization is there as a recourse to anyone who feels offended by the actions of another country. Ladies and gentlemen, let me stop there. Uh, I also believe that I have run out of my allocated time. Uh, thank you very much.
The final speaker of this topic is Mr. Liu Tong, Associate Professor of School of Law, University of International Business and Economics, and a senior arbitrator. In UIBE, he teaches international economic law and international sale of goods law. His research focus is law on commercial contracts, investments, and anti-monopoly. He has published many legal books and papers at home and abroad. Please. Thanks a lot, Madam Zhou. <laughs> uh, what I want to share here today is the interaction between CSC and the Chinese law, which is also a demonstration of the future coordination between the Belt and the Road countries. First, of course, the influence of CSC on Chinese law and practice. Three aspects we can see here. Ideas brought into legislation the application of new concepts in practice and the diversified arbitration proceedings. First, I just try to summarize a couple of ideas that the CSC has bring into Chinese legal system. First, respect for the women of the parties. The so respect for the women of the parties is one of the most important character in the modernization of commercial contract law. The, uh, since the year 1970s, the modern contract law has begun to get away from the traditional formalism, and in most of the time try to find out the real intention between the parties. This is along with a rapidly changing market situation. So when we look at this chart, we will see this perception has been reflected in many aspects of the convention. For example, to interpret the intention of a party or to clarify the ambiguousness in the contract term, it has widened the, the traditional parole evidence rule, and in most of the time, introduce explicit evidence, try to find out the real intention between the parties behind the paper. So we must admit, the extensive reference to the CSC has greatly promoted the modernization of Chinese contract law, and even the entire civil and commercial law system. Second, the application of CSC has proved that the rules from different legal systems can work well together. In fact, the CSE itself is the integration of the principles from different countries. For the more controversial issues which cannot reach a consensus, using a soft clause to achieve coexistence and the compromise. For example, the principle of good faith and a specific performance. This has also inspired Chinese law lot, which basically based on a civil law tradition, also have absorbed some rules from the common law system, such as a strict liability and anticipatory breach. And third, to balance the interests of the whole society, another idea of the convention is to reduce the cost of the whole society, not simply blame on the breaching one or protect the injured party. This efficiency-oriented way of thinking reminds us that the origin of the commercial law is in fact the merchant law, which is a summary of the rules that are best for the business transactions. And the fourth, country rules and a clear guide. For law like sale of goods, a more concrete rule should be adopted to provide with a, a clear guidance to the businessman. So one thing we need to consider that in 90% of the time, the function of a commercial law is not just to provide the rules for the dispute resolution, but also for the guidance to the practitioner. The businessman lack of a legal knowledge, a more concrete rule is much better than the complicated and abstract legal theories. And sometimes it will provide the legal basis for certain conduct for example, the diploma faced by a servant party who has terminated the contract and holds the goods. For the one hand, the retention or dispose of goods would constitute an, in, an act inconsistent with ownership, leading to a technical acceptance. On the other hand, there is a clear duty to mitigate as required by Article 77. 
So for the second part is the introduction of unfamiliar concept in practice. Uh, besides the legislation, principles and the concepts that are not stipulated in Chinese law has been broadly used in the trial practice where it says the apply. For example, the waiver, the modification of a contract by estoppel, the implied warranties, the right of breaching parties to cure, and a compensation for a loss of volume seller. And I believe in the future, the more outstanding issues will provide further suggestions for the improvement of Chinese contract law. For example, the choice between the last short rule or the kick-out rule for the right of form and the requirements for the compensation for loss of volume seller, and uh, whether the loss of goodwill falls within the scope of Article 74. Third, uh, the, for the arbitration practice, in fact, we can see here a lot of new elements has been introduced into the arbitration proceedings. This is a great exploration for the Chinese arbitration practice. Now we need to move to the China's contribution to the convention. First, of course, the feedback from the practical experience. In the past few years, China has a rich experience in, apply, uh, in, in the application of CETI in specific situations. This will help us to evaluate the effect of the convention's existing rule and to find out the direction for the further movement. For example, by year 2009, nearly 400 CETI cases can be found on case university's website. And a lot of casebook has been published. In preparation for this report, CETI has opened to us more than 100 cases in the past 20 years, which is really a treasure for the scholars who engage in the study of CSC. All this has provided valuable materials for the academic research and for the discussions between scholars from different countries. And this feedback will definitely be great helpful in the future for the development of CSC. And the second supplement of the convention from the Chinese law, the application of domestic law is inevitable because some matters are not covered by the CSC. For example, the interest, the liquidity damages and the specific performance here we are see the principle of good faith. This is a very important role in the Chinese civil law, and it is, it is a soft clause in the convention. In fact, the principle of good faith plays a very important role in the trial practice in China. As an arbitrator, sometimes we will realize that besides the clear rules in the law, there are some specific implicit standards applied in specific situations. For example, the same kind of conduct in different circumstances, different conclusions could be drawn. At this time, one question we will always ask to ourselves is where we should draw the line. At this time, the principle of good faith will always give us an answer, which will fill in the gaps in the law and agreement. And the third application in the field of e-commerce. In fact, China has a rich experience in the experience of the e-commerce because we are one of the most countries that are active in this field. And in arbitration proceeding, sometimes we are found out majority of evidence are provided in electronic form. The contacts reached through email, the communications on WeChat, and a lot of uh, transaction documents are provided economically. And in this context, China has accumulated extensive experience in handling of electronic evidence, both in legis legislation and in practice. By summarizing this experience, it will provide great help for suggestions for the future application of convention in the field of e-commerce. So let's try to, in summary, based on the China's experience in application of CSC, we have reason to believe that the conflict and the cooperation between the different legal systems can also have a positive interaction. This will certainly provide good support for the transactions among the Belt and the Road countries. But when we look at the map, we have found a couple of Belt Road countries has not conceded to the convention yet. 
those three possible solutions provided by CSE. First, for the parties, both from the member state, a direct application is the best and easiest way to solve the difference in the legal system and agriculture. And for the parties not from the contracting state, in fact, in, China, in Chinese law, there is no obstacle for the party to select the the as application law in their contract, because the law said parties may expressly choose the law applicable to foreign related civil relations in accordance with the law. And last, even sometimes we will think maybe we will draw a new, we will try to draft, draft a new uniform international law. The, the experience and ideas that it says it has brought into Chinese law is very is still very useful in this kind of situation. Just like the drafter of the principle of European uh, contract law has been mentioned. The convention have made active pre preparations for the drafting of international contract law in the world and played a guiding role on principle of international uh, commercial contract and the principles of European contract law. Oh, that's all for me. Thank you for your time. We have come to the end of the second part. On behalf of all the audience, I would like to thank all the five speakers for their excellent speeches. And I would like to also thank you for sharing with us your respective points of view. CISG is a unified and widely applicable law on international sales of goods. It may have its various shortcomings, but its advantages are also obvious. Mr. Alberti, the first speaker of this part, has very well summarized them as the CISG's certainty, transparency, predictability, stability, accessibility, and consistency. BRI countries vary in economic, social, cultural, and legal systems. In face of such complexity and uncertainty, the application of international uniform laws and regulations like CISG should be the best way for parties from different countries to resolve international trade disputes. I agree to Mr. Philip Young's view and would like to close this part by quoting it. As he said, BRI trade is more suitable to apply the CISG. Thank you very much. Pan 唐老自上世纪五十年代茂重伟创立之初唐老以矢志不渝执着追求对于仲裁后辈
，堪称中国仲裁事业的拓荒牛，中国仲裁的对外宣传大使，是当之无愧的一代仲裁大家。Over sixty years, CTEC has not only brought up many outstanding Chinese international arbitrators, but also made great contribution to the making and perfecting of the Chinese arbitration legislation and to the development of arbitration in China and the world as well. 作为国际仲裁领域最重要的一项。国际公约、纽约公约不仅仅为仲裁裁决在全世界范围内的执行提供了良好的保障，也为国际仲裁事业的发展提供了强大的动力。这个还得益于您啊。听说就是您，这是您在国际上主要推动了这个。说错了，哈哈哈哈哈！怎么说错了呢？不是我、嗯，那是我们中国的这个特有的优良的传统。他们对您的评价都很高。那不是，他是面对中国，我说什么？这这这是什么时候谈？嗯 ，You know。In a Chinese typical Chinese uniform, yeah. Not only of Mister Tang, of China. 这么大年纪都是这个两个腿的，不支持我。我们都支持你。你们支持我呀？对。啊，太棒了！我们今天唐老师。谢谢你们的支持。谢谢你，谢谢你Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our session. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry for the delay on、um, past over, but uh, but uh, we we will be、uh, punctuate. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, it's a great honor for us to gather here, celebrating the 40th year of adoption of CSG. And uh, uh, today our session will talk about the、uh, CSG in the digital times. Or CISG and digital economy. So, as we all know, CISG has been playing a very important role in international trade. Up to now, there are 94 contracting parties under CISG, and most of the contract、uh, the, the the countries along the Belt and Road side、uh, are also CISG contracting parties. So, uniform. Application of laws relating to international sales of contracts has been realized to some extent, to a great extent.、Uh, electronic information in contractual transactions, including across borders, has become prevalent for a number of reasons.
including speed of transmission, ability to access data remotely and anytime, and the possibility of reusing data. It has also raised several legal issues with respect to the legal status of the electronic information. For instance, the formation of the contract when CSG is concerned. Ancitra has prepared tests that address the contractual matters related to the use of electronic information, which our speakers will present you later. And in light of the developments of trade by electronic means, how would the CSG be applied and complemented in digital times? It's very much a worthwhile discussion. Today, we are so honored to have five top level speakers from China and foreign countries. Either you an official or private entrepreneur uh, or a private practitioner, professor or, or, or lawyers. So to share with you their thoughts and ideas. Our first speaker is Mr. Jeffrey Chang. Jeffrey Chang read law at the University of Singapore and Howard Law School. He presently practices law as the senior director of TSMP Law Corporation of Singapore, focusing on commercial litigation and criminal matters. He's also a fellow of the Chartered Institutes of Arbitration and Singapore Institute of Arbitrators, as well as a principal mediator of the Singapore Mediation Center. In the year 2000, he was the chairman of Ancitra and subsequently chaired the Ancitra Working Group on Electronic Commerce, the Working Group 4, from 2002 to 2005, and Ancitra Working Group on Online Dispute Resolution, Working Group 3, between 2014 and 2016. Mr. Chan speaks frequently at seminars and conferences all over the world on a wide range of legal subjects. And today, his topic is updating the CSG for the digital age. So let's welcome Mr. Chang. Mr. Chang, please. My apologies, my apologies. I was muted earlier. Right, um, I'd, I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Wang, as well as Ancitral and CTEC for inviting me to speak at this important conference, celebrating the 40th anniversary of the CSG. This is also an occasion for me to uh, connect back with many friends whom I've worked with during my time, during the many, many years that I spent working on Ancitral matters. Now today, <clears throat> I would like to uh, speak on updating the CIG for the digital age. And, and may I just at this time share my screen. So the title of my topic is <clears throat> updating the CIG for the digital age. By way of introduction, uh, let us recall that the CIG, the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods was formulated by ANSITRAL. And as mentioned many times in the sessions this morning in this conference, its main objective <clears throat> was and is to minimize legal barriers to international trade and regulate the duties and obligations of parties to a commercial transaction that crosses national barriers. Now, the CSG provides uniform rules for matters which are important in sales transaction, such as formation of contract, deliveries, remedies for breach, and other matters such as termination. The CIG actually had a very long paternity. Work on the CIG started in 1968 and it was completed only in 1988. It took 10 years 
for the CSG to, to be completed. Now, what does that mean? Now, if you recall, this was the period prior to what we now know as the digital age. So the CSG was formulated before the digital age came into being. And it was based on the commercial practices and the legal rules of that time. It seeked to basically uh, codify the commercial practices and the legal rules of uh, different jurisdictions on a harmonized basis as they stood at that time before the digital age. Oh dear, I think I must have skipped a bit. Uh, let me just go back to my slides. Now, what about Ancitral and the electronic environment? Ancitral was actually one of the pioneers in working on legal rules for the electronic or digital environment. Ancitral's work started very early in the 1980s, where it formulated the legislative guide on computer records. I think that was co completed in 1985. Subsequently, Ancitra formulated the Model Law on Electronic Commerce, the MLEC, as well as the Model Law on Electronic Signatures, the MLES. Now, what all these rules formulated by Ancitra sought to achieve was to ensure functional equivalence, in other words, the same legal effect between the electronic and the physical environment where trade matters are concerned. By 1980s, the late 1980s, the digital age has advanced. And this was after the CSG was completed. And it became clear that many of the rules in the uh, MLEC, the Model Law on Electronic Commerce, and the MLES, the Model Law on Electronic Signatures, were no longer applicable given the advancing technology of the times. So this was realized. And it was at that time realized that the situation cannot continue because the world cannot be using rules which are formulated at a different time where the technology no longer support the application of those rules. So in 1999, the Center for the Facilitation of Procedures and Practices for Administration, Commerce and Transport, also known as CFAC, of the United Nations Com Economic Commission for Europe, or the ECE, recommended to UNCITRAL that UNCITRAL to ensure the references to writing, signature, and documents in conventions, agreements relating to international trade allowed for electronic commerce. There's a moment I seem to have some difficulty here. I'm having some difficulty in my slides and I apologize for this. So at the 33rd session of UNCITRAL, I'm having some difficulty in my slides. I apologize for this. At the 33rd session of UNCITRAL, which was the year 2000, and I was fortunate and privileged to be the chair of UNCITRAL at the time, the UNCITRAL commission session considered proposals for work on electronic contracting specifically from the perspective of the CIG. Why the CIG? This was because it was suggested that the CIG provided a complete compendium of the rules for international contracting for the sales of goods. And therefore, when you update the CIG, you're in fact updating the entire law on international sales to the digital age. Now, the Secretariat was entrusted by the Commission to study the legal barriers, in particular to electronic commerce in trade-related international instruments, and this, of course, include the CIG. And in 2001, the Ancitral Working Group on Electronic Commerce commenced work on a convention to remove obstacles to electronic commerce. This was a year when they started examining what are the possible ways whereby all these trade-related international instruments can be updated to the legal age. And the next year, which was 2002, work commenced on 
the United Nations Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in International Contracts, or the UNECC, I shall refer to it as ECC for short. The ECC was completed uh, in 2005, rather fast, and adopted by the UN General Assembly. What did it do? What the ECC did was to facilitate the use of electronic communications in international trade, and also it updated trade-related international instruments for the electronic environment. The original idea was to update all trade-related international instruments uh, to bring them up to date to the digital age. But this was obviously too big a task. So the ECC then confined updating ANSI trial trade-related international instruments for the electronic environment. Now, the work on the ECC, which was uh, mentioned earlier by the Secretary of Ancestral this morning, was premised on the principles which Ancestral had developed for electronic commerce, namely non-discrimination, technological neutrality. In other words, whatever the te technology that's used, the same rules can apply. Functional equivalent, which I've mentioned earlier, and importantly, irrelevance of place of origin, because it's not possible to determine who the other party or where the other party is. If you're contracting the other party, place of origin should therefore not be a factor to the applicability of those rules. And the uh, ECC was inspired very largely by the provisions in the CIG, particularly on scope of application, party autonomy, and its general principles. What the ECC, the Electronic Contracting Convention, provides for is the equal treatment of electronic and paper-based communications. Now, my friend, Luca Castellini, who will speak after me, will be giving more details of how the ECC updates the CIG and electronic commerce generally to the digital age. I would like to focus on just two issues, or maybe three issues, uh, which I think uh, needs highlighting. Firstly, like in every convention, it's important to determine the scope of application of that treaty. As we call, the CRG applies only if both parties are located in contracting states. However, under the ECC, parties need not be in contracting states to the convention so long as the law of a contracting state applies to their transaction. Secondly, under the ECC, electronic communications has the same effect as communications set out in the CIG. And here we call that the CIG does have reference to telegrams, telex, etc. I think there's a problem here. Um, I think there's a problem with slides. I'm sorry about this. Huh? So what the uh, ECC does is to ensure that all these references to means of communication in the CIG, which has reference to the physical world, paper communications, telex, telegrams, has the same effect if they are done using electronic means. Now, one important aspect of the ECC, which I'd like to highlight, is Article 10. These are the default rules on dispatch and receipt. And it is particularly important in the context of offer and acceptance and revocation of offer and acceptance. Now, note that in Articles 15 to 18 and Articles 22 of the CSG, the CIG mentions that all these are affected when the communication reaches the other party. What is meant by reach? That is left very largely to the domestic law of the state concerned. For the electronic environment, there needs to be some uniformity. So what the ECC does is to define what amounts to a dispatch of a communication, of an email in other words, and what amounts to a receipt. And it defines it by saying that 
an electronic communication is dispatched when it leaves the information system under the control of the originator. To come to this formulation of words took considerable effort because different people have different understandings. But basically, it must be communication that's left the control of the originator of the information. Now, what if both parties share the same information system? For example, a portal which is shared by many people. Uh, I, for one, for example, I use Yahoo Mail. Many people use Yahoo Mail. Well, there are provisions in the ECC to provide for this. They're somewhat complex, but I'd like to show you that they do work. Receipt, when is a communication received? That generated a lot of debate. And uh, the final product, the outcome of the discussions was that it was agreed that an electronic communication and in email is received when it becomes capable of being retrieved by the addressee at the electronic address designated by the addressee. Now, in other words, if I give you my email address and you send an email to my address, I am deemed to receive it, provided I can access that email, even though I may not actually access it. So long, in other words, so long as it's, I have the ability to access it. So this will not apply, for example, when the system breaks down. And that's a matter of evidence. Huh? But if all goes well, you send me an email, even if I've not read it, I'm deemed to have received it. If I've given you that email address, there are rules in the ECC for situations where no email address has been designated. And this takes some explaining and we don't have the time to go into these explanations. Huh? I think the electronic environment and all of you in China will certainly know this. What, uh, what are probably the most important transactions for most of us are website sales, Alibaba, Tencent. I use Alibaba and Tencent all the time. Um, well, these website sales were non-existent at the time when uh, the CSG was formulated. They are automated transactions, mostly, in fact, almost entirely without human intervention. So what actually are they? How do we uh, make them functionally equivalent to uh, a physical environment? Well, the nearest analogy was said during the discussions was that it's like a display in a shop window where you put goods out for dif display and the offer is basically made to the world at large. Anybody can buy. Now, as you know, in most countries, but not all, an offer made to the world at large where price is, uh, is displayed is a valid offer but most other countries also say it. it's not an offer, but an invitation to treat. And the offer is made when you decide to buy, right? Now, Article 14.2 of the CISG adopts the letter proposition and makes it very clear that when you, uh, when you make an offer to the world at large, such as advertising goods for sale in a website, there are invitations to make offers or invitations to treat, they are not offers themselves. So the fact that they are accepted doesn't result in a binding contract. It's just an offer made by the intended buyer, which the seller can accept or reject. And Article 11 of the ECC uh, clarifies that this applies in the electronic environment. So Article 14.2 is given effect in the electronic environment by Article 11 of the ECC. Article 12 is an important rule for contracting through automated message systems, where it says that a contract formed by the interaction of automated systems and a natural person, or by interaction of automate, automated message systems, in other words, no systems involved, shall not be denied validity or enforceability on the sole ground that no natural person was involved in that transaction. This is the provision that makes it clear that sales which are made or but purchases made through Alibaba and Tencent are all valid. Otherwise, questions can arise. Now, those are the points I'd like to raise to ECC, but I'll leave my friend Luca to 
elaborate on the others. There's some final points which I'd like to make. As mentioned before, many of the contractual rules we use today, including the CSG, were formulated well before the digital age. And even when, the, when ANSITRA formulated instruments such as the MLEC and the MLES, the Model Law on Electric Commerce, and the Model Law on Electronic Signatures, they also formulated in the early days of the digital age. That was the time when the internet was not widespread and e-commerce was very limited. Thus, many of the provisions of these instruments are actually in today's age obsolete. The 205 ECC updates electronic communications law to enable e-commerce to take place in the digital environment. Now, this means that for any state to fully participate in the digital economy, they must update their laws to provide for e-commerce today. And this can be done either by acceding to the Electronic Contracting Convention or enacting laws on electronic transactions which reflect the provisions of the UN Electronic Contracting Convention. Now, having said that, I think all of us know that the digital environment will only continue to evolve. There are things coming our way which we have no idea how they will look like. Thus, we can be very certain that even if we update our laws today, in the not too distant future, we will need to update our laws even further as technology evolves and e-commerce e becomes actually the preferred commercial transaction of our times. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan portrayed us the picture of the development of CSG and also the uh, uh, updating rules relating to digital economy, uh, ECC in particular. So our next speaker is Mr. Luca Castellani. Luca Castellani is a legal officer in the Secretariat of Ancetra. He joined the Office of Legal Affairs of the Secretariat of the United Nations in 2001 and Ansara Secretariat in 2004, where he works in the areas of international sales and of electronic commerce. As Secretary of Ansara Working Group 4, he oversaw the preparation of the Ansara Model on Electronic Transferable Records. He is also active in the field of paperless trade facilitation and has contributed to the drafting the framework, framework agreement on facilitation of cross-border paperless trade in Asia and the Pacific. From March 2012 to November 2013, Luca was assigned as first head of the Ancetra Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific, located in Incheon, Republic of Korea. And his topic today is the Uniform Law of Electronic Contracting and the CISG. Welcome, Luca. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for your kind introduction. And I would like to say good afternoon to all of you. Good morning to those who are in Europe, of course, and good evening. I take it we have also many friends from the Americas. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I would like in particular to, to thank uh, CTAC uh, for, for the excellent organization of this event. I also feel the challenge because I'm speaking after uh, Mr. Chan, who who has uh, literally written the history of the law of electronic transactions with our past uh, chairperson at ANSIDRA and in many capacity, including as, for, as chair of the working group four. I will do my very best to complement what he said uh, with, uh, with uh, a few additional notions, mindful also uh, of time. So the starting point uh, and, and the main uh, takeaway of my um, short presentation is that when we look at the CSG, we have to look at two uh, compatible and actually complementary legal bodies. Uh, one is uh, 
the uniform law of sales and the other one is the uniform law of electronic transactions now everyone is aware of the uniform law of sales of course but uh, specialists of sales law are less aware of the fact that there is a uniform law of electronic transactions um, the starting point has already be, been described which is to say the contract has a form we know at least the four types of form of contract uh, and all of them are recognized in the CSG. Um, and I have to say in that respect, uh, a, a few years ago, China has withdrawn the written form uh, uh, declaration. And so now also in China, uh, freedom of form applies when it comes to the CSG. And that of course uh, uh, is aligned with, with now the civil code and before the contract law. Mm. Our experience uh, is that uh, the general contract law applies both online and offline and that very few rules uh, are needed but but they are needed indeed uh, to um, allow to enable the use of uh, electronic means uh, in trade including international sales As it has already been said, uh, these are the four legislative texts that Ancetral has adopted so far. Um, it's important to bear in mind that altogether they have been adopted in more than 100 states. This is really meaningful. And when it comes to Asia in particular, uh, they have been adopted in East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Pacific. Uh, all of these countries actually uh, have adopted one or more of the Ancetral tax on, we call them on electronic commerce, but probably these days we would use the terminology digital trade. The model on electronic commerce from 1996 is the foundational one. Uh, it's important to go back to it, uh, including because uh, uh, some provisions uh, are in force uh, also in China and because it has been adopted in almost 80 states, uh, many of them on the Belt and Road. The model on electronic signatures, again, this has also been adopted in the electronic signatures law in China. Uh, it's quite important. It was meant to be a, as an add-on to the previous one. And it, it gives a detail on rights and obligations of all the parties participating in the electronic signature process. In a way, this law is now being reconsidered because working group four, uh, of which I am the secretary, is currently working on a legislative text on identity management and trust services. Electronic signatures are considered one type of trust service together with the time stamping, for instance, together with electronic registered delivery. And so uh, there is a um, reconsideration now of the matter that has already been dealt with in this model law in, in that context. Uh, very important, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications and International Contracts, it does fulfill a number of uh, uh, functions. Uh, it does update uh, certain rules uh, in the uh, model on electronic commerce, uh, so much so that one provision of this convention has been enacted uh, in the e-commerce law of China of a couple of years ago. Um, but the, the magic of this convention is the fact that it plugs in at the treaty level and it fully clarifies and enables the use of electronic communications in relation to a number of treaties. One of them is the CSG, another one very important is the Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards on 1958, the New York Convention. Um, and I'm stressing this because China signed uh, this convention in 2007, but has yet to ratify it. And of course, uh, ratification would be meaningful if there is uh, awareness of its importance and understanding of how this can actually help day-to-day -day business. So I'm really happy to take advantage of this opportunity to, to remind of, of, of this pending matter and also to invite uh, people to look into this convention to see how it is being applied. Uh, it has already 15 uh, member states and more are coming in the next months. Uh, but of course, we would like to see also large economies. And of course, if China would adopt it, that would give a strong signal across the Belt and Road. The newborn, uh, uh, it's already four uh, actually, 
the model on electronic transfer records, which is uh, making, uh, um, it's, it's really attracting a lot of attention. Um, it has been uh, actually endorsed uh, uh, by a number of organizations. Uh, uh, this model law allows the, the use uh, of uh, um, negotiable documents and instruments in electronic form. Uh, these are bills of lading, uh, promissory notes, warehouse receipts. Um, it has been adopted actually uh, in Singapore, in Bahrain, in a few other countries, uh, but we foresee much more uptake on this in the coming days. Um, it's quite modern. It does allow uh, to enable uh, full data flows along uh, supply chains, both for logistics and for trade financing. And it also takes into account uh, the use of emerging technologies, for instance, the explanatory note. This law, of course, is technology neutral, but the explanatory note uh, gives guidance on how uh, to uh, apply this uh, uh, with the DLT blockchain. Uh, it also takes into account the fact that uh, uh, the management of the supply chain relies on data generated by objects, so-called oracles. So coming to the um, core of the presentation, I'm mindful that I'm halfway, um, how can we put together sales law and uniform uh, e-contracting or e-transactions law? Well, at the treaty level, as I mentioned before, for those countries who have adopted the Electronic Communications Convention or was Contrast with it, make reference to either a, the law of a country that has adopted it or incorporated, then we, we have uh, already some sort of uh, interaction there. But especially when this is already adopted at the treaty level, we have the interaction at the treaty level, which is the, the, the most predictable and, and, this, and the most uh, um, authoritative way of establishing this connection. Then, of course, as I said before, it is possible to make a choice of law. And then when we choose the law of, of uh, uh, a country that has enacted either the convention, but also the, the model law or other texts. And then finally, ancestral text may apply when the rules of private international law point at a jurisdiction that has enacted them. However, here we have to say, um, this is the, the, the possibly the, the less desirable scenario because uh, we may have issues uh, in applying especially the less modern rules of private international law in the online environment. So we'd rather go with the choice of law, but ideally we would have already at the treaty level the electronic communications convention. Um, in particular, the CSG and the convention uh, they interact on these three levels. Uh, E-transactions law has some basic principles like functional equivalence, technology neutrality, non-discrimination. These principles are in the, in the electronic communication convention and they are transposed to the CSG. Uh, then there is article nine of the electronic communications convention that gives guidance on functional equivalence uh, requirements for writing signature original and retention. And again, because of the way the two treaties interact, uh, the convention brings this notion into the uh, CSG. And then we have substantive rules in the convention. And I have to say that the convention is also used as a model law and more than 20 states have actually incorporated the, the provisions of the convention in their internal legislation, but have yet to adopt the, the, the convention as a treaty. And then these rules are very important on the formation of contracts, but also on contract management. In that respect, uh, I would like to say when we say the electronic form, of course, we do understand uh, what we, we mean, but we also have to look at things from another perspective. Not all electronic form is the same. What you have in this uh, slide is an example of the level different level of digitization or automation of contracts. So at level one is actually level zero, which is to say it's on paper. When it, we can scan, of course, the document, but the information is static. Or we can, uh, we can have a document, for instance, written with a word processor. That, that's level three. It's an electronic format, it's machine readable. Uh, we can share that document and, and put it on, on a cloud and then we have a collaborative uh, environment. 
but when but then, it's level five and level six, we are really interested in because uh, at level five we start inserting in the electronic contract persistent scripts Persist persistent scripts are what are usually referred to as smart contracts and then of course at level six we have the full automation that is to say the contract is concluded is performed the performance is monitored and in case of trouble the uh, dispute resolution and the enforcement is fully automated uh, this is possible in some scenarios of course it's not possible in all scenarios it's also difficult to, to code the certain clauses like force majeure or to take into account certain issues like uh, rises of consent. Uh, if we discuss uh, smart contracts and automated contracts when uh, where we we have um, to refer so far to deterministic algorithms where the output is predetermined that is to say when I input uh, always the same data I always get the same out output. Uh, Article 12 of the Electronic Communications Convention uh, clarifies uh, one important point, that is to say that uh, uh, the fact that uh, there is automated uh, contract formation is not a reason to invalidate uh, the contract itself. Um, and of course, uh, here there is a lot of importance, I don't have the time to get into the details, but a lot of importance of which data we are using and how we control the sources of that data. And this data is generated mostly by physical and digital objects. It's not generated by physical persons. So when we look at automation and the CSG, I said already, when it comes to the formation phase, uh, we accept normally that the contract may be totally automated in its formation. Uh, there are some specific issues that hopefully we can discuss another time. Um, for instance, uh, it's difficult when using instantaneous communications to withdraw offer and acceptance. Uh, for instance, uh, it's possible to link files, but we have to make sure that the files are accessible, which is, uh, um, can be a problem when the files are large. Uh, and there is an issue, as I said before, with the vices of consent and capacity. But the real, the real interesting uh, part, in my opinion, is the part uh, that comes to performance. Because uh, when it comes to performance, uh, we have the possibility to monitor the supply chain constantly, thanks to this data input from oracles. And we can also incorporate, thanks, thanks to the MLETR, uh, a lot of information on, on the production, the origin, traceability, conditions of transport. We can put all of that uh, in a bill of lading. We can put all of that in any other commercial document. And we have real time tracking of, of, of the supply chain. All of this is already happening, of course. But we, we just have to, to, to close the gap in between the CSG and monitoring performance and, and uh, requesting correct performance according to the contract. And all of that technology gives us. And then, of course, uh, there are opportunities also at the dispute resolution and enforcement stage. In some cases, it's possible to automate the payment of penalty clause and liquidated damages if the asset is in digital form. And here I'm thinking not only uh, what now is fashionable, like uh, so-called the crypto assets, which are not particularly settled as an area of the law, but especially intellectual property. Uh, it has to be, there is a question mark with respect to fully automated dispute resolution. And this is an evolving field where also Ancestral is conducting work. To sum up, and apologies, um, as I said before, it, it's really important to bear in mind that the uniform transactions law already exists. Um, and it, it's important to, to put it together with the CSG. My personal uh, opinion is that uh, this will be particularly relevant for monitoring compliance and preventing dispute. So if we want to build a Belt and Road and we want to build a digital Belt and Road, we have now to start working on the elements of it, the concrete elements, which is to say, to be able to have a constant data flow that gives us the possibility to uh, verify all the time the compliance with contractual conditions. And of course, to do that, we have to start being aware of it. And we start here today by talking to, to academics and to councils. I thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. And again, apologies if it took a, a little bit more than expected. The third speaker is Dr. Yang Yuntou. He is a National First Class Corporate Council and a recipient of the Special Allowance by the State Council in 2012. 
He is now the Deputy General Manager and General Counsel of China Merchants Energy Co Limited. Dr. Yang has a solid theoretical foundation and more than 30 years of rich experience in freight. Forwarding logistics and shipping, he has written and translated many professional works, published in many academic papers in authoritative journals and websites at home and abroad. Led the legal work of many key projects of state-owned groups. He presided over the successful insolvency and reorganization of two listed companies, which have become classic cases in the capital market and judicial trials. Dr. Yang is long committed to the exchanges between the industry and development in several international and domestic industry associations, academic groups such as Vice President of China Maritime Law Association, arbitrator of CTAC and CMAC, chairman of the Legal Expert Committee of the International Freight Forwarders Association. Dr. Yang's speech today is about digitization of bill of lading and a CISG. Welcome, Dr. Yang. Thank you, Dr. Wang Xiehua, the moderator, for the kind introduction. Distinguished experts, old and new friends, good afternoon. First, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to attend this CISG at 40 conference. I've um, benefited a lot uh, from the speeches made this morning and just now. As everyone has said, CISG is the most influential international legal document in the field of international trade so far. 94 countries have ratified or joined the CISG. For 40 years, CISG has promoted the unification of the substantive law of contracts, reduced the legal obstacles for international sale of goods, provided a legal basis for the resolution of international trade disputes, and promoted immensely the development of international trade and globalization. China, as one of the earlier signatories, ratified CISG in 1986. CISG has provided important guidance for the formulation and improvement of China's national substantive laws and exerted a far-reaching and a positive influence on its foreign trade. With the progress of IT and the extensive use of the Internet, international trade has entered the era of e-commerce, the most means, elements, and the other aspects of trade are profoundly changing. Cross-border paperless trading is becoming a new e economic driver for all countries, and the digital economy is reshaping the transaction process of international trade. These changes have also accelerated the modernization of shipping and the digitalization of transportation. As an important document in international trade, the electronization of Bill of Lading, or BL, has attracted much attention. Since 1980s, the commercial practice of electronic BLs, namely EBLs, have burgeoned rapidly. The supporting electronic technologies, commercial rules and legislations are increasingly mature and robust. Globally, ports and shippers have been using electronic technology to facilitate the clearance, inspection, transportation, loading and unloading, stockpiling, and handover of cargo for decades, and the use of electronic transport documents, including BLs, is increasingly popular. The use of electronic documents explicitly specified in many standard contracts commonly used in industry, such as BIMCO standard a draft of a ship charter, chartering terms in 2014, EBIL, as a member of FIATA, which I serve on a part-time basis, issues more than 1 million BLs each year for multimodal transport, FBIL. Recently, we are also preparing for the platform to issue and use electronic bills of lading. Compared with paper-based ones, EBLs are obviously preferable for being inexpensive, safe, convenient, and quick in circulation. Then, by the underlying technologies, we can divide the EBLs into the ordinary ones and the blockchain-based ones, namely version 1.0 and the version 2.0 EBLs, as we call it. 
So the ordinary EBLs are based on the EDI technology and record transfers of cargo through a decentralized registry. Blockchain-based ones manage EBLs with the blockchain technology enable the carriers and the consignees, consignors, banks, and other parties to international trade to participate and complete the process online. It also monitors the issuance, transfer, endorsement, and recovery of the BLs. At present, there are three common worldwide ordinary operating systems and four for blockchains. And they have one international recognition. That means the if the shipping companies incur liabilities for transport, the IP group is going to underwrite such exposure. My company, China Merchants Energy, is a subsidiary of China Merchants Group, specialized in ocean offshore transportation. It is the second largest non-financial ship owner in the world. Its main business includes oil products, gas, dry bulk cargo, and special transportation. Since 2016, my company has been working with large iron ore exporters in dry bulk cargo transport sector to use EBLs through SFOX platform. Hundreds of them are issued and used every year. The company is partnering with large banks and mainstream oil traders worldwide to co-develop a platform for the use of a blockchain BLs. Use of EBLs not only saves the operation cost, but also reduces the legal risks, such as release of cargo without documents. Overall, the pros outweigh the cons. At the present, there are no technical obstacles, especially after IPNI Group agreed to underwrite the risk of EBLs and relieved the shipping companies of their worries. But in fact, as you can see, large ship owners like my company, issue only a few hundred EBLs each year. And despite their decades of development, the penetration of EBLs in the industry is still low. By analysis, what hinders their promotion and use are found to be the following three main factors. First, EBLs are still operating in a closed system. The EBL operating system recognized by IPNI Group requires its users to register on the platform in advance, not only to sign a user agreement with a platform, but also to sign a multi-party cooperation agreement with other users. It only allows the parties who are users of the platform to trade on the platform. This means that every EBL transaction, carriers, shippers, and banks must all be registered in the same system and must be must sign contracts with each other on this platform. If a party is not a member of this platform, then the EBLs will be converted into paper-based ones. Therefore, traders who use the EBL operating system in business practice are usually those with a large transaction volume and long-term cooperation. For those who are short-term or random transactors, the EBL system is generally less cost-efficient. A recent study by Anktad shows that, so far, the membership requirement of trading platforms has limited their number of users to some extent, thus restricted the space for trade and cooperation, which is a major obstacle for the promotion of EBLs. The closed nature of the system also limits the retransferability of the EBLs by importers. Second, the destiny of EBLs is largely in the hands of the shippers. In the entire international cargo transport process, ship owners are weak against, if not dependent on, the shippers. So they usually choose the form of BLs per the instruction of the shippers, including the issuance of EBLs. In other words, the use of EBLs is originally driven by the shippers. If carriers lack incentive to issue them, ship owners can't and won't force their customers to accept them. Through this long-term observation of business practice, it seems that not all shippers 
are willing to replace paper-based BELs with the EBLs, especially for importers. In the current model of international trade, payment is due upon the receipt of BLs. If you get the BLs early, you need to pay early and bear higher cost of capital by yourself. In comparison, since EBLs are faster in circulation and convenient in verification of transaction information, banks generally welcome EBLs more than other parties. Third, the nature of EBLs as a transferable certificate of rights lacks widespread recognition in international legislations. We know that BELs are receipt of cargo, evidence of contracts, and document of title. These three features are more or less mentioned in the Hague Convention, Wisby Rules, and Hamburg Convention. However, more importantly, these three features were established through long-term business practice as in industry customs. The UN Convention on International Multimodal Transport of 1980 has not come into force. UNCTAD ICC rules for multimodal transport documents of 1991 is so far still merely a model law. Therefore, for maritime and intermodal transport BLs, their three features, especially as evidence of title and transferability, has not been widely or uniformly recognized in international legislation. The Rotterdam rules set by Ancitral in 2008 introduced via an international convention a legal framework applicable to EBLs and electronic transport records for the first time. Ancitral model law on electronic transferable records of 2017 provides a legal model for solving the transferability of electronic records. It is a pity that the Rotterdam rules have only been ratified by five countries and the prospect of its entry into force is unclear. Moreover, the model law itself is not legally binding. At present, only Bahrain and Singapore have incorporated provisions thereof into their domestic legislation. Based on a proposal by the Chinese government, Ancitral has recently been undertaking a legislative study on the transferable documents for multimodal transport, focusing on the documents of title and the transferability of BLs. I'm lucky enough to be a part of this work. Secretary Anna also mentioned this this morning. Among other issues, the expert panel also discussed the electronization of negotiable transport documents, namely EBLs. Experts generally agree that EBLs have obvious advantages, such as its transparency, trans traceability, and minimal risk of human errors and forgery, and new opportunities in the Internet of Things. But in practice, the penetration of the EBLs differ by jurisdictions, modes of transport and the types of cargo. The overall development is slow, in addition to the legal obstacles mentioned before, the lack of unified operating process, technical standards, and quality control are important factors. Although the application and the popularization of EBLs still need time, we believe that with the rapid development of technology as well as the gradual deepening of international trade digitalization, BL electronization will accelerate. The international trade electronization currently focuses on contract formation, the UN model on e-commerce, model law on electronic signature, and the convention on electronic communication all focus on the electronic aspects of information transmission and a contract conclusion in the process of international trade contracting. At this stage, the BL Electronization is mainly about the selection of technical standards, extraction of platform, and moving paper-based BL online. With the development of electronic trade, this trend will inevitably extend from electronic execution to the whole process of contract performance, such as the transportation of cargo, the transfer of contracts, payment, and delivery of cargo, and other aspects of trade electronization. As Luca mentioned just now, as a result of trade electronization, EBLs will be a very important document for delivery and payment. We need to consider both the standardization of EBL processes and its significant impact of, on the business model of international trade and the relative 
related legislations, as I said just now, because EBLs are issued and then transferred quickly, and the buyers may get it soon, as soon as the cargo is loaded on board. But it still takes time for the cargo to arrive at the destination port. If we stick to the traditional idea that getting BL is equal to getting the cargo and ask the payers to pay, buyer to pay, then it seems a little unfair. Therefore, in order to prevent the current fair and balanced order of rights and obligations from being disrupted by the electronization of transport and trade documents, it is necessary to consider the new situation of such electronization and review the entire delivery and payment rules stipulated in CISG and recreate fairness and balance among all trading parties. At the same time, let's think about it further. With the emergence of the blockchain technology and the associated smart contracts, the efficient and safe transfer of EBLs has been elevated to a new height. But this comes with a big challenge to our existing legal system. One of the applications of blockchain technology is smart contracts. In short, it is a bunch of pre-programmed algorithms and codes on the blockchain. Whenever the conditions pre-established by the transaction parties are met, a pro particular program on the blockchain will be activated and will trigger the automatic performance of the relevant contracts. The application of smart contract protects the transaction performance from human interference and greatly reduces the occurrence of human error or fraud. Meanwhile, due to the decentralized nature of blockchain, smart contracts do not need the monitoring on the central platform, and the transaction information is secured by encryption technology. As a decentralized value transfer solution, it cures the mutual distrust between the buyers and the sellers and breaks the impasse where one party does not want to pay before receiving the cargo and the other does not want to deliver before being paid. If the smart contracts are used for the delivery in international trade, we will no longer have to rely on bank credit. That will be history. Then the functions of these traditional trade transport documents may be weakened and lost over time. Therefore, I suggest that CISG should pay close attention to this disruptive change that blockchain technology may bring to the patents and the rules of international trade. The final point I would like to make is that CISG has survived the vicissitudes of world politics, economy, and trade over the past 40 years. While congratulating it, I also sincerely wish that CSG can keep pace with the times, absorb new service models, new rules of international trade, revise and improve the relevant provisions, address the new problems and situations in the digitalization of international trade, and continue to play an important role in developing international trade with a new and a greater contribution. Thank you. From Dr. Yang's speech just now, I got at least three inspirations. The first is that EBLs have a great impact on business model and legislations on international trade. Second, if smart contracts are combined with the transactions or payments of international trade, will the traditional transaction model of bank credit become a thing of the past? Third, if blockchain technology is used, what kind of change or even disruptions may be made to the transaction model of international trade? CSG may need to probe into these points. Thank you, Dr. Yang. The fourth speaker is Professor Xu Hong. She is a professor at Beijing Normal University, JSD Supervisor Director of the Center for Internet Policy and Law, Chinese Director of the Joint Certification Project between Ancestral Asia Pacific Center and Beijing Normal University, expert member of the drafting team of e-commerce law, Movcom e-commerce expert, UN Asia Pacific paperless trade expert, member of Network Advisory Committee, member of APEC e-commerce alliance expert committee, expert of WIPO domain name dispute resolution procedure, expert of Asian domain name dispute resolution center, arbitrator of CTAC, 
and the CMAC, Vice President of Beijing Society of E-Commerce Law, Executive Director of China Cyber and Information Law Society, and Deputy Director of Internet Governance and International Cooperation Committee of China Cyber Security Association. Professor Xue Hong, please. Uh, many thanks, Dr. Wan. Uh, I never meant to be that mom's for this very long list of uh, official association. What I want to talk about is about third party claim uh, on intellectual property rights in digital trade. Uh, intellectual property has always been a big issue for digital trade that is conducted through online digital platforms or the other online medias. What we know, the most visible part of IPR action in digital trade is called notice and take down. We know it so well, it's being incorporated by Chinese civil code um, as, as a chapter on top liability. Um, but that kind of IPR enforcement occurred before any trading process. It means once the goods has been publicly offered or listing online, uh, the IPR right holder will send in the claims against it. And then, then the listing or public offering could be taken down. But we have the other IPR actions, actually. More than this pre-trading action, we have some in-trading action. Uh, that is we call third-party claims against goods in sale. There is one single provision in CISG regarding this third party IPR claims. I know there's more than 5,000 publications or research on CISG, but all of them, there's only very few to address this specific provision. That's Article 42. Oh, I'm so pleased to know uh, from Professor uh, uh, from Professor Han, <laughs> that there will be an expert opinion on this provision. I'm looking forward to that wholeheartedly because that provision, it looks very simple, but it's many devils in details. Let's look at Article 42 of CISG. It means that all the goods sold from seller to buyer should be free from any third party IPR rise or claim. So it means the seller should provide the buyer uh, indemnification against the third party claims. Well, it seems like a seller's obligation, but we all know the CISG is kind of pro-seller. So it is quite hard to impose this obligation on seller. If you want to presume a kind of liability of reach uh, regarding the seller's disobligation, uh, you have to meet a couple of conditions, a long list of conditions. Let's look at them quickly. The first condition is that only if the seller knew or could not have been unaware of the third party claims, um, it will be liable. This is only condition one. Condition two is about timing. So the seller should be knowing or could not have been unaware at the time of contracting of the third party claim. The third condition is about territoriality. It means that the seller should be knowing or could not be unaware of the third party claim from the territory of either the buyer's place of business or the territory where the goods to be resold or used. Oh, well, that's already a complicated condition, but we have two more conditions to go. The, the fourth condition is that um, this kind of claim should not be arising out of the buyer's instruction or specification. Well, this is quite understandable. The last condition is most difficult one. It means only if the buyer knew or could not be uh, aware <laughs> or could have been aware, then the seller should be a liable. Now, I know you, you all have been confused by this long list of conditions. Let's look at them in details. Normally, it's very difficult to prove the seller has a knowledge, has actual knowledge. So all the tension has been placed at the second half. That's could not have been unaware. I know this sounds quite weird provision, but actually it's been widely used in CISG. Will anyone know this expression? You, you can look at Article 8 there is a kind of interpretation about what is 
could not have been unaware. It means that if the other party of the contract could not have been aware, then it is could not have been unaware. Or if this interpretation cannot be applied, let's look at paragraph two. It means if a reasonable person could not have been unaware, then this is could not have been aware. But the problem is this Article 8 cannot be really applied to Article 42 to the seller's obligation. It's only because this is a kind of uh, retrospective arrangement. We, we should look at the seller's knowledge or awareness. Meanwhile, we should also look at the buyer's knowledge or awareness. So when we use the Article 8, Paragraph 1, it, it will be a neutrally exclusive. So which party should we look at? And for the Paragraph 2, we don't know whether this reasonable person to seller or to buyer. So now we, need, we, we enter into a logic loophole. Uh, this is really a big problem. So there's so many interpretations from different perspectives to try to explain what is seller's borderline for this not being unaware. Uh, there's two extreme. One, uh, this very distinguished scholar, he thinks that we should do all we can do. This is also supported by secretarying. It means that the seller is actually in advantageous position. You are selling the wood. You should know all the conditions with respect to your goods. So in that case, you should do the research, do all the due diligence, try to find out whether there's any risk of third party claims. Uh, this is one interpretation. Another extreme of interpretation is that the seller does not have this obligation. The seller is not liable until and unless it is fraudulently violence on the potential risks. Oh, so look at the big gap between the two extreme interpretations. It is not really easy to find the middle ground. So it is already difficult and controversial to explain Article 42 in the traditional trade. And then let's look at digital trade. See, think about all the challenges we are facing too. Uh, that the first challenge is that intellectual property in Article 42 has not been defined. Uh, well, this is really unfortunate because at the uh, uh, 1980s, there were no WTO, no trips agreement. So that's not even a kind of a, a, a borderline interpretation with respect to industrial property and the other intellectual property rights. So this is all open-ended. This is terribly risky to the trailer. Think about it. intellectual property rights is a group of law that's growing every day. Not the traditional copyright trademark patterns, but many emerging new rights. For example, design rights or geographical, uh, geographical indication that's newly recognized by trip agreements. And there's some many new rights um, that's only protected in certain territories, such as traditional knowledge. So if there's no definition, then you have to face to all these claims arising from these rights. And second challenge is that intellectual property enforcement has been strengthened. Is being uh, growing uh, and it's become very forceful. Previously, the third party claims could stop or suspend the goods either at export port or the import port. And now we have the new uh, enforcement. It's called uh, the enforcement as a goods in transfer. So the goods sold from Indian to African country could be stopped at European port. That's only because it's infringing to the European country's intellectual property rights, even though there's no such rights or claims from either the embankment ports or destination ports. So there's, um, I think about another risk. The third challenge from digital trade is that you have to face to a global market and have to face the global claims. Uh, recently, um, uh, some uh, arts or some, some uh, uh, applying art sold from Bulgaria to another European country has been subject to the claim from New Zealand because it's potential infringement to the indigenous art rights in that country. So the, the, because the New Zealand is potentially a country, these uh, applying art schools to be resold. So think about this globalized market. When the markets become flat, so is the third party claims. Oh, another challenge that's very complicated legal issue that's a gray market. Because it's globalized the market, the gray market has also become a global issue. Oh, the gray market means a parallel impulse. Oh, it would take me half a day to explain that. Um, so I, I give a long story, a short explanation. It means that even the seller has already obtained all the 
intellectual property permission directly from the right holders, it could still be subject to third party claims because of the conflicting IPR rights or licensing rights. So in that case, it's really hard for the seller to prepare or research this potential claims. The last challenge, I guess the most challenging things is the automated transactional system has been talked about by the previous expert speakers. Uh, that is because all the digital trains are actually conducted through this automated system without frequent human intervention. So everything which should be programmed uh, before the transaction, as I said, without the very careful research and, and without the, the full um, uh, contemplation of, of the legal situation from different territories, it's really not possible to find out whether there will be third party claims. So it seems that automated system uh, stipulated by Article 12 in ECC is definitely not sufficient. Probably we should really think about introduce a smart contract supported by artificial intelligence so they can really think through deep learning. So that is what is not infringing. Okay, uh, so my conclusion is that Article 42 is a highly risky provision. Um, if, you, if you imply in your contract, we don't know what will, what will happen, what are the legal consequences uh, to affect your interest. So I draw your attention when you incorporate that provision in your contract. One solution is try to look at Article 6, even though there's not so much popular in this conference, try to exclude it from application in your contract. Um, another uh, possible solution, uh, solution is where we, we need to reinforce this article because it's already uh, become outdated to our digital trade and uh, that is not really a solution to the risk management in the new trading situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shui. And uh, you give us a very uh, uh, good re re reminder as to the understanding of Article 42 of uh, CSG, especially when third party claims arise. The next speaker is Mr. Wang Yu Yu. Mr. Wang graduated from Xiamen University with a bachelor's degree in English language and literature. In 2003. Then he joined Mofcom and worked as a sachet in the European Commission from 2004 to 2005. In 2008, he obtained an LLM degree in Kent University in the UK, majoring in economic law. He now serves as a legal and a policy expert at Tencent, doing research about the policy and the legal issues concerning international trade. He's a research fellow at the Wuhan University Center of Economic Diplomacy. Previously, he was a deputy director of the General Division and Investment Law Division, Department of Treaty and Law of MOFCOM, member of the team on China-U.S. trade talks, core member of China BIT talks with the U.S. and EU, leader of the investment topics in CEPA negotiations, RCP talks, investment chapter of FTAs with Japan, Korea, and Australia. He has also participated in the drafting of foreign investment law and other legislations. He is highly experienced in many other matters, including the handling of trade frictions. I have known him for a long time. Now let me invite Mr. Wang Yuyu to speak on CISG and the development of the rules of international trade. Good afternoon, everyone. I will pay close attention to my time management so as to leave more time to subsequent speakers. What I would like to discuss with you is a topic which is very straightforward and it will not take too much time. The topic I've chosen for this presentation is analysis from a corporate perspective and review what kind of rules for international trade will be needed. This is a broad topic, but I will keep my presentation focused. Speaking of the new trends of international trade, 
From a corporate perspective of a company, international economic and trade rules, especially that for economic economy, have developed so fast. It were even too fast for us to adapt ourselves. From the perspective of a practitioner, the pace is too fast to follow. But for rule makers or legislators, what will be their thinking? Can we apply the old standards to the new era of digital economy? We are discussing a topic celebrating the 40th anniversary of CISG. I would like to congratulate CISG and Ancitro. Why? For an international rule to live on for 40 years with beaming vitality, that is. Remarkable. That means the rules were well made, with vision, and the rules accommodated the development of international trade over the past 40 years. You know how that, how fast that development has been over decades. So the ancestral colleagues have done a lot of very effective work. So I want to thank them for that. At this moment, in economic globalization, the most progressive manifestation is the growth of digital economy. In the digital economy, digital trade is an important concept. Let's leave it aside and look at the big picture of the evolution of international trade rules. There are several clear trends. First, there is only one planet. Of course, but new space and territory are emerging on this planet. For example, at the conference today, because of the pandemic, many experts, especially those from other countries and the viewers from other countries, cannot come on site. And with the emerging digital technology, virtual space is. Created, allowing them to join us, feeling that they are with us in this room by technology or even philosophy. This is a new space. When there is a space, there will be relations among persons in the space, and those relations need to be regulated and governed by rules. International trade is no longer simply limited to the original space. In the EU, US, China, and other developing or developed countries, various trade legislation is in progress, and the priorities those on or relating to digital trade, and they do not concentrate or are limited to digital trade itself or contract law thereof. The center. Of the focus is on regulation, and national legislations are not progressing at the same pace. That makes it difficult for us to follow. We support all the governments in their efforts to make legislation about digital trade to advance their public interest and welfare. But I hope, first and foremost, legislation shall not cause legal dilemma to enterprises. Especially those in digital industries. So, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary, we have found CSG to be more vibrant than other rules. That is because we have captured the practitioners' needs amidst of international trade. When there is no rule, so we can be rule makers, but not a ruler. By looking for the common denominators of the rules needed by all, the greatest common divisor, the rules can be provided as infrastructure to keep trade going. But we have found that there is a bifurcation of international rules. Some countries have their own ideas on digital. Regulation, privacy, data security, and national security, or even the protection of national industries, for various motivations, they make their laws and rules, and this is a new trend we have observed. As I mentioned, 
For the digital industry, the pace is rapid. Over the past decade and in the next two or three decades, the most salient direction of development is that virtualization and digitalization of the real economy. We have seen a lot of such examples. Due to the limited time we have, I will not name them. However, in the light of the development of a digital trade and industry, we have seen the following features. First, the digital industry has become gradually an independent industry. Recently, the National Bureau of Statistics published the 2021 taxonomy on digital economy. So the government has realized the maturity of digital economy and therefore creates such standards of categorization. Digital economy has also morphed into various forms. We talk about digital trade on the occasion of the conference on CISG. We discuss a lot about digitalized contracts. Paper-based contracts are turned into digital contracts. But actually, in the development of digital trade, the contact has exceeded the digitalization of or facilitation of such a trade. Digital trade trades data as goods, and digital goods are similar with digital services. For many of the frontier issues, we started dealing with them in the very early on. For example, films, then music, games, all these were imported and exported. And what type of import and export were they? I'm not here to elaborate on, but I just want to put it on the table. And for copyright and other virtual products, or even you know, digital currencies, if they are traded, is it a kind of trade? Second, we also discussed extensively today the digital trade of physical products. The third is digital services, which facilitate physical trade. And that is also kind of digital trade. The final one is the emerging forms like AI, IoT, and other emerging technologies. They may not be the mainstream by quantity for digital trade, but they have become the center of focus in many countries. And many countries, especially the developed countries, have already paid attention to it. I don't need to elaborate on the prospects of the digital economy. Countries are remitting no relenting no efforts to promote it, and the legislations they're about are more than contract law. In the future, new issues will face the development of digital trade. Due to time limits, I will simply just touch on them. We have noted that in many developed countries and China, what concerns the governments most is the protection of public interest and consumers. From last year to this year, that is an important trend, which we believe to be good and very reasonable. For the development of the digital economy, there will be a solid ethical foundation. Now, tight scrutiny is exercised on digital trade. The main direction of regulation is the protection of privacy, data security, and national security. However, beyond them, digital trade itself also needs to be facilitated. How can we develop the cross-border digital targets and better enhance the efficiency of digital trade, reduce transaction cost, decrease the institutional barriers, and how the discrepancy of infrastructure in different countries can be less of a hindrance to trade. For future development of digitalization legislations, let me come back to CSG itself. When we mention it, we need to mention Nancitra. Nancitra is a very successful organization. In my previous life, I participated in many work of it, like Work Group 3. 
You know, it is about the dispute resolution on trade in that domain for so many years of work. I felt clearly that the UN doesn't want to lag behind WTO, especially when it comes to economic and trade legislation. In many areas, in investment, for example, the UN is leading the way with untied and non-sexual. Through our interactions, we have felt a lot of urgent issues. Secretary Anna herself and the rest of the staff there all hope to propose new solutions. That is the case for Working Group 3. Is that the same for other working groups? Digital economy is set to represent the new trend, a new height of future trade. Will Ancitra still limit itself to contract law when it facilitates digital trade? Or in an area nobody has successfully addressed in a new space? Or tele incognita, as said by the Europeans in Latin language. In this new territory, will Ancitra do some new things? In terms of digital trade and the services, there lacks a system, not only for contract law, but also the regime on the behavior process and the customs for transactions. Shall we leave it to WTO or the UN? Or a new organization, even in APAC, there are some discussions, but such discussions are limited to privacy. So the legislators and rule makers need to think about that. In WTO, the e-commerce negotiation is going on. Still, it is still the countries that are discussing issues relating to regulation, as I said, for digital economy, apart from facilitation and regulation, actually we also need an international organization to do one thing, as what a CSG did for us for 40 years. In the absence of rules, a set of rules can be created to reduce cost and standardize behavior. Now the rules are fragmented, so that is not the best for the development of digital trade. Digital technologies or internet, no, no border. Of course, people doing those technologies and internet have their nationality. I, I did not create it from thin air. I have noted that the Chinese government has already paid attention to it. Previously, UN has produced uh, rules on electronic signature. China has also made laws about it. But there is a clear awareness on the part of the state that e-commerce is not only about doing trading goods in electronic means. Trading goods and services have all been included uh, in the regulation of digital trade. China has done that, and that is very well done as a sign of development. The UN also needs to think about this. For the development of the services sector, it will be a future trend for its own sake. And go trading goods is turning trade in services. Let me take one automotive company as an example. That company sells cars, but not only cars. And the market cap is not simply supported by the car sales, but by the underlying services coming with the cars. And there will be more direct digital trade in the future. Car companies will be just mileage providers or service providers. When we discuss the rules on digital economy by then, it may be a bit too late. So when service trade rise, we can take a small step for the service trades that are easier to regulate. We can find the common divisors. So that is, above all, the future direction. So in a nutshell, CISG 
is about efficiency. Internet also aims to improve efficiency. I don't think the expansion of CSG into digital economy will encounter any theoretical problems. And secondly, we can consider update CSG so that gradually and partially CSG can be expanded to service trade. Third, contract law is a quite developed area of international law. But beyond contract law, rules are relatively absent, so we need to solve many problems, not only privacy and security which concern the government. In terms of ser service provision, data exchange, so more rules need to be made not only those for contracts. Finally, we also hope Han Sichu will continuously play is an even greater role in digital trade and economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Wang Youyou, for discussing the new trends of international trade, new area problems of digital trade, digital legislation, and the potential areas for the future development of CSG. You mentioned many points deserving our further thinking. So uh, before we close this session, uh, first let me, uh, on behalf of the audience and all, uh, all the organizers of this event, to thank our speakers for their sharing of the, their, their inputs and also their contribution to this session. And uh, secondly, I would also, on behalf of all the speakers and uh, moderator of this session, to speak uh, to thank our audience and all, and all the uh, organizers for your time and patience. So this session is dismissed. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cao uh, Jun. I'm a partner of Zhonglen Law Firm and uh, also the head of uh, dispute resolution in the firm. I'm also an arbitrator with CTEC. Uh, so the fourth session is uh, uh, about dispute settlement regarding sales of goods. Speaking of my own experience, I started my career uh, in mid 1990s as a case manager at CTEC. Back then, CTEC only handled two major categories of uh, disputes international sale of goods, and joint venture disputes. Over the years, CTEX caseload has been, you know, uh, further categorized to include many, many uh, new types of dispute, but international sale of goods remain as one of the major type of CTEX cases. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have seen the figures in the morning session. Uh, in fact, as a practitioner, in recent years, I have seen an increasing number of international self goods cases. This is a primary re relation to the economic climate. I mean, foreign companies, some of them are withdrawing from China. So um, the transactions that used to be conducted onshore in China now become international transactions. Uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing for the application of a CIS gene, for sure. I think this is also the same reason why we see more distribution agreement disputes and the licensing disputes. In my personal experience, arbitration at uh, ICC, CAC, or HKIAC, all these institutions they handle a good number of international sale of goods disputes. If you check the database, such as a cloud, C L O U T, maintained by um, you know, uh, United Nations and CTEC play a part in providing its uh, CISG awards, as well as Use Mondi, uh, which is uh, based in uh, Paris, there are many arbitral awards involving sale of goods disputes under CISG. That means to say arbitration appears to be a preferred forum for resolving international sale of goods disputes. That being said, it is not the only way for resolving such disputes. 
some disputes will naturally be resolved through negotiations, through mediations, and uh, some disputes simply go to court because there's no arbitration clause in the contract. Um, you know, uh, particularly the international commercial arbitration, uh, international commercial courts that has been established in countries like uh, Singapore, China, Kazakhstan, and the Netherlands, they handle a good number of uh, such disputes. So uh, with me today, uh, there are five prominent uh, speakers, three from overseas and two from China. We will hear from them uh, how different mechanisms have been used to resolve international sale of goods disputes. Our first speaker will be the Honorable Judge Samuel Reyes. You will probably know him from uh, some of the very well-known cases, decisions that he made when he was a judge in the Hong Kong High Court. He was a judge there from 2003 to 2020, and then a professor with uh, Hong Kong University from 2012 to 2018. Judge Reyes became an international judge of the Singapore International Commercial Court that I just mentioned in 2015. He is at the same time an arbitrator and frequently sit as arbitrator in Hong Kong, Singapore, and many other jurisdictions. Judge Reyes, please. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cao referred a moment ago to the resolution of international sale of goods disputes through litigation. And I'm going to address that. I'm going to talk about recent developments in the resolution of international sale of goods disputes by my court, the Singapore International Commercial Court. I'm going to make three points. The first two points deal with innovations that have recently been introduced by the SICC. The third relates to a problem or that we have identified in relation to the resolution of international commercial disputes, including disputes relating to the international sale of goods. Let me deal with the first point. The first point is quite short. Um, there was a, a conference in March of this year in which the SICC announced that it was going to be introducing shortly new rules, new rules of court. These are supposed to be state-of-the-art rules that combine the best of arbitration and litigation for the resolution of commercial disputes, including disputes relating to the international sale of goods. The SICC is both a common law and a civil law court. So the new rules also adapt the best practices of the common law and the civil law. And this will soon be introduced. The basic innovation is to have three different routes for the resolution of a commercial dispute. The parties in conjunction with the judge, with the court listening to the case, will decide which route, which method is the best way to resolve a dispute. One method might be to go by what one might call the standard pleadings route that is familiar to most common lawyers. But another route might be to go for the memorial route, which is perhaps more familiar to civil lawyers. So it's possible also to opt in particular cases where it is appropriate to have memorials rather than pleadings. And finally, the third route will be something akin to what is known in common law jurisdictions and originating summits where the facts are not so much in dispute, but there is a point of law typically that is uh, hotly debated between the parties, then um, the court can have a different, a third method of proceeding, which focuses simply on the question of law that is being debated between the parties. So there's uh, three different routes uh, by which a case 
in especially a sale of goods case can be resolved uh, in the future before the SICC. That's my first point. My second point is this. Even more recently, in the last month or so, uh, there have been two innovations that have been introduced by the SICC through practice directions. The first is to enable the use of video link for the creation of or for the swearing of affidavits and other attestations. Let me explain. As a result of COVID-19, um, it's not always possible to appear before a notary public to um, swear or to attest your evidence, your affidavit of evidence that you want to adduce in court. Um, and physically find a notary public in many jurisdictions, especially Asian jurisdictions, given lockdowns, given the prevalence of COVID-19. So enables an affidavit to be attested online so that it will not be necessary to meet the notary physically it will be possible simply to do it through Zoom or WebEx or some remote technology, much as we are conducting today's conference. So hopefully that will save time and cost in the post-pandemic period. The other innovation recently introduced by way of practice direction is to enable third-party funding in cases before the SICC. Um, one of the problems that um, has arisen as a result of COVID-19 is a global financial recession. Some areas, such as in China, are beginning to pick up economically. Other areas have still some way to go. Um, therefore, for micro, small, medium enterprises, MSMEs, looking for as some sort of vindication of their rights in court, it may be necessary to re resort to third party funding. In many common law jurisdictions, it is not possible to have third party funding before courts. There has been a liberalization and it is possible in uh, Hong Kong, in Singapore and other jurisdictions to have third party funding in relation to arbitration. Uh, now, or shortly, with this practice direction, it will be possible to have third-party funding for cases before the SICC. So that's my second point. There's some innovations uh, that we are developing to deal with the post-pandemic era. era. Uh, they are a combination of the use of remote technology and other innovations. But let me now identify a problem, my third point a problem that has arisen. And that has appeared as a result of the accelerated use of remote technology by the SICC. If you're going to take evidence abroad, from abroad, let us say um, a witness is to appear via remote technology, via Zoom or, or WebEx, um, to give evidence before the court. Uh, the witness's evidence is to be heard by Zoom or remote, some form of remote technology. For most common law jurisdictions, this is not a problem. But for many civil law jurisdictions, and possibly China, if, say, I were to hear evidence from a witness in China using Zoom, there may be difficulties. Many civil law jurisdictions Japan is one example, Switzerland is another example, regard the taking of evidence in their territory, even if done remotely, as a affront to national sovereignty. That's just part of their law. So it's not a matter of just automatically switching on the, uh, the computer, the laptop, putting on the, the remote technology and taking evidence. You have to get clearance from a particular authority within a given uh, jurisdiction, within a given country. 
arbitration, international commercial arbitration, does not seem to face the same problem. Um, because arbitration is consensual, based on party autonomy, uh, state civil law jurisdictions don't seem to mind if a party voluntarily gives evidence for an arbitration from a particular jurisdiction, gives evidence in an arbitration being held or being seated elsewhere from, let us say, uh, a different jurisdiction. Um, most countries don't seem to have any objection to that. It's when you do it through a court, when you take evidence through a court, that most country, that a lot of countries uh, take objection. So this is inconvenient for um, international commercial courts and perhaps the China International Commercial Court will be facing a similar problem. If evidence is to be taken from some country on, along the Belt and Road, for instance, what procedures need to be done, what to be taken, what measures need to be taken in order to enable a witness to give evidence from that country in the Belt and Road. Clearance will no, often have to be given by some authority, some government authority within the other, within the jurisdiction from which the witness is to give evidence. So where does one find out whether clearance is needed, if clearance is needed, which government organization does one have to go? This is a problem. This problem does not seem to appear in arbitration. So if that's the case, does this mean that arbitration should be favored for the resolution of international commercial disputes, including sale of goods disputes, as opposed to uh, uh, international commercial courts? I don't believe so. But this is a problem that international commercial courts, including the SICC and the China International Commercial Court, will have to address. I suggest that one way to do this will be through the 1970 Hague Convention on Taking of Evidence. Both China and Singapore, for instance, are parties to that. Chapter two of the convention may be of assistance, the problem is that when China and Singapore acceded to the Hague Convention, to the 1970 Convention, they excluded, as they were entitled to do, the application of Chapter 2. Another method may be for CICC, uh, SICC, International Commercial Courts, to enter into memorandums of understanding with the judiciaries or with the governments of other countries to clarify what exactly are the procedures to, be a, to enable evidence to be taken remotely from each other's jurisdictions. Um, this is a problem that will need to be uh, addressed. I, I suggest it will need to be addressed sooner rather than later. I do not think it is an insurmountable problem, but it is something that has arisen in the course of um, dealing with the difficulties the problems posed by the pandemic. At the moment, the solution taken by the SICC is to require parties who are calling evidence remotely uh, in some, from some other country to uh, certify to the SICC that they have complied with whatever procedures there are in that other country uh, that are required to enable evidence to be taken remotely. Um, I think this is a temporary or should be a temporary solution, and we should be entering at least into memorandums of understanding with other countries to facilitate the taking of evidence, the voluntary taking of evidence by remote technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Judge Reyes, for this uh, very informative introduction about the uh, reform innovations uh, introduced by SICC and uh, also uh, the innovations uh, in light of the uh, pandemic on uh, remote uh, technology. Uh, well, what uh, I find the most interesting is that uh, SICC now also uh, made reform to its uh, rules so as to allow parties to make a choice between 
uh, the traditional common law pleading uh, style procedure and uh, uh, what uh, Judge Rui has called the <coughs> memorial style uh, procedure. If you are familiar with overseas arbitration, you know, at the first procedural meeting, they usually mm. talk about how the procedure are to be arranged and uh, you hear uh, words like uh, pleading type versus uh, uh, memorial type. Uh, honestly, if, as a Chinese practitioner, we usually are not familiar with neither of uh, uh, these uh, types. But when you get used to do international arbitration, you will find uh, probably uh, pleading type to be more, uh, to be easier uh, to handle uh, because you don't have to submit all the uh, documents and uh, witness statement with your very first uh, pleading document. Uh, well, uh, thanks again to Judge Reyes. So our next speaker is uh, Danny McFadden. Uh, Danny has been with uh, CEDA. CEDA stands for Center for Effective Dispute Resolution. Uh, that's a uh, London-based uh, mediation uh, and dispute resolution institution. Then it has been uh, the regional representative of CEDA Asia Pacific for many years. Uh, I met him at uh, various conferences in the past. Um, he um, is qualified as a lawyer in Australia and uh, the UK. He's highly experienced in doing mediation as a mediator, as well as in uh, you know, uh, training uh, prospective mediators as a trainer. Uh, he even provided uh, uh, training services for organizations such as the United Nations, uh, the European Union, uh, IMF, and the World Bank. Uh, Danny also speaks Mandarin Chinese, so I don't know uh, whether he's going to speak in Chinese or English. His topic today is a mediation on international sale of goods dispute. I forgot to mention just now that uh, uh, although there's a delay of the entire program, we are still going to have 75 minutes. So each of my panelists will have uh, 10 to uh, 12 minutes for the presentation. Uh, let's welcome Danny McFadden, please. <coughs> Uh, 据我了解，我们有超过三十八个国家啊在线，今天会参加这个会议，所以我现在开始讲英语。So uh, thank you uh, very much, um, Cao Cao Rushi, for your introduction. And now I'm going to share my screen. So I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to start it, but I can't get to it on the top. Let me have a look. Well, if you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll continue with the screen. So it gives you the opportunity to look uh, slightly ahead and see what I'm going to be talking about. As has uh, as already just been mentioned, we're based in London. Uh, CEDA is the largest dispute resolution uh, organization in, in Europe. Uh, and we do, in terms of supply of goods and services cases, um, totally, I think every year, commercial cases, we do at least eight to 900 cases. The average amount of our mediation cases is about 1 million. Uh, English pounds. We tend uh, to do the larger cases. So as you can see um, on the figures on, on your screen there, uh, supply of goods and services is a huge part of the work we do, at least 22%. And I think most years it may well be over a quarter of our cases. So we do eight or 900 cases a year, 
out of that, at least 200, 250 will be for the supply of goods and, <clears throat> and services. Um, my own personal cases, I would say it'd be more than that. I'd probably do over 50% supply of goods and services. And maybe that's because I'm uh, usually based in Hong Kong and uh, I'm able, able to speak Mandarin Chinese as well as English. So I often um, handle cases involving um, China and overseas companies. i just give you some examples. I took these from our recent statistics, um, a case between an, an Italian uh, fruit and vegetable grower and the UK distributor supplying supermarkets in the UK. This was uh, because of COVID, the supply train um, chain broke down and uh, the two parties were in dispute. Another case, which is fairly typical, uh, IT software contract, there's a claim for um, unpaid invoices, a counter claim for quality of service. I mean, this is fairly um, standard for sale of goods and services cases. A Couple of cases that I've done, one, uh, the first one in China, in Shanghai, a Chinese manufacturer sold uh, supermarket trolleys to an Australian supermarket. The Australian supermarket refused to pay the Chinese manufacturer. They said that the trolleys, you know, the things they push around in the supermarket, they weren't fit for purpose. And so we had a two day or about one and a half day mediation in Shanghai and eventually we managed to settle. Another, um, for those of you who haven't taken part in international commercial mediation cases, uh, we handle very complex cases with large amounts of money. <clears throat> the next case um, I'm going to talk about involved millions of dollars is between a German, so it's a Philippine Chinese steelworks. They sued a German iron ore broker claiming breach of contract. They didn't get the iron ore that the Germans offered to send to them. The Germans said there's a clause in our contract where if our supply chain is broken, uh, we are not liable to you. And what had happened is a mine in Russia went bankrupt. So a <clears throat> iron ore mine went bankrupt and the uh, Philippine Chinese company sued the Germans for not providing the goods. Um, two day mediation, very complex. Um, very intense, took us about uh, until one o'clock the uh, final morning. So uh, in terms of cases that can be mediated, even if they're complex, even if they involve a lot of money and a lot of contractual issues, um, I would offer to you that mediation is a suitable mechanism for, for resolving cases. Um, most of you, I think, will know this. Uh, I'm sure we have many mediators um, taking part in today's, um, today's conference. We look at three things as a mediator, as a commercial mediator. It doesn't matter what the um, legal issues or the commercial issues are. We basically take the same approach. We are seeking to help the parties to resolve the dispute. So even though the legal issues are very important and it may involve the discussion of a CISG contract, for example, we also take into account the personal and commercial aspects of the case. We help people deal with facts and the feelings and we help them to move from the past and the present into the future, which is something that arbitration and the courts can't do. So as a mediator is using their skills to move the parties on basically. Um, and hopefully the parties come to the mediation, no matter what their contract is, CISG or any other, but they're looking for a commercial <clears throat> solution to the problem. We all know how expensive arbitration is. We all know how time consuming. <clears throat> we all know how um, expensive and time consuming and stressful court cases can be. So what type of characteristics do we tend to have? Well, um, in the sale of goods and services cases, they tend to be a more commercial. Um, that is that there will be a lot of discussion, uh, as it says below, 
on uh, there'll be a lot of focus on the contracts on the standard terms and conditions and their interpretation you can expect a lot of discussion of remedies example the avoidance of contracts specific performance damages all those really important issues around uh, contracts and around the dispute um, however i must caution that um, there is a motion in all cases and that is why mediation uh, does help the parties to break deadlock. Parties get stuck emotionally as well as in legal arguments. Wherever there are people, we would say to you, and in my experience and my colleagues, there's emotion involved. Another um, aspect to it is you will often find that in um, <clears throat> goods and services cases, one side will be trying to get out of their contractual obligations going forward. So as I said before, the discussion and mediation allows this is to talk not only about what happened and the past up to the present day, but also uh, what about the future? Another characteristic is, and one would expect this, if this, there's 99% of all uh, goods and services cases involve a contract, therefore lawyers will uh, undoubtedly involved it does the these kind of cases do tend to be more lawyer centric however having said that and I, I love lawyers not because i am lawyers but i love to have lawyers at mediation there are wonderful assistance to their parties what you do find is though in countries like the uk australia hong kong and singapore many lawyers who are experienced in international mediation will use the opportunity not just to keep the discussion around the contract, no matter what kind of contract it is, but help the parties to move forward. They're very proactive and really experienced lawyers prepare for an international mediation the same as they would for a court case. They generally tend to have all the documents already prepared anyway, if they're gonna to go to arbitration or to, or they're going to go to um, a court case. Um, looking to the future, um, many of you will know, I'm sure, that um, we now have the Singapore uh, Convention on Settlement in International Mediation, uh, Singapore Kungye. Um, many people are looking forward to this increasing the use of uh, mediation in international cases. This is our sort of version of Arbitration's New York Convention. A lot of people are hoping that this will assist in countries like China, Japan, Korea, generally Asian countries that are uncomfortable not having an enforcement mechanism. When I do my cases in the UK, in, in America, or wherever, we seldom have a problem with enforcement, but it is something that does tend to be important to parties in Asian countries. Um, one other thing is that we can also um, work on cultural issues and factors in mediation. For example, um, when I mediate with Japanese or Koreans, they nearly always say to me that, yes, the contract is important, but we'd also like to talk about the relationship, the business relationship. So mediating makes a lot of sense if you're in the same industry and you think you may need to work together again. And nobody wants to develop a bad reputation based on breach of contract or arguments over contracts. Um, the last thing it does, a mediation allows for people to step back from purely arguing about the terms of the contract and think about, do they want to negotiate it? Do they want to keep control of the dispute? Because once you hand the dispute to an arbitration tribunal, or obviously you take it to court, you have lost control of the dispute if you're a party. You've handed it over to strangers, basically. Um, yes, you can pick one of the arbitrators in a three-person arbitral tribunal, but uh, you, can't pick, you generally can't pick the other two. And of course, you can rarely pick the judge in your case. Um, so um, I will stop there. Well, or is this, <clears throat> or your Guanxi, or your Zhang Daojeli, but I'm just going to stop here um, and ask 
uh, everyone to consider in future, no matter what type of sale and goods services contract you're operating under, to consider uh, the use of international mediation. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Danny has just uh, introduced uh, some of the typical cases handled by CEDA. And he also uh, analyzed the uh, major features of a sea of goose disputes from a mediator's perspective uh, and gave his very insightful observations on that. Well, uh, our next speaker is Mr. Kevin Kim. Many of you probably know Kevin as one of the most prominent arbitration practitioner, uh, not just from Korea, but also from Asia. Uh, Kevin works uh, with uh, the leading law firm of uh, Beckham Lee BKL for three decades, where he was the head of uh, arbitration and international practice, and has in recent years uh, left BKL to co-found the international boutique firm of uh, Peter and Kim. Peter, that's uh, Wolfgang Peter, and Kim, that's Kevin Kim. So Kevin has acted as a counsel and arbitrator in more than 300 cases under various arbitration rules including both commercial and uh, uh, treaty arbitrations. Among the other positions that he holds, Karen is presently a vice president of the ICC, International Court of Arbitration, uh, advisory board member of the ECA, International Council for Commercial Arbitration, and uh, the chairman of uh, KCAB, International Arbitration Committee. KCAB stands for Korean Commercial Arbitration Court. Karen's topic today is a CISG in Asia, then and now. Let's welcome Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a very good day to every everyone attending the event. And many thanks to uh, CTEC for the uh, very kind invitation. Uh, it is an honor and privilege for me to speak on the, this momentous occasion of UNCITRAL CISG Global Series celebrating 40th anniversary of uh, CISG. Um, as the session is on the dispute settlement regarding um, the sales of goods, my presentation will focus on the two broad areas. First, the role of CISG uh, is promoting trade and mitigating commercial dispute between North Korea and South Korean businesses. Second, CISG's role in streamlining the law governing the sales of goods and setting a body of uh, uh, presidents to resolve dispute in Asia. Um, as you can see, in the last decade alone, three Asian countries have, became, have become part of CISG. These are uh, Vietnam in 2017 uh, and North Korea and Laos in 2020. It is indicative of the trend that CISG is getting more important as governing law of the agreements on international sales of goods in Asia. The addition of North Korea is notable and I will focus on, uh, on it for the next few minutes. Um, as you can imagine, North Korea uh, joining the CISG is instrumental for several reasons. Uh, history has taught us that trade has been the the single most important fact, factor bringing several disputes and com, uh, confrontations to, to, an, to an end. With North Korea is uh, joining the CISG in 2020, we can hope that uh, this is beginning of the end of a long-standing strained relationship uh, between North Korea and, and South Korea. Um, here are some of the facts about North Korea joining the CISG. 
uh, it is the, the 19th party to access a seat to CIC. Uh, the session became effective from April 2020. North Korea has made a, a reservation, i.e. it has a writing requirement if the place of business is North, North Korea. CISG may apply in, in a contract of sales of goods, even if the other party is in a non-party state. Uh, North Korea ratifying the CISG is of practical and symbolic significance. Uh, number one, it will make it practical for North Korean businesses to interact with the rest of the world and in particular, South Korea. Number two, it will provide a new avenues of dispute resolution by way of arbitration and as well as ADR mechanisms. As for the symbolic importance, it shows that the power to trade to breach long standing disputes between North and South Korea. And second, it, it increased uh, in trade will consequently lead to an ease in, in the political dis dispute between North and South Korea. Uh, in the past, uh, there has been a few agreements between North Korea and South Korea, such as the agreements on the process procedure of the commercial dispute resolution between, between the parties in South and North Korea, uh, 2000, and the agreements on organization and operation of Inter-Korean Commercial Arbitration Board, and which is 2003. These set out arbitration as commercial dispute resolution method. Further, they also promote institutional arbitration through Inter-Korean Commercial Arbitration Board to be constituted um, in the future. It's not completely constituted yet. As for the pr uh, procedure rules, UNCITRA arbitration rules can be a uh, main reference for the procedure rules to be agreed between South and North Korea. In this regard, uh, the, the chairman of the uh, KCAB uh, Korean Commercial Arbitration Board said, since North Korea has joined the CISG, it is worth paying attention to the arbitration system as neutral dispute resolution mechanism because it is difficult for North and South Korea parties to accept any judgment from South Korea or North Korean courts. As for the substantive law, CISG could prove instrumental in resolving the dispute relating to sales and purchase of the goods. Uh, the Gaesung industry complex, uh, which is called the Gaesung industrial uh, economic zone, has had a difficulty, a difficult beginning, but hopefully now that North Korea has signed the CIC, uh, something good may finally come out of it, uh, it and in, in terms of re resolving this dispute using the CISG. In, in 2013, Gaesung Industrial Complex Inter-Korean Joint Committee signed the annex to the implement the agreements on the organization and operational operation of Inter-Korean Commercial Arbitration Board for Commercial Arbitration Board of Gaesung Industrial Complex to resolve dispute arising in the complex. So however, it ran into the several difficulties uh, uh, time and, and again. Uh, the Inter-Korea Korean Commercial Arbitration Board of Gaesung Industrial Complex was established as a separate legal entity with purpose of resolving any commercial dispute arising out of the economic transactions in relation with Kaesung Industrial Complex through arbitration. Is it likely uh, that for all sales or purchase of the agreement, 
CIC is used when industrial zone finally uh, becomes fi uh, fully operational. The next question that arise is the what will be the CIC contribution to North Korea's dispute resolution mechanism? Uh, it is twofold contribution. CIC will promote a dispute settlement mechanism that inspires confidence in the business that deal with North Korea. Additionally, it will help North Korea develop its own domestic contract law through CIC based jurisprudence and registration. Uh, where does the South Korea fit into uh, this narrative? South Korea president on CISG are in, in Korean language. Uh, this will help North Korea to tide over the language barrier. It may have otherwise faced if South Korea was not a party to the CISG. And as the CIC signatory for more than uh, 15 years now, North Korea has very wide and diverse set of the cases that will be helpful to um, the North Korea in adapting CIC. So South Korean cases will provide good sources to them. This could coupled with language advantage with the beneficial to North Korea and advantage that would uh, it leverage only from South Korea when compared to other signatories in the region. As discussed, uh, there are a total of around 70 cases that has been reported on the CISG in South, South Korea. Uh, Korean court has been very supportive of the CISG. There are two judgments on this slide bear testimony to the fact. Uh, it is settled in Korea that when parties uh, designate Korean law as applicable law, the CIC is applicable by virtue of the being a component of the Korean law. Similarly, it has been held that the provision under Article 3.1 of CIC uh, only appears to expand rather than limit the scope of sales to which the CIC is applicable. Thus, the the courts in Korea have only promoted the use of CIC in the dispute that has come before it. This is likely to, uh, to read less challenge as to the use of the CIC, thus making dispute settlement, especially through arbitration, much simpler. Other Asian countries has displayed similar support for CIC uh, this slide is a, just an example of, from, from Singapore and also from China. In a dispute between a Singapore part, Singaporean party and the New Zealand party, Singaporean High Court held that Singapore choice of law rules are not engaged because Singapore and New Zealand had both ratified CISG. So thus it is held that Singaporean court will apply the CISG. And next point um, is a China Chinese code that the way the, the countries or parties to contract for international sales of goods are all contracting states to the CIC, the provisions of CIC shall prevail. And only a matter not provided where therein shall be governed by the plight of law as stipulated in the contract. Thus, there are uh, primarily three ways in which CIC is harmonizing dispute resolution in Asia. First, as convention, CISG applied to the contract of sales of goods between the parties whose places of business are in different states. Second, by mixing well with domestic laws, CIC aid registrations and the code to modernize domestic law and align them with internationally acceptable uh, principles. Third, a general guiding principle, even though CIC is not, is only applicable to the contract of sales of goods, arbitral tribunal have considered it as guiding light while deciding matters relating to other international business 
and entry injections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we have in Asia, particularly um, interesting is North Korea's ratification of the CISG Convention in 2020, uh, and how uh, the inter-Korean uh, disputes are going to be uh, arbitrated in the contemplated uh, uh, inter-Korean mechanism. Thanks again. Our next speaker, uh, our next speaker is Mr. Hu Zhenjie, General Counsel of Aluminum Corporation of China and a CTAC arbitrator. Mr. Hu obtained his JSD degree in the University of Freiburg in Switzerland with a summa cum laude honor. He holds the professional title of Senior Economist chairs the Corporate Council Committee of All China Lawyers Association. Moreover, he is an executive director of China Society of International Private Law and WTO Law Research Society of China Law Society. Previously, he served as a deputy director, then director, and later Deputy Director General at the Research Department of the Legislative Affairs Office of the State Council from 2015 to 2017, who was the Vice Mayor of Fuzhou City. His topic today is a trade dispute resolution mechanism from the perspective of companies. Now, please, Mr. Hu. Uh, Hello, everyone. I would like to briefly talk about trade dispute resolution from the perspective of parties. There are three aspects. First is the features of Chalco's trade disputes and the ways to resolve them. The second is the main considerations in our choice of resolution methods. The third is some suggestions on improving the arbitration system. So before I start my presentation, I would like you to know us as the party. Chalco founded in 2001 is a leading enterprise in China's non-ferrous metal industry so it has been listed in Fortune Global 500 for 13 consecutive years and ranked 217 in 2021. 20, uh, and the total asset of us uh, exceeded the 650 billion RMB. And we have more than 500 portfolio companies with consolidated accounts, including seven companies listed at home and abroad. Our main business are aluminum, copper, land, zinc, and rare earths. And we rank the first in the world in terms of alumina. And our copper, lead, zinc business rank the fourth in the world. Our comprehensive strength of copper ranks the first in the country. And we have at least uh, four trading companies uh, buying and selling at home and abroad. Copper, lead, zinc, ores, coal, and other commodities required for our core business. Their transactions are mainly about contracts of sale. Our business model is mainly to obtain business opportunities through the information, time, geographic difference, and expectation difference of mass purchase and the sales. Our disputes are mostly about the pricing, delivery, and uh, clearing models. For different transactions, we comprehensively use negotiations, mediations, litigations, arbitrations, and other ways. When we make a choice for dispute resolution, our main considerations are the following. First, under our trading model, quality disputes are rare, and price disputes are also rare because quality of commodities are of quality is well guaranteed. The disputes concentrate on the quantity of goods and the performance timeline and the controversies versus over changes, we rarely consider litigations because our partners may have a limited capacity of payment and solvency, and often we may win the case but lose the money. Court decisions are actually not enforceable in reality. Our partners don't want to sue us either. 
Why? Our trading companies are influential in their industries. Our partners don't want to ruin such long-term cooperation. Once there is a dispute, negotiation is the first choice. Last year, we did resolve a large dispute through it. It was entirely triggered by our breach. The counterparty lost 50 million. Negotiation resulted in a good solution. This is our long-term partner. We could sign supplemental agreements through negotiation and do more business with it under better terms and with more opportunities. And its loss would be offset in this way. And this way of solution would not endanger amity among partners, which is crucial to prosperity, as Chinese often say. Through new deals, bigger amounts of transaction in new contracts, sound cooperation was maintained in the long run. When negotiation fails, we used it to commence litigations. One of the reasons is the lack of understanding about the merits of arbitration. Corporate executives tend to regard it as private in nature and less authoritative in law, therefore. A second, we also need to compare the cost between litigation and arbitration and consider the internal decision-making process in a state-owned enterprise like us. A choice between litigation and arbitration is not made by a single individual, but by a collective body. That is another factor. Thirdly, we often choose to bring the case to the court at the place where the contract is assigned. Usually, that seat is where our trading companies are located. Executives tend to believe we are better positioned when the case is tried in the locality of our enterprises. But there are two shortcomings without the SBC judge here. I would like to just be honest. So the judges may not duly understand the trading business, especially for the trading of commodities. There are different elements. We need to explain time and again to the judges. Because of that, the legal relations and assignment of a duty of proof need to be based on such explanation. So we must make it clear. In terms of the contractual freedom, the judges are not adequately differential. And we may prescribe on liabilities, and the judges, while assessing the extent of the damages, may only focus on the absolute amount of the damages, rather than the level of risk for transactions or the level of the expected returns. So for litigations, we rarely choose it in recent years. We mostly choose arbitration. If we have an upper hand in negotiation, we would choose CTAC. If we don't dominate, if our bargaining power is weak, we will try to choose a third party location, preferably Hong Kong and Singapore, because they are mostly Chinese communities. And we also often domestic arbitration institutions for domestic trade. And we increasingly uh, choose arbitration for the confidentiality. If the two parties are at a par in negotiation, neither party uh, could uh, dominate the seat, then we will choose a third party location. Then we usually choose Beijing and Shanghai. And for the other places, we have a concern about whether we can ex obtain a high quality award. For arbitration, we have the following recommendations. First, we need to make full use of modern information technology uh, to give play to the flexibility of arbitration. For example, after the outbreak of a pandemic, CTEC was uh, quick to introduce online virtual hearings, and that is very good. I would like to recommend that in the light of the amendment of the arbitration law, so it has been there for more than uh, 10 years, so amendment 
needs to be made uh, quickly, so we can then integrate uh, online arbitration into the law and institutionalize it. SBC already issued the rules on online trials, and we can actually follow suit and make some attempts. The second suggestion is about cost. We often say that arbitration is preferable because it is flexible and inexpensive, unlike the multiple instances of the court trials. But I think in terms of the payment structure, some changes can be introduced to arbitration. I have known some new way of payment. If during negotiation, the two parties settled with or without mediation, maybe the arbitration fees uh, can be reduced or even halved, especially for some high value uh, cases. The parties may be allowed to defer the payment or be advanced by the respondent or allocated a half and half between the two parties. Sometimes if the arbitration is uh, too expensive, so sometimes the companies may not be able to, you know, pay the money up front, and that will make it unable to enforce its rights. And the arbitrators also charge by hours. And that is reasonable, because it reflects the amount of workload. And third, we need to better market and promote arbitrations. Some in-house counsels and still less, the corporate executives do not understand enough about the merits of arbitration. With the amendment of the arbitration law, I would advise you to intensify the publicity and promotion about arbitration, so more people know about the advantages of arbitration and will use arbitration to resolve their differences and disputes. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Mr. Hu, you know, congratulations on your wonderful time management. Both in domestic and international arbitration, Mr. Hu is highly experienced. In terms of the considerations uh, for the choice of dispute resolution methods, uh, you have made valid points and a realistic uh, analysis. You also made three excellent recommendations uh, to arbitration institutions, arbitrators, lawyers, and enterprises. They are of great value of reference. The last speaker is Madame Li Tao, a senior partner of Dentons China and CTAC arbitrator. She graduated from China University of Political Science and Law and obtained multiple law degrees, culminating at a JSD focusing on evidence law. Before she became a lawyer, she worked as a judge for 17 years. Currently, she chairs the Dispute Resolution Committee of Dentons China and serves as the vice chair of Dispute Resolution Committee of Chaoyang District. In 2020, last year, ALB awarded her as one of the top 15 female lawyers in China. Today, the topic of her speech is dispute resolution from the perspective of lawyers in the post-pandemic era. Over to you, Madame Li. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Cao, for your kind introduction. Again, I am senior partner of Dentist China and head of his dispute resolution practice. I am grateful for the organizer's invitation, which allows me to attend this conference and share with you my reflections throughout today. Indeed, my topic today is dispute resolution from the perspective of lawyers in the post-pandemic era. It may not be entirely appropriate a characterization because in some countries the pandemic is still raging. Thanks to the powerful pandemic control in China, we managed to quickly return to normalcy and discuss the post-pandemic development right here, right now. Of course, before we look into the future, 
Let's first review some statistics in reality as a starting point of our analysis. In June 2020, OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, published a report forecasting that the global economic growth could slow by 7.6% in 2020 because of the pandemic. If that doesn't alert you, we can compare it with the downturn in the Great Depression. It was only 7.2%, and it took the world 10 years to return to the normal level. As countries worldwide continue to release their GDP data for 2020, IMF published its World Economic Outlook, which reported that the global economic growth rate in 2020 declined to only 3.3%. With the dedicated efforts of countries to contain the pandemic, its adverse impact on global economic growth has been effectively controlled. Again, in this report, the IMF made a fairly optimistic forecast for the world economy in 2021, forecasting that the world economy will grow by 6% in 2020, up 0.5% from its January forecast. Well, the Chinese economy was forecasted to grow by 8.4% in 2020, 0.3% higher than the January forecast. And the advanced economies is expected to grow by 5.1%, and emerging markets and developing countries by 6.7%. Given such figures, it is clear that the global economy is recovering more than expected in the year and a half since the outbreak, with increased financial support from large economies and widespread vaccination. Taking China as an example, based on the scientific implementation of the various prevention measures, the National Bureau of Statistics announced in January 2021 that the GDP in 2020 could reach 101 trillion RMB yuan. A few days ago, all the 31 um, provinces in China reported more than 1 billion doses of vaccine administration nationwide. Beyond the abstract concepts behind these numbers, we must acknowledge that the impact of a pandemic is tangible and multifaceted. A series of issues such as the fall of international trade, the fluctuation of the capital market, the interruptions of the industrial chain, and the suspension of consumption scenes have caused all-round and interactive influence. In this context, trade-related disputes are more prominent than in the past and are expected to remain frequent for some time to come. In order to meet the new challenges of dispute resolution in the pandemic environment, China's court system and arbitration institutions made rapid response, issued relevant guidelines, made full use of online litigation, online arbitration, and other ways to protect the legitimate rights and interests of the parties to the maximum extent. On February the 14th, 2020, the early days of the pandemic, the Supreme People's Court of China issued a circular on strengthening and standardizing online litigation during the pandemic control, requiring the courts to follow. And in June, also, the Supreme People's Court issued the rules on online litigation, and it was the first of its kind. In contrast, arbitration institutions have become more relaxed and robust in online arbitration of commercial disputes. Even before the outbreak of the pandemic, many arbitration institutions piloted online arbitrations. In April 2020, CTAC also issued the guidelines on active and steady promotion of the arbitration proceedings, which encompasses uh, case filing all the way uh, to the final stage. So in May 2009, 
CTAG formulated its online arbitration rules. In the guidelines aforementioned, for the rules on uh, virtual hearings, limitations and provisions were made. Because of that, we have seen that in its 2020 annual report, CTAG has conducted a lot of activities. 890 cases in the total of 3,615 uh, cases uh, were made online. So the share was 22.7% and the growth was more than 300%. And the new online hearing centers held 347 online sessions and an integrated, convenient, multi-interface intelligent case handling system is being built and they are very helpful to the protection of the commercial order and parties' interests. So what new requirements has the pandemic posed to lawyers, especially dispute resolution lawyers? As lawyers, how can we better protect the enterprises in the context of the pandemic? Apart from what I mentioned, for example, we need to, uh, you know, going beyond our traditional practice and the customs. So we need to uh, make uh, different kinds of submissions and conduct different activities. We also need to make internal changes. First and foremost is professionalism. The professionalism I'm talking about may not be the kind that has been familiar to you in the recent years. Not simply dedication to a professional field or industry, but for the overall and business legal planning ability in an adversarial context. Lawyers tend to uh, and need to come in at all stages of commercial activities and commercial dispute resolution lawyers are there to clean the mess uh, when the tension becomes irreconcilable. In fact, behind uh, each and every conflict, there are systematic complexes, systematic causes, conflicts are intertwined. Simply restoring peace is not enough. Lawyers, therefore, need to see through the pattern of interest uh, while keeping in mind the big picture, pro into the party's personality and agenda, and prejudge and deal with the final choice of human nature in commercial transactions in order to properly handle the current conflict and prevent similar problems, manage more potentially risky behavior, and conduct a safety checkup. Second, we need to be globalized. Since its adoption in 1980s, CSG has provided safeguards to many countries over the past four decades. We can even say that CSG has been enhancing the cohesion and of international trade. That is a proper term to describe this convention. Similarly, since the reform and opening up, China's economy has been growing rapidly, training and development of the legal practice has never stopped. And we have attached more importance to the training of lawyers, and it's even more so for CTAC since its inception. Many of the big shots in our audience today were trained through CTAC. We are very pleased to see that our young colleagues are even better in international business than our generation. And in Dentons, uh, we also pay attention to the new lawyers for arbitration and sales of goods. Dispute resolution has definitely become a trend, and more types of cases will face our younger generation of lawyers. When I teach students in law schools, I always emphasize the natural fit between the business logic behind intentional trade and judicial uh, deference uh, to trade practice. I will also walk our students through the arbitration rules and explore the rationale behind them in terms of the 
legal and business culture. In one of my articles, I compared the relations between lawyers and in-house counsel to icebreakers and gatekeepers. In business operations, the two must work in concert so as to manage the current problems and prevent future ones with their skill set. For the world, enterprises constitute different economic entities. For enterprises, professionalism, macro vision, and overall planning, rigorous logic and thinking are indispensable requirements for dispute resolution lawyers. We know that for any dispute, litigation or dispute resolution only form part of the solution. In practice, the role of negotiation and mediation is gradually highlighted, and the participation of lawyers is gradually increasing, which also greatly enhances the requirement for the competency of lawyers in the process of dispute, dispute resolution. Win or lose is simply easy to see, but from the purpose of protecting the interests of enterprises, lawyers need to stand higher and make judgment calls. That is a shift from battles to wars, elevation from skill, skillful to wise. So, no matter how the wind, no matter the wind and waves, we need to stay organized, poised, logical, and sober. We need to see the big picture and the fine details. This is my attitude, hopefully, which is also shared by my Chinese colleagues. Uh, thank you, Madame Li. You have, you know, started with some big picture about the global economy and shared with us statistics. On that basis, you also analyzed the trends over the past year for online arbitration and the litigation, and reviewed the changes after the outbreak of the pandemic. You then shed lights on the requirements after the pandemic, including professionalism and globalization. As your colleague in the practice, I would say that the Chinese lawyers have always been seeking professionalism and globalization. Economy may, be, may undergo evolution, but trade cannot do that. So legal services are needed for international trade, and we need to uh, better sharpen our skills set and improve our professionalism. So I will finish their presentations. And uh, in their uh, uh, presentations, they have uh, present their views and uh, analysis on various issues in relation to sale of goods disputes, to CISG, the application of CISG in such disputes, and also to various mechanisms for resolving disputes. So uh, their, the contents of their presentations are very informative, and uh, their analysis are insightful and uh, in-depth. Um, for technical issues, we are unable to accommodate a Q&A session. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure the audience have many questions. Uh, so for those of you who have questions, you may probably send your question to the organizers and uh, who may send this question to the panelists uh, and uh, give a response if, if possible. Um, so may I invite all the audience, um, whether on site or seeing uh, this session through the uh, video link to join me and uh, express our thanks to all my fellow panelists. Finally, the organizers gave me the honor to introduce the speaker of our closing remarks, Vice President Xie Changqing. I worked with her for many years in SeaTac. In early 1990s, she joined SeaTac several years earlier than me, young as she looks. In fact, she has worked on arbitration for 30 years. For a period, she was a secretary general of SeaTac Tianjin branch. Then she left the SeaTac for CMAC and worked there as the deputy director or deputy secretary general. Recently, she returned to SeaTac and served as its vice president to, to continue to lead the arbitration work in SeaTac. Now you have the floor, Vice President Xie. Thank you, Esquire Cao, for your introduction. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends, 
Please accept my greetings. CISG at 40 Celebration Conference will soon come to an end. Today's event is a grand gathering of leading minds. 150 experts and colleagues gathered in Beijing, and nearly 40,000 new and old friends from over 40 jurisdictions worldwide joined virtually to celebrate together the 40th anniversary of the adoption of CSG, discuss the experience and the challenges of CISG in the practice of international trade, and consider its pros- prospects. Under the new situation of international trade, when global trade is under a special environment featuring turbulence, risks, and uncertainties, today's event reflects the common aspiration and a firm conviction of the Chinese and the global business and legal communities to invoke global rule-based governance and cooperation, jointly overcome difficulties, reopen the economy, and resume trade. Trading. This is. Also, so valuable and crucial to the further contribution to the CSG in the future. The purpose and vitality of international commercial arbitration is to provide the parties differing in culture, jurisdictions, and languages with convergent legal rules and harmonized practical operation, so as to resolve disputes more fairly, efficiently, and conveniently. The promulgation and wide application of ancestral model law on international arbi- commercial arbitration, 1985, promoted the convergence of national arbitration legal systems and arbitration practice. Undoubtedly, then, CISG has provided a uniform legal regulatory framework for the international sale of goods and contributed to the development and harmonization of national laws. Therefore, in the past 40 years since its adoption, CISG has effectively reduced the legal barriers in the application of substantive law in international arbitration, significantly enhanced the clarity and the predictability of the application of law. Realize the convergence of substantive law rules, which are partial but very valuable in international arbitration, give further play to the advantages of international arbitration and greatly promoted its development. As China's oldest international arbitration institution, the rapid development of CTAC and the wide application of CISG in China over the past 40 years has gone hand in hand. On the one hand, with its robust system design, CISG offers an authoritative basis for the arbitration tribunals and enhances the trust of domestic and foreign parties in Chinese arbitration. On the other hand, the application of CTAC has accumulated a wealth of Chinese cases and experiences to aid the further development and improvement of CISG and provide a solid legal safeguard for the healthy development of international trade. Ladies and gentlemen, the future has come and keeps evolving. Facing the complicated international trade pattern, we sincerely hope that Ancestral will continuously lead international legislation, launch international conventions that meet the needs of parties of different legal systems, guide and standardize the international laws, and vigorously promote international trade. CTAC is willing to join hands with all circles at home and abroad, make concerted efforts to jointly promote the application and innovation of CISG, develop and improve international arbitration, and con- contribute to the prosperity and stability of the world economy and global trade. Finally, on behalf of CTAC, I would like to express once again my heartfelt thanks to all the moderators and speakers. Who have made brilliant remarks today, and to Ancestral, Mofcom, CCPIT, and all other organizers, sponsors, and media institutions for their kind support. Meanwhile, I would like to sincerely thank all the friends who attended and supported the conference online and offline. And all the staff members serving this conference today, from the beginning to the end. 
Finally, let's make a wish for world peace, economic prosperity, and rule of law. I wish you all a wonderful weekend. Thank you. See you next time.